And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked John J. Sullivan, former deputy police commissioner and chief of detectives, New York City, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the three safecrackers. Chief Sullivan, I know the case you're going to tell our gangbusters listeners about tonight will furnish unusual proof of the work of one of the country's most colorful teams of detectives, New York City's Safe and Loft Squad. It will, Don Gardner. If you and your listeners will bear two facts in mind. First, in burglary cases, it's extremely difficult for the police to get evidence for conviction. And second, the surest way is to know what's going to happen before it does happen. Before it happens? Yes, Don. I'll show you one way it was done. This case began on a bleak, overcast day last January at the huge Calvary Cemetery on Long Island. A lone man kneeled at one of the graves, unmindful of the young priest a few feet away. It's been a long time, Pete. But I haven't gone back on you. I want to be all you were. If you don't mind, more. I always looked up to you, Pete. And I still respect you. I've got the same kind of ideas you had. Oh, Oh, hello, Father. Can I assist you in your prayers, my son? No, thanks, Father. Uh, it's not what you'd call prayers. Besides, it was just leaving. Bye, Father. Goodbye, my son. Thanks, anyway. Next time, maybe. Well. Hello, Father. Eh? Oh, Captain Hanson. <laughs> Are you policemen always hiding in the trees? <laughs> not always, Father. Sometimes we come out in the open... And are you here on business? No. I came out to visit the grave of an old friend. But, uh... Maybe it will develop into business, Father. You mean that, uh, miner I just spoke with? Yes. Strange seeing him here. I thought he was in Sing Sing. Oh? And what makes you think that man should be in Sing Sing? Because, Father, I sent him there. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, if he's been released... No doubt he'll lead a good life. I wouldn't count on it, Father. You won't torment this man now because he came to the cemetery. Oh, of course not. I'm just going to see at whose grave Freddy Russo came so far to pray. Business. Just curiosity. Curiosity seems to be the main fault of policemen. Also, Father, the main virtue. Your man Russo is going out the gate. Now, that's all right, Father. If I want him, I can find him again. Yes, I suppose you can. But here's the grave of his friend. Is your curiosity satisfied? No, Father. Now, I'm more curious. More curious? At the sight of this grave of a man ten years dead. Why, Captain, this is the grave of Big Pete Schneider, Father. Indeed. He died in Sing Sing. He was one of the most troublesome safe crackers I can remember. And, uh, he's still troublesome, Captain? Yes, very troublesome. Big Pete Schneider had a twisted pride in his trade. He enjoyed passing his skill on to others. One of his pupils was Fred Russo. Uh -huh. And if Fred Russo came to the grave of his master for inspiration, he must be up to something. I see. Well, give my best to the boys at headquarters. I will, Father. And goodbye. There. There. Your dinner's on the kitchen table. Go eat it. What's the matter? Can't you get your nose out of that magazine and give me dinner? You get here on time and I'll eat with you. You come late, you help yourself. 
Uh, Where you been? Busy. You didn't go to work today. I don't want you spying on me, Vera. Who has to spy on you? I can tell by the look on your push you didn't go to work. Okay, I was out in Long Island seeing an old friend. Now listen to me, Fred. You stay out of trouble. Will you lay off? You'll be heading back up to Sing Sing. It's all right for you. They give you three meals a day up there. But what am I supposed to do? Go out scrubbing floors or something? I told you to lay off. Now that you're out, you ought to have sense enough to stay out. Big dreams you've got. Always big dreams. You got a good job. You're making good money. Play it straight. You might like it. What do you care where the dough comes from? As long as it's dough. <sighs> Come on, I'll give you something. Wait a minute. What? I was out to see Big Pete. Oh, so that's where... Yeah. Well, he's been dead for ten years. Let him stay dead. He never did you any good. He never did anybody any good. Not even himself. He left a lot behind, Vera. Trouble, that's all. Just trouble. No ideas. They're right up here. Big Pete piled them into my head one by one. But there was an operator. Yeah, and what did it get him? A sing-sing funeral. And that's the same thing it'll get you. It's gonna get me a million bucks. All right, Fred, all right. I'm sick of arguing with you. If you want to go back, go ahead. I don't care. Now, I'm not going back any place. I'm lining up a couple of guys. I'm going to teach him what Big Pete taught me. Just leave me out of it. That's... Okay. Just ask me for something when the dough starts rolling. I won't all. ask you for nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I will ask you for something. Go get yourself killed. Then I can blow my head off and forget about you. That's what I ask you for. <sighs> Come on in the kitchen. Oh, baby. I wish I could feed your brain and steady your belly. Safe and loft squad, Captain Hanson. Detective Clark, Captain. Well? Uh, the parole commission records show that Frederick Russo was released from Sing Sing October 1st after serving 11 years and four months. Hmm. Is he still reporting to the parole officer? Uh, yes, Captain. Once a month. He's been regular. He would be. What's his address? Uh, 450 East 21st. Yeah, East 21st. All right, Clark, come on back to the office. Okay. Sergeant Ryan. Yes, Captain. Come in here a minute. Sure thing, Captain. Clark got an address on Russo. Oh, good. Yeah, on the parole commission. Sit down. <sighs> Uh, I don't know, Sergeant. Russo might be going square. But what was he doing out visiting Big Pete's grave? Maybe looking to knock the knobs off some more safes. And if that's so, he can't do it alone. Now, I want you to find out who he's got and what they're up to. Yes, sir. You've got yourself, Clark, Sanders, Burns, and Garnett. I want somebody on Russo every minute until we find out what's going through his mind. You got it? We won't let him out of our sight, Captain. Wait till Clark comes in, Sergeant, and then get going. Okay. And remember one thing. I want them caught in the act. No other way. Come on, Fred. Take me home, will you? Will you sit still, Vera? I told you. I got to meet somebody. Anybody you got to meet in this joint ain't worth meeting. Now, let's get out of here. Go ahead, Vera. Go home if you want. I'm going to stick here. You got to get up early tomorrow. Early for what? If you're so worried, I'll put you in a... Oh, there they are. Look, Fred, don't get into nothing, will you? Go on home. I got to see these guys. Listen to me, will you? Fred? So long. I'll see you later. Oop. Excuse me. What? Oh, yeah. It's okay. Hello, guys. Hiya, Russo. Sit down. Well? I'll buy your deal, Russo. Okay. But you still got to sell Laviola here. What's the matter with him? Nothing. Except I'm for sticking to my own knitting. You've been shooting off what an easy touch these safe jobs are. Well, that's something new to me. The way I hear, a safe job is the hardest trick to turn. You just listen to me and we'll do all right. What's the matter? I'm not doing all right now. Wake up, will you, Laviola? What you call all right is buttons. Okay, so it's buttons. But all them buttons are mine. They don't get cut three ways. What are you worrying about a three-way split for? This is big dough. More than you ever heard of. Tell me, Russo. What makes you such an expert? Did you ever hear of Big Pete Schneider? Yeah, yeah, I heard of him. What are you, his first cousin? Will you listen, Laviola? This is a good pitch. Okay, Russo. What about Big Pete? He was my professor in college. Everything he knew, I know. And I'll teach you what Big Pete taught me. Tell me, did he teach you how to stay clear of the safe and love squad? Yeah, that was the first lesson. Case the job good. Take nothing but cash. And they can't lay a hand on yeah, you. Unless they catch you red hot right on the job. Well, I was looking to be jumped up in the act. That's an accident. Yeah. Have you got anything oh, lined up? Oh. 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 It's only Barrett. 
going home, Fred. You coming? Well, stop talking about it and go ahead. I'll see you later. Now, listen here. Oh, good night. Ah, nice dish there, Rousseau. Talks too much. You don't know when it doesn't? Let's get back to business, will you? Yeah, hey, what do you got lined up? A loaded store, plus a couple of factories in the garment district. Now, what do you count on taking out? Plenty. Well, what's plenty? What are you worrying about, Laviola? If Russo says there'll be plenty, that's okay. It's okay for me, anyways. All right, Russo. I'm in. Good. Glad to have you. Let's have a drink on it, huh? Waiter. Waiter. Over here, huh? Sat there with the girl for a while, Captain. Yeah. Then these other two came in and took a booth. Joe Pelletieri and Frank Leviola. Mm-hmm. Russo left the booth and joined them. They're still talking. Okay, Sergeant. This looks like the mob. When they leave, one of you get with each of them and stay with them. So, Don, even as the criminals were organizing, New York detectives of the Safe and Loft Squad were aware of their activities and laid their plans to capture them in the act. But unexpected developments upset the best laid plans. Now, back to gangbusters. You were telling us, Chief Sullivan, how detectives of the New York City Police Department's Safe and Loft Squad had under surveillance a gang of criminals they knew were planning a series of large safe burglaries. That's right, Don. And the assigned detectives working in teams trailed their suspects around the clock. Days went by, however, and the criminals failed to make a move. Then one night, Sergeant Ryan and Detective Clark followed Russo and one of his confederates, Joe, into a Bowery dive and watched them as they stood at the bar. What do you say, Clark? Shall we get up close to him? They're liable to make us, Sergeant. Come on. It's worth a chance if we can overhear him. Okay. Get around on that side of him. Right. The guy's got to listen to me, Joe. I know what I'm doing. We're over here, fella. What? Yeah, yeah, plenty. Can we have a glass of beer? No, no, no. You can't blame him, Rousseau. He's getting the edge. So am I. Didn't wait too long enough. Okay. We're ready to go. What? In a couple of days. Oh, that's more like it. First, we need a few things. For instance, what? There's stuff on this list here. Hey, that's a lot of hardware. we got to get it. Where's that beer? We split the list up. Buy the stuff in hardware stores. One item in each store. Now, let's go find Levy Owen. I think I know where he is. Uh, drop some change in the bar, will you? Yeah. Come on. Now, uh, we get this stuff together. Let the three of us go out and take a look. Did you catch what they said, Sergeant? Yeah, keep hot on them, Clark. I'm going to call Captain Hanson. Captain? Yes? Sergeant Ryan. I didn't wake you. No, no, no. I just got in. What's up? Clark and I caught part of a conversation between Russo and Joe. It's any day now. Oh? What makes you so sure? They're going out to buy burglar tools tomorrow. They're going to visit hardware stores. Okay. Stay with them, Sergeant. I want enough evidence against those guys so they'll never get out. I want every storekeeper where they make a purchase to be able to identify whatever they bought without question. Well, you want to buy that one? I don't know. Electric grills don't grow on trees, not yet. That and the other one you looked at are all I got. Well, maybe it'll be okay. It should be. It's guaranteed for all kinds of heavy duty. You got plenty of bits? Yeah, plenty. Uh, make up your mind about the drill. I got to answer the phone. Yeah. Phone, customers, customers, phone, all around this place all day long. Larry's Hardware. Hello. Don't say anything, Larry. Sergeant Ryan, safe and loft squad. Oh. Oh, hello. That guy in your store, looking at the electric drill. Sell it to him. Yeah, but... Sell it to him, Larry, even if you got to cut the price. Okay, if you say so, but... Well, this business, I don't understand. Just be sure you can identify it later. Okay. And the guy, too. Uh, make a note of the serial numbers. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But now I understand. Okay, Larry. Be around to see you later. Come in, Sergeant. Well, Captain, looks like tonight's the night. They got enough burglar tools to crack Fort Knox. And you can trace them? Right back to the stores where they bought them. Good work. And what do you make it for tonight? Well, they got two places all cased out. Mm -hmm. A clothing store at 26 on Broadway and the loft building on West 27th. Which one do you think they'll try first? It's a toss-up, Captain. Well, I'd lay my money on the clothing store. They probably figure they'll have less trouble with the safe and maybe get more cash. Okay. But keep the other place covered. It will be. I told you, Ryan, I want them hands down. And that's the way we're going to get them. 
The two of us are going to plant ourselves inside that clothing store and wait for them. We're giving the district attorney an open and shut case on this one. Well, looks pretty good from where I'm sitting. Now, let's not be too sure, Sergeant. This is a funny business. Anything can happen to queer the works. Uh, Fred! Yeah? What do you want? Come in the kitchen a minute, will you? Oh, these things. Yeah? What do you want, Vera? Open up this job, can you? Yeah, sure. Hey, where are you going all dressed up? Out. Out? Supper's almost ready. That's too bad. I'm eating with the boys. Here, here's your job. I don't want you around those boys, Fred. They're nothing but trouble. Who's living my life, me or you? Well, you're not doing very well at it. Look, baby, tonight's the big night. I'll eat with you tomorrow night. You're not leaving this house. <laughs> so long. I See said you, you're not leaving. Hey. You're not leaving. Put down that knife. I'll kill you. I swear I will. Cut it out now. You're staying here. You're looking for trouble, Vera. I've had nothing but trouble since I first laid eyes on now, you. Now, wait a minute, baby. Fun's fun. Put that knife down. I'm going to put an end to my trouble right now. Vera. Right now. You Vera. dirty little... Go with me, Fred. You're trying to kill me, huh? Fred. Don't... Here. See? I told you to lay off. <laughs> Serves you right. So long. Is it, Captain? Eleven fifteen. <sighs> you think they're coming? Who knows? I certainly hope they don't try the loft building first, Captain. I want to be in on the car. Don't worry, Sergeant. Oh. Yeah, they're working on the back door. Yeah. Come on. Quiet now. I wonder if the men outside spotted them. I'm sure they did. We'll wait till they get inside and start working on the safe. Then we'll nab them. Right. Shh. Come on. A little closer. Careful. Work on it, guys. Work on it. You were trying. This is the first time I wanted burglars to get into a building. Come on. Uh, this door won't bust loose. It's got to. Give it all you got. Come on. Get it. All right, again, again. Okay, okay, hold it. Right now, I'll leave it, Lay. Let's get out of here. Hey, we can't crash the door. Let's go. Get the stuff together. What do you say, Captain? Shall I give the signal to grab No, no, let him go. I want more than an attempt charge against these guys. We'll get them on their next one. Now, back to gangbusters. Russo. Big Pete Schneider would sure be ashamed of you now. I would expect a burglar-proof door. Anybody but Russo. Lay off, will you, Laviola? <laughs> Big Pete must be turning That's over. That's enough. Take a right here, Joe. Yeah, Russo. We still got the loft building. We clean it out. We get 50 grand. Yeah, if they got no burglar-proof door. Let me worry about that. Just do like I tell you. They broke in the side door, Captain. Looks like they're on the third floor now. Did they post any lookouts? No, sir. We've got the whole block covered. Too bad you didn't get them down at the clothing store. It doesn't make any difference, one place or the other. Any orders, Captain? Stick here and cover for us. They'll probably come out the way they went in. We'll get them as they walk out the door. Yes, sir. I'll be with Sergeant Ryan and the others. So done, the safe and loft squad detectives had the 27th Street loft building surrounded. And they were waiting for the criminals to emerge by way of the door they had entered. Meanwhile, unaware of the carefully laid trap of the safe and loft squad detectives, the three burglars had completed their job and were about to leave the building. Come on, come on. Pick up that stuff. Yeah, that's all yeah. You get it all. I don't want nothing laying around that gives the cops a break. Yeah, I guess that's all of it. I'll carry the tin box. You mind the tools, Laviola. I'll take care of the box. Get that Jimmy there. Where? There. Oh, I see it. All right, come on, drop it in the bag. Yeah, sure. Okay, let's get out downstairs. You let it over, didn't I tell you, huh? Didn't I tell you? Oh, tell me again when we're home in bed. Okay, hold it here. Now we'll get on the freight elevator and go out the way we came in. I don't like that elevator this time of night. 
What's the matter? We came up in it, didn't we? I don't like it, that's all. Why can't we walk down? It's only three floors. Because the fire doors and the stairs might be bugged, that's why. I don't want to hit any burglar alarms after we got this far. Get on that elevator. Why do you have to argue so much, Laviola? Nothing's ever right for you. Oh, shut up. All right, Joe. Stay it down. Yeah. Here we go. Hey, Russo. What do you say we put the stuff away and go out and celebrate, huh? Yeah, uh, you guys celebrate if you want. I gotta go look in on Vera. Yeah, what's the matter? Ain't she feeling good? She's got a pain in the jaw. There we are, straight floor. Wait a minute. What uh, now? Look, we can play it a lot safer. What do you mean? Joe, take the elevator to the top. We're crying out loud. We'll Why? go up to the roof over to the next building and come down that way. Yeah, but Russo, that means breaking through another couple of doors. If you want anybody to run into us coming out of here... That's a lesson from Big Pete. Don't be a dope. We're here on the ground floor. The street's ten yards away. We walk right out. There's nothing to it. Take her up to the top, Joe. That's silly boy. You heard what I said? Well, do it without me. I'm going out the way I came in. That's safe enough. Yeah, Russo, there ain't no sense to it. Somebody could see us coming out of there, too. Okay. Open up. We'll go out this way. Sure. All clear. Let's go. Hey, grab some of this stuff, will you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys. Right out the door and walk away like you own the joint. No rushing, no running. Now, you got it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Hold it here. I'll take a look in the alley. Okay. Nice and dark. And all clear. Let's go. Wait. Head for the car. Russo. Hey, cops, get him up. Yeah, okay, okay. Not me, so long. Uh, get him. Oh. Oh. I got him, Captain. No, no, you don't, oh. Captain. Let's shoot. Let's shoot. Let's shoot. All right, just keep him up. Who squealed? Nobody had to squeal, Russo. We've been right on top of you for two weeks. We could have nailed you any time, but we waited until we had you good. Now let's get moving. So done. That was how one gang of burglars fared at the hands of the New York City Police Department's Safe and Loft Squad. They're all back in the penitentiary. It was a real illustration of fine detective work, Chief Sullivan. Yes, and I think the men of the New York City Safe and Loft Squad deserve congratulations for their mighty good job. They certainly do, Chief Sullivan. And gangbusters, thanks to you for telling us this factual case history. Gangbusters, brought to you by the makers of Sloan's Liniment. Before we begin tonight's case, let's consider the cases of all you folks who find that March dampness almost always plagues you with muscular aches and pains. Well, there's no need for you to endure the discomfort of a stiff neck or a sore shoulder. Just reach for your bottle of Sloan's liniment and enjoy the same quick and comforting relief that Sloan's has brought to thousands during the past 50 years. You'll find Sloan's the easiest of liniments to apply. All you have to do is pat on Sloan's liniment, that's all. Pat Sloan's on the sore place and relax. In practically no time at all, you'll feel a gentle and beneficial warmth. The sign that Sloan's liniment is going to work just like a heat treatment to loosen your tight and aching muscles. Because Sloan's liniment brings you this relief, the relief you want. You should have a bottle of this reliable friend in need on your medicine shelf at all times. For muscular distress often strikes without warning. And the faster you apply Sloan's liniment, the sooner you'll be your old self once again. So tonight, after our thrilling gangbuster dramatization, take a look at your medicine shelf. If you see that your bottle of Sloan's is almost empty, be sure to stop in at your druggist's for Sloan's liniment first thing tomorrow. Now picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf, now serving with the United States Army, interviews by proxy Superintendent George Rayer of the New Orleans Police Department. Colonel Schwarzkopf. Superintendent Rare, you say that music and dancing played an important part in tonight's case? A very important part, Colonel Schwarzkopf. That 
That's what I want out of life. Music, dancing. To have a hundred girls falling on my neck. Hear them call me the big shot. All I need is the money. And I'll get that with this. Yes, Colonel, in an effort to be considered a big shot, Earl Joyner turned gunman, but was captured. Then on May 13th, 1932, he shot one of the prison guards and escaped with two other convicts. They fled to Texas, where Earl Joyner set up headquarters in a house on the outskirts of Houston. Got it, will you, Joyner? Playing that same thing over and over again? Yeah, lay off, Joyner. Give me the willies. You guys don't appreciate hot music. I'd appreciate some of that money you said we was going to make. Me too. Well, what do you think I've been doing the past three weeks? I got plans all drawn up and plotted out. I got the blueprints of the inside of every bank within a hundred miles. How about going into action? Ah, cut the kid and join it. Lay off the clarinet and talk with us, will you? Okay. To lead the kind of life I want, boys... Nightclubs, baby dolls, expensive clothes. You gotta have money. But we're not going after chicken feed, we're going after the stuff. Now, pull your chairs up the table and I'll lay the plans out and show you stuff. I got every detail worked out. Now, take a look at these drawings. Ah, say. Say, this is something. Yeah. Yeah, I knew you had brains, Joyner, but I didn't know you had this many. Huh. I'm going to explain those plans to you in just a minute. But first, here's the basis of my planet. Yeah. We're going to have machine guns, and we're going to use them. We're going to mow people down. We aren't going to stop and tell people to get out of the way. We're going to shoot them out of the way. All right, now, look at these plans. Bank after bank, we're going to take. And we're going to take them over with machine gun bullets. We'll shoot up the bank so they won't even know what we look like. Emergency. Bank robbery at First National Bank, Springs, Texas. Three gunmen armed with machine guns shot up bank as they fled. Urgent. All of Louisiana bank robbed of over $6,000. Warning. Criminals have machine guns. All police. Merchants and Farmers Bank, Grapeland, Texas. Raided by machine gun bandits. This sure is a life. Plenty of dough and one nightclub after another. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Look at Blondie over there, Jordan. <laughs> Look at Blondie. Yeah. Boy, <laughs> she's swinging out. The crest of the waves, boys. We're riding the crest of the waves. Hey, what's the matter? No music. Oh, we got to have music. Hey, leader. Uh, band leader. Band leader, come here. Yes, sir. You want me? Yeah. I want you to play Black Bottom. It's my favorite song. But we just played that a few minutes ago. It's all right. I'm paying, ain't it? Here's a hundred bucks. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, just a second. Here's another hundred. Oh, thanks. You're talking to a big shot now. Go on, play the black bottom and play it hot. Yes, yes. sir. I'll play that number right away, sir. All right, boys. The black bottom and give it everything you got. <laughs> Now, Joyner, I think we've shot up more banks in a shorter time than any gang that ever operated. We ought to get a good haul from this bank in Fontatula. <laughs> How's it feel to have a rope tied around your neck, Mr. Bank President? <laughs> he doesn't look much like a bank president now, does he? Oh, it's the biggest stunt you ever pulled, Joyner. Kidnapping this guy from his house to make him open the bank vault. But you better loosen that rope a bit. You don't want the guy to croak on us before we get to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> hey, which road do I take, Joyner? On to the left. Banks up the street to the left, then. Okay.
Well, for Pete's sake. Say, what is this? All these wagons and stuff. Pull up, pull up. Oh, girl. Howdy, dear. How's the coming? Back up, girl. Back up, there's the girl. Here, come on. Here, come on. Must be market day. Yeah, and the sap farmer's got the whole road blocked for the horses and wagons. They're all around the bank, too. It's spot us in a second if we try to go in. Well, it looks like the job's off. A couple of those farmers are looking this way. They may spot this bank president in the car and know something's wrong. We better get out of here. Turn up the side road fast. That's what I call a rotten freak. Yeah, now we can't use this bank president. What are we going to do with him? Chuck him out. He may go to the cops. He's got a wife and kids. If he puts the cops on our trail, we'll come back and kill him. You hear that, mister? Yes. Okay, get out. I I can't. If you slow down... Slow I'll... down nothing. Jump. I'll be killed. Oh, you don't want to jump. Oh, well, I'll kick you. Just slow down first, please. We're going 60. Oh, oh you get hurt, the better I like it. Oh. Come on, fellas. Kick him out. Oh. <laughs> See him go flying? Yeah, bounce for 20 yards. Well, where to now, Joyner? I don't know. Hey, Wait. There's one town I haven't seen yet, New Orleans. That's right. They say they got some swell dance halls down there. Yeah, and Creole babes. That's where we'll head, Davis. New Orleans, the land of dreams. We'll bust it wide open. <laughs> Look out! Open fire, man. Pass! Imagine they sideswept our car without crashing. Any of your cars and after them. Come on. Step on it. They're getting away. Turn on that searchlight. They got around that bend in the road. Look. Looks like a trail of gasoline in the center of the road. We must have plugged their gas tank. They can't get far. They can't get off this road. Swamps on both sides. Faster, faster. Hold it. Car up ahead. It's stopped. Pull up to it. Let me set the shoot. It's the bandit car. There are the bullet holes. Car's empty. Flash that searchlight around. Right, Sheriff. Don't see anything. Wait. Turn the light back to the left a bit. Yeah? Those cypress trees, the other side of the canal. By George, there they are, climbing up the other side of the canal. There they are. Get them. Too late. They got away through the tree. Pete! Yes, sir. Race to the nearest phone. Have men approach that area from the other side of the swamp. Yes, sir. The rest of you come with me. We're going to swim this canal after. Right, sir. Yes, sir. Certainly exciting action, Superintendent Rayer. But before you tell us the outcome of this chase, Frank Gallup has a word from our sponsor. night, freight trains and motor trucks are crisscrossing this country, freighting the materials of war to the men of the services. The men who handle these tough jobs deserve the thanks of the nation. With all the rest of you who are in important jobs, they've taken a pledge that now work comes first. That means staying in good health so that you can do a good job. I guess that's why so many thousands on thousands of you now keep a bottle of reliable Sloan's liniment in your locker at the plant, as well as another bottle on your medicine shelf at home. Or you've learned from bitter experience that muscular aches and pains often strike suddenly, especially when you're on a strenuous and tiring job. Sloan's, you'll learn, takes hardly any time at all to apply. During your lunchtime or after work, all you have to do is pat on some Sloan's liniment and then relax for a short while. Sloan's does the rest, working like a heat treatment to help you find the quick and comforting relief you want so much. In many jobs, you're liable to suffer muscular distress from all three of the main causes. Overexertion, accident, or overexposure to chilling weather. Sloan's a real friend in need. Will help loosen and relax your sore and aching muscles, whatever the cause. Remember that when you use Sloan's liniment, you needn't endure hard and painful rubbing or massage. All you do is pat on this world-famous liniment. Just pat Sloan's on the sore place and relax. 
If you've never used Sloan's Liniment, you'd do well to stop in at your favorite druggist's on your way home from work tomorrow and get a bottle. If you're one of the millions of Sloan's regular users, always be sure you have a fairly full bottle. An empty bottle of Sloan's is no help at all when you want relief in a hurry. Now back to our interview at headquarters. Now, Superintendent Ryer, did Earl Joyner and his gang escape the posse that waylaid them in the swamps? Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf, they did escape. And they seemed to disappear off the face of the map. Three weeks later, Chief Grosh of the New Orleans police and his Lieutenant Schwem were covering the nightclubs of New Orleans. It's after two in the morning, Chief Grosh. Don't you think we ought to call it a night? Oh, I guess so, Lieutenant Schwem. Perhaps we are on a wild goose chase. Yeah. But I want to get that killer, Joyner. We've been covering every New Orleans nightclub for weeks now. Joyner was here. We'd run into him before this. Yeah, but nightclubs and girls and hot music are his weakness. Wait, Schwem. There's the Kit Kat Club up the street. We haven't covered that for a couple of hours. I've never seen anybody so persistent as you are, Chief Grosh. You got on a trail of someone. Joyner is a maniac with a gun. His whole gang is. Oh, well. We can give the place the once over from this door. Quite a crowd inside. Yeah. But no sign. Lieutenant. Yes, Chief. That table in the far corner. Those men sitting at it. Travis. And Morgan. But I, I don't see Joyner. No, no, I don't either. Problem is, how are we going to approach that table without them spotting us? They'll have guns. If they ever start shooting at all these people inside... Yeah, it'll be a wholesale murder. But look, I got an idea. What, Chief? Here's a couple of waiters' aprons. We'll put these on. Say, that's a swell idea. Yeah. Come on, tie this string in back of me. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, think we ought to carry a tray or something? No, these aprons should do the trick. No. I'm all set. Now remember, Schwem, we've got to grab them before they can pull a gun. Yeah. If they spot us before we grab them, jump for the table. Right. Knock it over on top of them and pull the tablecloth over the head. Right. All right. Through this door. Now, not too fast, Schwem. Not too fast. Right. If they spot us, die for the table. Morgan's looking this way. Yeah. Keep walking. A few more steps and... He sees us. Dive for them, fast! Drop it! Drop that gun! Okay, okay, don't shoot. I give up. Put cuffs on him, Lieutenant. All right. Gosh, that fellow dancing for that exit. It's Joyner. Hold these fellas. I'll go get him. All right. No, you don't, Joyner. Come here. Let go of me. Let go of me. want to put up a fight, eh? No, no, I give up. I give up. Bet your life you do. Come on, Joyner. Start walking. Your dancing days are over. Colonel Schwarzkopf, Joyner and his gang were sentenced from 27 to 46 years in Angola prison. But less than a year later, September 10th, 1933, Life. But they're wrong. I built up a new gang right here inside the prison. Some of the worst killers in the country. <laughs> Wouldn't want to meet us up a dark alley, would you? Well, you will. We're getting out today during the ball game. We got guns and we're getting out during the ball game. Okay, boys, now's the time. Shoot in the crowd. Kill him, kill him. Wait for the front gate, come on. There's a guard. Shoot him. Back to this building. Visitor running this way. Plug him, don't wait. Plug him. Okay, hold it. Yeah? What, what is it, Joanna? The captain of the guard should be at the front gate. He'll have the keys. There he is. Now he don't see us. Kill him. That got him. We'll grab the keys and get out of here. Come on, fast. Statewide alarm. Emergency. Thirteen convicts, led by Earl Joyner, have shot way out of prison. Three men killed, including captain of guards. Killers are heading north. Lock all roads and form posses.
Special bulletin to all pussies. Eight of escaped convicts were surrounded and captured after gun battle near Rolling Creek. One convict killed. This accounts for eight of the 13 who escaped. Sheriff's posse reporting. Four more convicts have just been recaptured when they wrecked car near White's Gully. They are now on their way back to jail. To all passes in the field, Earl Joyner, only convict at large, has escaped into wooded swamp on outskirts of Houston. All passes close in. Stop raining so I can see something. It's so dark. I've got to find some place to hide till morning. Oh! Oh! Oh, my face! Bob wire fence! Oh! Oh, I'm all cut. I'm bloody. Keep going, man. You're right this way. Keep going. Right after me. Which way to turn? Gotta find some place to hide. What's that? Pigs. A pig pen. Maybe I can hide in there. Get out of my way, you rotten pigs. If I can bury myself in the muck in this pig pen. Ooh, my face. Come on, man. Try to get me far away. That's right, sir. Get out of here. Flash the lights around. Mission of the pigs. Wonder what they're so excited about. Probably the storm. Turn your light on. Yeah, I guess so. It looks like a barn over there. Might be in that barn. Come on. Right. Get your snoot out of my face, you dumb pig. Oh, my face hurts. But I fooled the cops. Yeah, I'll hide here all night and then I'll get away. I gotta get away. Yeah? Oh, who are you? Well, what do you mean bursting into my house this way? Shut up, farmer. Open your mouth and I'll kill you. Yeah, all right. You're gonna hide me, see? I need clothes and food, and I need medicine for my face. It's all cut and swollen. Those cops got me crazy running and hiding and running. I can't stand no more. I'll kill you. I'll kill everyone. What's that? Coppers outside my car. Yeah. You want to die? You want to die right now? No, no, no. And don't tell them about me. I got to hide. I can... Oh, those rafters up by the ceiling. I can climb up there. All right. Keep facing me while I climb up. Yes, yes. One bullet will kill you and I got plenty. No, no, don't, don't shoot. There. I'm all set now, Farmer. A gun's pointing right down at you through these cracks in the wall. Hello, Jim. Uh, hello, Sheriff. Jim, we're looking for an escaped convict. You seen anything of a stranger around these parts? Well, no, Sheriff. Well, he's here somewhere. We've been trailing him two days now. He won't stop till we get him. Yes. Hey, what's that? Uh, what? That noise. Hey, from the rafters up there. The rafters? I, I didn't hear anything. <clears throat> Probably some uh, chipmunks got in up there. Jim, you feeling all right? Oh, yes. Your face is pale. Oh, I'm, I'm all right. You say you haven't seen anything of a stranger at all? Oh, no, Sheriff, no. I... Well, then I won't take up any more of your time. All right, boys. Outside. Yes, sure, sure. Uh, all right, let's go. Uh, I'll be going, Jim. Hey. But I'm taking you with me. All right, Jim. We can talk now. He's in there, isn't he? Yes, yes, Sheriff. Up, up on the rafters. He's got a gun. I knew something was wrong the way you acted. You'll get him. Keep your guns on that door, men. Right. Join us in there. If he tries to come out, shoot. Right. Phil, you come with me. Right. We'll go around back and climb in through the window. Come on. Here we are. I'll go in first. Careful, Sheriff. He's got a gun. Okay, Joyner. We have you surrounded. Come down from those rafters or I'll shoot up through the floor. 
I'll give you just five seconds, Joyner. Yeah, look. His hand falling over the side of the plank. Dropping his gun. Wait a minute. Maybe a trick. Oh. See his body. Slipping off the rafters. He's falling down. Look out. He's unconscious. What's wrong with him? Roll him over. Look at his face. It's fallen twice its right size. You can't even see his eyes. He's burning up with fever. It's all infected. Blood poisoning? Most likely. What a sight he is. Yes. Looks like Joyner outsmarted himself for good this time. All right. Help me lift him. Okay. We'll get him to the prison hospital. And Earl Joyner had outsmarted himself, Colonel Schwartzkopf. Though he always claimed he'd never die in a prison, he died in the prison hospital two days later, and from infection on his face caused by his hiding in the pig pen, and the pigs sloshing the filth all over him. This has been a powerful case, Superintendent Ryer. Here was a young man who deliberately turned to crime at the age of 22. How old was he when he died? Just 23. He thought he was too smart for the law, and he really met his death from the pigs. Thank you, Superintendent Ryer. And now, before we broadcast our nationwide clues, here is Frank Gallup with a suggestion. These days, the youngsters practically live in their roller skates, even clumping up and down the stairs despite all your warnings. And, of course, they fall occasionally. So that means reaching for your bottle of reliable Sloan's liniment. Yes, for the past two generations, mothers all over the world have helped their children find relief from muscular aches and pains with Sloan's, the family friend in need. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Ink present Gangbusters! Out of the foxholes of Europe, from the seeming jungle swamps of the Pacific, our men are now coming home to a new America. A wave of crime has followed every war, and we must not allow lawbreakers to tear down here at home the very ideals that our men have fought to preserve. Tonight, Gangbusters presents the authentic inside facts about a gun mall who wanted a red dress more than anything else in the world. And so, Louis J. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police department in the world, takes over to interview by proxy Sheriff E. W. Biscaylos of Los Angeles County, California. Commissioner Valentine. Sheriff Biscaylos, I know you want to start tonight's case from inside San Quentin Prison. Uh, yes, Commissioner Valentine. San Quentin is one of our largest and oldest penitentiaries. With steel and concrete walls 18 feet high and 3 feet thick at the bottom. They're impossible to undermine. And guards constantly patrol the top of the walls. How many killers and criminals are there in San Quentin, Sheriff? Some 3,500, Commissioner Valentine. Or there were on the first Saturday afternoon of last October 1944 when a prisoner knocked on the door of the warden's office. Come in. Oh, yes, Connors? Uh, there's a girl in the waiting room, warden. She a beauty. She's sweet and young and fresh. Oh, uh, that must be Miss Nelson from the Red Cross to pick up my donation. The pillar to come right in, Connors. Okay. Uh, miss, uh, would you come in and see the warden, please? Uh, won't you come over and sit down? I uh, didn't expect you so soon. I'll have the Red Cross check made out in just a moment. Red Cross check? Why, yes. I don't understand. Aren't you Miss Nelson from the Red Cross? No. Oh, I see. Who are you? Juanita Hanson. 
Well, I'm sorry, Miss Hanson. I, I was mistaken. I was waiting for William Crane to be released. William Crane? Yes. Why? You, uh, related to Crane? I'm his girlfriend. In just a moment, please. Warden speaking. William Crane is in the outer office, sir. Ready to be released. Hmm. All right, Connor, send him in. Are you really William Crane's girlfriend? Why not? Well, William Crane is one of the toughest, most dangerous criminals in San Quentin. But he's being released. Yes, he served his time for the crime he was convicted of, but... I've been waiting five years for him. Miss Hanson, you, you've only one life. You're young, beautiful. Your whole life is before you. I'd think it over if I were you. Hello, Warden. Now, uh, come in, Crane. Hi, kid. Hello, Crane. Well, Warden, looks like this is where you and me part company. Crane, I hope I don't see you here again. Remember this. Hard work never hurt anyone. <laughs> That's what the warden at Joliet told me before they turned me loose. I see. Well, good luck then. No, I ain't shaking hands with you, warden. You've got a good girl there, Crane. Think it over. That sermon through? Yes, it's through. Come on, kid. Let's blow. Crane, can you imagine that warden calling me a good girl? <laughs> what do you got fixed, Juanita? If this cab driver doesn't fall asleep, we should be there in half an hour. It's a place at Cobblestone Cabin, just north of Bakersfield. Shaky O'Leary's out of the jug. He's up there waiting. Okay. Things are going to start popping and popping fast. Dames on okay, Crane. We're going to be healed right with this artillery she got for us. Let's see that 38, Shaky. You can have the 38. Give me the sort off shotgun every time. There's a swell hideout, huh, Crane? Yeah, when he did all right. Imagine her putting up white lace curtains. <laughs> well, good looking herself. You got us some good rods here, Juanita. Well, what's eating you? There's going to be a new deal in this gang, boys. Quite no deal. What do you mean, Juanita? This time, you're doing as I say. What? I'm laying the plan. Oh, no, there ain't no woman telling me what to do. I've been in this game too long. And you ended up in San Quentin, Shaky. And Crane... Now, wait a minute. I've been waiting five years, Crane. I'm young. I've got a right to live and be happy. Have money, attention, good clothes. I haven't gone places. I've been waiting for you to get out of the penitentiary. Well, now you're out. I want the things I've been dreaming of. You both tried your ways, and the cops got you, put you behind bars. But not this time. I've got everything planned. We'll have everything, but no more penitentiaries. I don't know, but maybe she's got something, Shaky. Well, maybe. Maybe. It's a new deal, boys. A new deal from now on. Cruising police cars, Farmington Hotel, 3974 Wilshire Boulevard, just robbed by two gunmen and beautiful girl. Man just held up by two gunmen at 1516 Sunset Boulevard, third hold up by these gunmen today. Emergency, grocer on Breed Avenue just held up at gunpoint. Large sum of money taken. Girl driving black sedan. Warning. These gunmen are heavily armed. What are you pulling up here for, Juanita? I've got another job lined up across the street. Hey, not bad. 
The bank over there. Got it all cased, huh? Well, uh, no, not exactly. You can't knock over a bank hit unless you've cased it. Know how everything is. But it's not the bank. Not the bank, huh? But there's no other place over there. Just that little cleaning store. I know. That that's the place I've got picked out for it. What? You nuts? You're not figuring for us to take over that little joint, one either. Crane, you, you don't understand good planning. You see, you all need different clothes. The cops are giving out descriptions of what you're wearing. Now, you can't go out and buy clothes you'd be recognized. Yeah, but a cleaning store. This time, Juanita, no. But you've got to. You've got to. What is this, anyhow? For my sake, you've got to, please. What's back of all this? Why have we got to crack that cleaning store? Come on, why have we? I told you, Crane. I've been wanting clothes all these years I've been waiting for you. Now, I can't get out and buy any. I'd be recognized. In the window of the cleaning shop, there's a red evening dress. It's the most beautiful evening dress I ever saw. I've never had an evening dress. I've always wanted one. Red. Just like that one. Oh, please. Please, I've waited so long. I want that red dress. Can you beat that? All right, kid. We'll crack the cleaning store. We'll get us some different clothes and maybe the red dress. Come on, Shaky. Over to the cleaning store. We'll let one to have a look. There, we sure brought back a mess of clothes from that cleaning store. Oh, there's the red evening dress at the bottom of the pile. Hold on, will you? We're getting to it. Yeah. <laughs> Take a look at Shaky and that soup and fish. <laughs> oh, please, please, I want to see the dress. Okay, okay, I'll pull it out. Oh, Crane, look at this. Oh, it's the most beautiful gun I ever saw in my life. All right, now shut up, will you? Oh, I love you all. It's beautiful. It's what I always dreamed of. Don't a damn skin your life. Oh, Crane. Lay off. Hey. Yes. I'm going into the other room and get all dressed up. Then you've got to... You can take... Oh. Oh, look. Look. Will you stop? Look. All the way down the back, it's torn. I can't wear it. It's... Oh, shut up. You're getting me down. No, I've got it, but it's no good. I just want what other people have. But nothing ever turns out right for me. Listen, Queen, I've been wanting to talk to you about Juanita. Yeah? She has too much to say around here. I know what I'm doing, Shiggy. When I want your advice, I'll ask for it. A slug between her eyes is what she needs. I said I know what I'm doing. Juanita's tired. She's on edge. I'll handle her all right. It's okay. Just don't wait too long. I got my plan, Shaky. Don't worry. As long as Juanita's helping us, she stays around. I'm telling you, Queen, a roadside stand like this, it's nothing but peanuts. Juanita's put her finger on a bankroll here. He's that tall man at the far table. A big-time gambler from Denver. He's got a roll of three or four thousand. Says who? I sent her out alone last night. She lent them. I'll go out and have the car running. Yeah, look at your dame, Crane. She's got the jitters worse than ever. Never mind that. Okay, this is it. All right, folks, this is a stick up. Reach! Hold on, hold on, hold on. Pipe down, Olivia. What do you mean? I said pipe down. Get out of the way, you. No. I said get out of the way. No. Maybe you didn't see this rod. Yeah, I see it. You can't bluff me. Duck, boss, that sugar ball, he's thrown it. Why, you little... You're in oh, oh. Make for the hey. car, pal. Get going, Juanita. I just bumped a guy. You killed him? No, no, don't say you killed him. Get gone, will you? When I got a gun, no guy is going to stand up to me. Remember that. Crane made his getaway, Sheriff Fisk Kalos. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. He literally was riding at the crest. But something which Crane hadn't counted on soon took place. And now, Commissioner Valentine, I'd like to ask you a question. 
Isn't it true that one of the hardest things a police officer has to learn is to spot the difference between the guilty and the innocent, between the false and the genuine? That's right, Mr. Gardner. But modern scientific research and equipment have made it a lot easier to tell the difference. Yes, friends, and modern research methods have also made it easy to prove the difference between one ink and another, to prove a difference that is truly amazing. For example, recent tests of nationally known inks show that Waterman's Blue Black gives you up to 6,500 extra words every time you fill your pen. Think of it, up to 6,500 more words per filling than any other nationally known ink. That means you save all the muss and bother of frequent refilling. You save time, money, and that annoying loss of thought continuity. That's fine, Mr. Gardner. But what makes such a big difference? Well, simple enough, Commissioner. It's because Waterman's blue-black ink is all ink. No solvent, no dilution, no added chemicals. Every drop is packed with true ink quality the kind that writes on and on and on. And because it's all ink, Waterman's Blue Black is second to none in resistance to air, light, time, and moisture. Suitable for all types of pens, for all kinds of paper. Leaves no blurry lines, has no unpleasant odors. So switch to Waterman's Blue Black and get just what you asked for, ink. Remember, too, that Waterman's ink comes in seven other pleasing and distinctive colors all in the amazingly convenient tip-fill bottle. Only ten cents. And now, back to tonight's case of William Harlan Crane and Commissioner Louis J. Valentine. Sheriff Biscaloos with William Harlan Crane shooting a man and apparently riding high and wide. What was the next development in this case? Well, it was the day after the shooting, Commissioner Valentine. A woman was sitting in a chair spotlight was on her face. Her whole body trembled, and she nervously clasped and unclasped her hands. Finally, she turned to the man who was quietly watching her. Tell me, Doctor, what is it? Young lady, you're in bad shape. Your whole nervous system, you're burned out. What'll I do? I... You must have lived a pretty, well, unusual life. Yes, Yes, I have. Whom do you live with? Uh, why, why, just some people. That bruise on your face. Oh, it's nothing. It, it's nothing. Do you have a boyfriend? Uh, y yes. Young lady, I know more about you than you think I do. What do you mean? I thought so. Well, I'm going to give you some tablets for your nerves. I've got to have something. One of these tablets should put you to sleep, fast asleep. Take only one at a time. I'm giving you five extra ones, but don't use them unless you have to. Thank you, Doctor. When you get home, take one and hide the others so no one can get to them accidentally. Improperly taken, the tablets can be dangerous. Yes, sir. And thank you, Doctor. Thank you. And you won't tell anyone I was here, will you? No. Now, young lady, you've got to learn to relax. Take things easier. A lot easier. I've never even been on the pier here at Long Beach before, Crane. Keep walking, Juanita. Right out to the end of the pier. Everybody seems so happy, laughing and everything. I'm not hearing any laughing matter. Keep walking. I guess those two over there are in love, aren't they? Mm-hmm. I wonder what makes them so happy. I'm not so good. We've passed everything now. There's nothing way out at the end of the pier crane. Keep walking. Well, what are we coming out here for? I'll tell you when we get there.
Come on over here by the rail. Now lean over the rail. Put your arm around me. Crane, you mean it? Sure, I mean it. Oh. Look. Look at the moon. I see it. And the water. Come closer. Yes. I've got a confession to make, Crane. Hmm? What's that? I was afraid, afraid as I was walking out here with you, you, well, you might hate me and want me out of the way. You're not... Come closer. Yes. Now lean over. What was that? That's why I wanted you close, like we were making love. I didn't tell you we had a little trouble in that liquor store job tonight. Oh. What did you drop in the water? The gun I killed the guy with. Oh. It's 35 feet deep out here off the pier. So... So that was why you wanted me to be close to you. To make love to you. So people couldn't see you drop the murder gun. You're getting bright, aren't you? Come on, we're leaving. Come on. Just a few minutes. I said we're leaving. The cops are closing up California tight on a drum. State police, federal guys, hundreds of them. We're going back to the hideout and figure a way of getting out. Nuts, I tell you, Crane, nuts. This, this hideout's bad as a cell. Stop blowing your top, Shaggy. You've got to listen to the short wave and hear what the cops are doing. Police control cars, attention. This is Lloyd Smith, night dispatcher. You are to act upon the orders of Captain C.W. Ellison. Have your guns ready and patrol all highways. The men we are after are killers. Yeah, they don't know where to look. Deputy Sheriffs Thompson, Rayner, Murphy. Proceed to cobblestone cabins with riot guns and tear gas bombs. You're under our cabin, Hyder. We can't beat it for there. Crane, I can't take it. We're like rats in a trap. Who's that? I'll kill you. Shut I'll up. Kill... It's only Juanita. What's the latest police report? You got it trapped in, all right. It's your fault, Juanita. We're in this jam. Shut up, will you, Shaggy? Juanita, I saw that box you had the sleeping pills in the doctor gave you. It was on a washboard. Yes, it was empty. Yes, the doctor said they'd be good for my nerves. All of them at one time? Yes, that's the way I was supposed to take them. Huh. They were all different kinds, and I had to take them all together for them to do any good. KQBV, KQBV. Hey, that's a secret code. They're going to raid. KQBV, answer your call letters, please. KQBV. Those are just the call letters of the police radio. It's like we were rats being trapped. I think I know how to help you, boy. You keep your nose out of it. enough for you, Juanita. I think I can call the cops off you. What do you mean? You and Shaky get in the car. Start driving towards San Fernando. Hmm? Fifteen minutes after you've left, I'll call the cops and tell them there's been a killing on the other side of town. I'll describe you two and all the cops will go racing in the wrong direction. Yeah? Yeah? What are you willing to do that for? If you stay here, you'll get caught. I can slip through alone and meet you next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe that's a good idea. Yeah, it's the best idea we got, sure. Wait a minute. How come you're willing to take this chance, Juanita? Crane is my boyfriend. Aren't you, Crane? Sure, baby, sure. You know I love you. Then why shouldn't I take a chance? Come on, Shaky. We gotta get going. Yeah. I'll sit down here by the telephone, and in 15 minutes, I'll call the cops. Hey, uh, you ain't getting sleepy, are you, kid? No. No, I'm not getting sleepy, Crane. Okay. Oh, well, we're leaving. Good luck. You, uh, you want to give me a kiss before you go, Crane? None of that stuff now, kid. The time's too short. Yes, the time's too short. Come on, Shaky, get going. Hope we'll seeing you, Juanita. Yes. I'll be seeing you.
Will you pass that car in front of us, Crane? We've been trailing at 20 miles. It's doing 40, Shaky. I don't want to take a chance of being picked up for speed. No cop's going to take me. I'll blow my brains out first. Cars 47 and 2. That's state police. Be ready for instructions. You suppose the cops will get Juanita back there? Yeah, they will. She can't tell nothing. They should have pumped her full of lead weeks Attention. ago. Attention. Attention, all police. Is there anybody living but police? The body of a girl has just been found in a house on the outskirts of Long Beach. Juanita, she's dead. This girl was sitting by the telephone. Death was due to the overdose of sleeping tablets. Juanita's dead, and she's here in the air. The examination of the house leaves no doubt, but it was occupied by the gunman. Cartridges were found, and fingerprints of Shaky O'Leary. And it's me. And the prints of William Harlan Crane. That is all. Crane, she's dead. Stop shaking, yeah. will you? She, she knows how we wanted to kill her. She's laughing at it. Sure, that's what she thought. She's laughing uh, at it. 42, calling headquarters. That sounds awful loud. I'm getting you, 42. I'm proceeding 40 miles an hour along Highway 19. Where we are, Crane. We're directly back of killer's car. Car 29 directly in front of them. We have them hemmed in. Crane, there is another car right in back of us. Break out that back window and use your shotgun. Yeah, yeah. Shoot to kill him. Go on, shoot some more. I, I couldn't hold the shotgun. It dropped out the back window. You stupid fool. Start shooting with your rod, then. There's a roadblock up ahead. Now we are caught. All right, you men. Come out of that car with your hands up. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're coming. We're coming. Don't shoot, Cobbett. Don't shoot. Here's my rod. So you're a crane, huh? And the fellow doing the shakes must be O'Leary. I said, don't shoot, copper. I'm all in. Fight's all out of you, eh, crane? Yeah. Come on, get going. There's a couple of cells reserved for the both of you. Back in San Quentin. And that, Commissioner Valentine, is the factual case history of William Harlan Crane, Shaky O'Leary, and the beautiful Juanita Hanson. O'Leary was sentenced to life in prison. Night Crane is in a cell, alone, sitting, thinking, listening to the clock ticking away the minutes before he is to be led into the gas chamber to his death. Thank you, Sheriff Discolese. All of us who listen to this case must realize again that crime does not pay. Commissioner, before broadcasting our last-minute police bulletins on persons wanted tonight... I'd like to say a word to Sheriff Biscay Lewis. Sheriff Biscay Lewis, it's a pleasure at this time to thank you and your fellow police officers for your splendid work as illustrated by tonight's case. In recognition of your courage and devotion to duty, Sheriff, please accept this Waterman's Deluxe Pen and Pencil gift set with your name engraved on the gold cap. Why, thank you, Mr. Gardner. That's a present I'll certainly be using for a long time to come. Now, to our radio listeners, we'd like to make a suggestion. Before you buy a fountain pen at any price, consider carefully its features. Does it have a hand-ground 14-carat gold point that exactly suits your writing style? Waterman's does. Then how does the ink feed compare with Waterman's exclusive Inquiduct feed? Is it marvelously responsive to every writing need? Well, Waterman's is. And what about filling? Is there bother with plungers or pumping instead of Waterman's remarkably simple and easy one-stroke filling? You see, it's the quality that's built into every part of a Waterman's pen which provides so many extra advantages, so much long-lasting satisfaction, which makes it a pen you're always proud to own. Remember, too, it was Waterman's who invented the first practical fountain pen more than 60 years ago. Throughout the world, Millions of satisfied users will tell you, for finest pen performance, just look for the name Waterman. And now, gangbusters nationwide clues. Richard H. She, warden, Nevada State Prison, wires gangbusters that three convicts have escaped by overpowering a guard and making their getaway in a prison truck. The escaped convicts are described as... Leo Young. 23, 5 feet, 8 inches, 160 pounds, red hair, hazel eyes, medium build, tattoo, word Leo, left forearm, word Leo, left forearm, escape, 
Earl Russo, 31, 5 feet 11 inches, 157 pounds, brown hair, light hazel eyes, two scars, left side of face, scar back of neck, escaped William Russo, brother of Earl Russo, 33, 5 feet 10 inches, 152 pounds, brown hair, blue eyes, walks awkwardly. Watch for Leo Young, Earl Russo, and William Russo. Escape Nevada State Prison. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police force in the world, takes over for gangbusters to interview by proxy Sheriff T.L. Head of Tunica County, Mississippi. Commissioner Valentine. Commissioner Head, the notorious criminal, Valansky, has been front page news within the past three weeks, and we're all very anxious to hear the inside facts. Well, Commissioner Valentine, in the spring of 1940... Stanley Belansky and his partner, James K. Tillotson, were two of the trickiest gunmen at large. Using the names of Robert Hack and James Stewart, they stopped at a fashionable inn at Laconia, New Hampshire, and posed as sons of very wealthy families. Uh, how about it? Another demi-task, Belansky? Will you cut out that Belansky stuff? So registered here as Hack and Stewart. Somebody will hear you. Okay, okay. Oh, but what a hotel. A dining terrace overlooking a mountain lake. Yes, sir. Home was never like this back at the penitentiary. Oh, stop the gagging. Okay, okay. Yeah. There's something in the newspaper that might interest you. I see. Wells Beach, Maine. Local store robbed by two masked gunmen. Now, I wonder who they could be. You know, you'd think those guys would learn that crime don't pay. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you, though? Oh, come on. Come on, let's go. Now, we ain't had no dessert yet. I said, come on. Okay, here. Lean against the rail like this, kind of casual like. What for? To see those two girls just finishing dinner across the pavilion? I'll say, a couple of dolls. Well, one of them is Martha Sanford. An old New England family. Yeah? Yeah. I know. I checked on her this afternoon. She and her girlfriend are going to be our first bit of camouflage. Oh, boy. Imagine being camouflaged with them. Camouflage me all over, brother. Oh, shut up. Just take along with whatever I say. I think it's just horrid your mother and dad want to drag you off to Bar Harbor. Yes, I wish I could stay on here with you, Martha. Anyway, it won't be for another two weeks. I beg your pardon, but aren't you Martha Sanford? Why, yes. Oh, I guess you don't remember me. So many fellas were giving you the rush at Dartmouth last winter. Oh, were you at Dartmouth that week? Yeah. I guess I didn't make much of an impression, though. My name is Hack, Bobby Hack. Bobby Hack. Were you in the ski jumping contest? No, I was just a spectator. But, well, Jimmy here, he tried to break his neck in the ski jump. Me? Oh, I'm sorry. Miss Sanford, this is Jimmy Stewart. How do you do? And this is Julie Harris. Oh, how do you do? Hello, Miss Harris. Well, you girls seem to be going somewhere. It was nice meeting you again, Norm. Perhaps we'll see you now that we're all here at the resort together. I don't see why not. Well, that'll be fine. Well, goodbye, Miss Sanford. It's been a pleasure, Miss Harris. Yeah, me too. Goodbye. Well, goodbye. Look, for Pete's sake, will you cut out that me too stuff? My Volansky, what did you let him get away for? We could have dated him easy. There's no rush. No rush at all. We won't pull another job until next week. And we'll use him proper. Attention, squad room. Report from Cambridge, Massachusetts on warehouse robbery. 
two gunmen believed heading this direction in black Buick, Massachusetts license, heavily armed and dangerous, all police be on alert for this car. Come on, let's get into the car, will you? Those girls don't come, we'll go without them. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Get in. Society dames never are on time anyhow, Tillotson. Can I go into the hotel and tell them to shake a leg? Look, you don't tell society dames like them to shake a leg. Oh, you don't, huh? Okay. But I'm still sick of waiting. Oh, here they come now. Hello, have we kept you here a while yet? Not if one hour ain't long. You ain't. Oh, don't pay any attention to Jimmy, girls. Uh, I'm trying to cure him of the habit of saying ain't, but... He says some of the Harvard boys say it. So oh, oh, really? <laughs> Hop in, girls. Jim, get in the back seat with Julie. Okay, you're the boss. He does have a grouch. Indigestion. <laughs> You'll get over it, Martha. Well, girls, where'll it be? It really doesn't matter. <laughs> now, look what's coming. Scram. Cop. What did you say? Get going, will you? That flat foot's coming over to the car. What's the matter with you boys? Oh, pardon me. Is this your car, young man? Why, yes, officer. Hmm. Black Buick, eh? What's wrong with that, officer? It may be nothing, miss. Only we're looking for a car of this type in connection with a holdup over in Massachusetts. Why, well, the very idea. Are you accusing us? I'm not accusing anybody. Just checking. Ah, oh, never mind, surely. The officer has to do his duty. Hmm. New Hampshire plates. The bandit car had a Massachusetts license. Well, there's your answer, officer. Okay, pal, let's go. Just a moment. You're probably okay, but let's see your driver's license and car registration. Oh, I certainly, officer. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't seem to have him with me. Now, see here, this is ridiculous. I'm Martha Sanford, officer, and if you want proof of who I am... Well, I'm not worried about my... you, young woman. But your escorts here will have to identify themselves. I'll stand on the running board. You better drive to the police station. Oh, no, you don't. Cop it. Step on it, pal. What are you doing? Sit low in your seats. Uh, 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 Bobby, stop this car. Shut up. That cop's running back to his car. He's coming after us. Oh, please, Bob. We'll all be killed. Shut up, I'll crown you. You must be bend. Way out, pal. You hit that tree. No. Just... Polanski. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. I just had my wind knocked up. Here, help me out of here. My back. My back. Come on, come on. Get me out of here, will you? Yeah. There we are. Okay. My back. Oh, I'm dying. Come on, Belanski. We got a blow. Yeah, you said it. Ah, she'd die. She'd die. I'm Barton of the FBI, Lieutenant Raven. They told me at the station I'd find you here at the hospital. I'm glad you got here, Mr. Barton. Any idea yet who the gunmen were? Yes. Fingerprints on the wrecked Buick indicate the driver was Stanley Bolanski. Bolanski, huh? And the whole country's looking for him. <laughs> How are the girls? Well, Miss Harris will recover. The doctors say Miss Sanford is dying. Oh, that's terrible. Her back was broken. She's right here in the emergency room. This way. Uh, don't leave, nurse. We may need you as a witness. Good Lord, how young and pretty she is. So, Miss Sanford, can you see this picture I have in my hand? Is that Belansky's picture, Lieutenant? Yes. It's not clear. <laughs> I'll hold it closer. Positive, Miss Sanford. Yes, I know. I'm afraid there's nothing more we can do here, Lieutenant. She identified the picture just in time. Warning. Gunmen believed to be Malansky and Tillotson have just pulled you hold up. Watch greater Boston area. Polanski headed that way, armed and dangerous. Attention. 
North Walpole Sporting Goods Store robbed of 40 rifles, 30 revolvers, large quantities of ammunition. Special notice, new kidnapping and robbery beneath work of Balansky and Tillotson. Three oaks in, and the rocks are glassy. You know, Tillotson, this is one of the swellest views on the whole North Shore. Let's skip the scenery, Balansky. It's after midnight. Let's get to work. You know, New England ain't healthy for us no more. We want to get this job over with and head south like we planned. Okay, okay. Just think of it, though, pal. This, this hotel's full of people. Come on, will you? Will you come on? Okay. Oh, look, the manager's bedroom's that window up there on the second floor. Yeah, we can climb up this trellis. Okay, I'll go first. Just like Romeo climbing up the trellis. Watch it. Yeah. Is it? Get up here. Yeah. There There's a telephone trunk wire. Got it. Right. Okay. All right. Go on in through that open window. Okay. Watch it. All right, come on. Flash your light. Hey, this ain't no manager's bedroom. It's a woman's. Yeah. Show. What is it, Joe? Don't make no noise, lady. <laughs> you make another sound and we'll choke you right out of this world. Now, who are you? Are you a guest here? I, I'm the cook. But no good will you do you. Take us to the manager's room. You let me be. Why, you fat cow, I'll break your neck. This is Larry. Is anything wrong in there? This is Larry. Who's that? Quiet. It's, it's burglar, Mr. Brown. Wrap that gun around her head. What is this? What's going on? Get your hands up. Why, why? Get your hands up. You're Brown, the manager, ain't you? Yes. I get this straight. You've got a lot of wealthy guests here. We're going to go around to each room. You're going to knock on the door and wake them up. We're going to rob every one of them. No, I won't. I'll do what we say, mister. And after we rob all the guests, then you'll open the hotel safe. We're doing a complete job. Yeah. Spring house cleaning. <laughs> and don't try any funny work. The telephone wires are cut. We're way off on these isolated rocks, and if necessary, we can kill everyone here. Boy, this will go down in history. <laughs> Or have a whole hotel at one time. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. For over two hours, Belansky and Tillotson held everyone in that hotel at gunpoint. And that, Sheriff Head, was one of the most daring robberies in years. Now, Sheriff Head, Belansky and his partner, Tillotson, after robbing an entire hotel, headed south. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. And they pulled so many big robberies in the south, our time doesn't permit us to enumerate them. But the gunmen continued to follow out their plan of camouflaging themselves by going around with only the leading families and the finest girls. In fact, one such young lady went driving with them just outside of Biloxi, Mississippi. It's awfully sweet of you young men to drive your way out to my uncle's like this. I do hate riding on buses. Well, Isabel, it's easy this week. Be sweet to a girl like you. Uh, yeah, besides, you're good camouflage. Camouflage? Oh, he, he means uh, you're so pretty, you, you dress up the cars. Bro. Oh, you know, I never thought I'd like northern boys, but I feel like I've known you two all my life. Oh, uh, here's my uncle's house. Turn in this driveway. Okay. I know uncle's going to be glad to see you. To see us? Uh huh. Why? Does he know we're coming? Why, sure. I telephoned him and told him I was bringing out the nicest young man. Hey, that your uncle's car in front of the house? Why, yes. Wait a minute, Wait a minute Isabel. Just who is your uncle? Well, I, I told I don't you. mind his name. That's a police car there. There's a star on it. Well, what got you boys so upset? Just because my uncle's a sheriff? It's a trap, pal. She brought us here on purpose. Now, why should I do such a thing as that? Because you probably read the account of the holdup at the Wiggins Bank. Lansky. A guy's coming out of the house. Yeah, I see him. Well, that's my uncle. Yank the dame back in the car. We'll hold her as a hostage. Come here, you. No, you don't. We can call Dad a heck with it. Go ahead, step on it. 
Hey, that guy's shooting at us. Keep low. If I could only get my hands on that team, now I'd kill her. What a rotten trick she pulled on us. I'm telling you, Belansky, it's getting so you can't trust nobody. Nobody. Come in. Hello, Captain James. Well, Barton, what brings you down to Biloxi? Those two bank robbers whose description you broadcast yesterday, the ones who robbed the Wiggins Bank, I flew down as soon as I read about them. Flew down? The FBI must want to mind a bed. They sound like the men we've been chasing all over New England. Polanski and Tillotson. I'm sorry, but we haven't even got a clue on them, Barton. Well, Captain James, I've been studying their method of operation for weeks. And I've got an idea of how we might get on their trail. Yeah? How? Well, those gunmen never hide out in the usual places. They appear in public with respectable girls and pose as young men of wealth. By Godfrey, that's how Sheriff Howard's niece almost caught him. Now, it's only a hunch, Captain James. But I have an idea. If we canvass the restaurants and entertainment spots, we may find Balansky and Tillotson spending some of their money right under our noses. This cafe we're coming to isn't exactly the highest class spot, Barton, but it's very popular. Well, we might as well try it, Captain James. We haven't had any luck yet. Well, you can get the place the once over from the best of you all here. Hmm. Quite a crowd. Yeah. No sign of. Hey, James. Here? Yeah? That table in the far corner near the exit sign. Is that Polanski? Yeah. A girl at the table with him and that other chap. That's Tillerson. What a break. There's so many people in there, they're jammed in like sardines. Mm. How are we going to get to that table without being spotted? Both Tillerson and Balansky are bound to have guns. If they ever start shooting in that crowd, it'll be a wholesale massacre. Yeah. Wait, I've got an idea. Here's a couple of waiters' aprons. Yeah. Say, that might do the trick. Yeah. I have the string of back of it. Right. You think we ought to carry a tray or something? No, we'll need our hands for action. I'm ready. Now remember, James, we've got to grab those rats before they can pull their guns. If they do spot us, jump to the table. Yeah. Knock the table over and pull the tablecloth over their heads. Right. Okay. Come on. Not too fast, James. Not too fast. Yeah. The girl's looking this way. Yeah, I see her. Keep walking. Just a few more steps. He sees us. Come on, dive for him fast. Right. Oh, they got you. Drop that glass. You get lousy. Put the cuffs on him, Chance. I got this one. Okay. You bet. They're not sure. Not sure. Okay, Valansky, start walking. You and Tillotson are all washed up. Well, Commissioner Valentine, Valansky and Tillotson were sentenced to life in prison in the Mississippi Penitentiary for robbing the Wiggins Bank. But just 22 days ago, on October 5th, at 8 o'clock Friday morning, four prisoners were loaded into the truck cage at the penitentiary to be taken to the prison farm. One of those prisoners was Belansky. The prison truck was driving along the road. Now listen, you guys. Yeah. I think we're safe because they got us in this iron cage in the back of the truck here. But we had a 38 smuggled into the prison. Kennedy's up next to the driver. I think he's a trusty. But he's got that gun. And he's going to poke it and drive his ribs. Then things are going to happen and happen fast. You ready? Okay, Kennedy. Stop his truck or I'll blow your head off. Come on, Kennedy. Open this cage quick. Okay, come on. Throw that driver in there. That does it. Hold on, guys. We're going places. Come on, Kennedy. Get this train rolling. Hurry up. Emergency to all state police and sheriffs, Stanley Belansky and four other convicts escaping in prison truck along Highway 7. These convicts all armed and will kill. Black all roads. Black all roads. Attention, all police. Attention, all police. Polanski and convicts who abandoned prison truck and kidnapped women and children have released victims and are now fleeing in black Buick sedan along road to Tunica. 
be ready to shoot it out with fleeing convicts headed by Polanski. Kennedy, look. There's lights in the road up ahead. There must be cops. We can run them down, Belansky. You guys lie down on the floor of the car. Get down. Okay. Yeah? You're going to shoot it out with them? No cops ever going to take me again. I'll tell you that. All right, then. Here we go. Come on, sir. Come on. Hey, they didn't get us. Just ahead, this road left. It leads in the swamp. Take it. Another cop in the south is after us. I'll kill him. I'll, I'll kill him if they ever get anywhere near me. Hold on now. I'm going to take that turn. <laughs> Look out, look out the trees. I can't, I can't. Look out, I can't. Get out of the car, man. The cops are already coming down the road. All right. Come on, fellas. Take to the swamp. It's our only chance. Come on, come on. this way. Come on, man. Keep going. Sure don't know how you ever found this deserted house, Polanski. You're mighty good. Yeah, those fools were out looking for us in the swamp. But you and me was having ourselves a good night's sleep in this house here. Sun will be up in a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, how are we going to get out of these parts? <laughs> Don't you worry about that. I got more tricks up my sleeve than these hicks down here ever dreamed of. I think we ought to get going now. Hey, brother. Hey, Polanski. What's the matter? There's a whole army surrounding the house. What? Men, dogs, guns. Sorry, the dirty reds. Yeah. Look, look, look. Get up, Alan. Okay. All right, Belanchi. All right. All right, I give up. I give up, coppers. I'm through. And this time, Belanchi, you're through for good. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. Just three weeks ago today, Belanchi was caught in that deserted house. And tonight, he's once again in the Mississippi State Penitentiary for life. This has been a very, very interesting case, Sheriff Head. Belansky could have been a real success in life. But instead, he has nothing to look forward to except prison bars. From across the Atlantic, from across the Pacific... Our fathers, sons, and brothers are returning to a new America. A crime wave has followed every war, and we must not allow lawbreakers to tear down here at home the very ideals that our men have fought to preserve. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the program that brings you authentic police case histories. Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Ink present Gangbusters. This nation is now in the midst of a serious crime wave, and we must stop the attempts of the lawbreakers to tear down here at home the very ideals for which we have fought. And so Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Ink are proud to present Gangbusters with Louis J. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police force in the world. Commissioner Valentine will interview by proxy Harvey Scott, superintendent of the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Police Department. Commissioner Valentine. Well, Superintendent Scott, tonight's gangbusters case should be quite an unusual one. It is, Commissioner Valentine. How have you decided to start it? Well, in Pittsburgh, there was a certain professional wrestling school run by a pretty rough type of wrestler. He was known as Hammerlock. A few years ago, this Hammerlock walked up to the mat with a rather slight of build, pasty-faced man who had dropped in for a lesson. It'll lie down on the mat. This way? Yeah. Uh, you're a businessman? Uh, yes, sir. Well, as you have on your business clothes, I can't show you much, but... I just wanted a demonstration. Well, all right. Now, you're flat on your back, but you've got to learn how to keep a man flat on his back. Yes. Now, watch. 
I fall on my left knee beside you. Then I grab your right hand with my left hand. Yeah. Your left hand with my right hand. <laughs> you weigh a ton. <laughs> now, my right knee is free. I place it on your chest. Oh. Now, if you move an inch, I throw my weight on that right yeah. knee. And I can break every rib in your body. Will you hold me tight like that? Just to let me see how it would feel to, to, to try and get up. Yeah, yeah, all right. Now, go ahead. Just try to move. I hope I didn't throw you too hard. I just wanted to try my little trick against the professional wrestler. You, you must have busted my ribs. I guess I'll have to be going. And who are you? I never saw anybody move so fast. Oh, it's just a little hobby of mine. A little pet trick I like to try out against professional wrestlers. Well, I'm sorry, mister. I'll have to be leaving. I don't care what you say, Haynes. I'm packing up and leaving. Step in slips and undies, huh? Mm -hmm. This trunk will never hold them all. Your boyfriend ain't gonna like you leaving like this, Cora. I'm bored stiff. So you're getting out. When I get this trunk packed. Uh, I'll bet all them lace under things cost a hunk of dough. He's so goody, goody. Well, he makes me sick. Hey, he's my pal, you know. Well, I'm too young. Read books, go to the movies. Look out, Kitty. I love you, but I'm packing. Because Zara ain't gonna like this, Cora. Well, that's too bad. He's not even a man. There were only some excitement once in a while. Now, listen, kid. Got to tell you something. I'm fed up with his goody goody. What do you want to tell me? Will you swear never to tell? That good, huh? Will you swear? Okay. Kazara has been pulling jobs since 1923. What? He's robbed freight trains, maybe a dozen other places, and a couple of times he shot it out with the cops. Kazara. You ain't heard nothing yet. Kazera ran a gang that had this town on its heels. If it weren't for a bad break, Kazera never would have been caught. But they were scared enough of the guy to give him a wrapper from 10 to 60 years in the Western Penitentiary. Ain't you lying? Oh, no, sister. Not Kazera. You're teamed up with a guy who, if the cops knew who he was when they faced him, half of them would faint. Gee, I, I wanted excitement, but I... I didn't bargain for all this. You better get them pretty little undies back in the drawers before he gets here. Why, he... He wouldn't think nothing of killing me if he wanted to. You said it. Oh. Oh, hello, Haynes. Hello. Hello, Kazera. Hello, honey. Hello, Kazera. I'm glad to see you. Oh, it's warm out. Yeah, but it's kind of hot in here, too. It, it shouldn't be, though. Us living up on the eighth floor. I wouldn't mind a good, cool lemonade. Oh, well, the trunk. Oh, yeah. Um, while you were gone, I got a telephone call that my mother was sick, a, a heart attack. Oh, I'm sorry. I was packing to go see her, and then I called the doctor, and he said she was much better and I wouldn't have to come, so... Uh, so I'm unpacking. That's good. I'll help you unpack then. Oh, well, uh, first... For, first, I'll fix you a lemonade. Oh, good. That's fine. Um... I'm glad you're here, Haynes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. You know, I just happened to drop by. Good. I'm glad you like Cora as well as you do. <coughs> I dislike that cat. Come here, kitty, kitty. Come here. Now, now. Now, nice kitty. <laughs> now, nice kitty, nice kitty. Shouldn't have done that, Kazera. Oh. Cora loves that. The door to the hall. Oh, the cat just went out the door. Mm-hmm. Didn't I hear the kitty meowing? Where'd he go? He just walked out of the door. Get some air, I guess. Oh. Um, Kazera, why don't you take me dancing tonight? Oh, I, I can't tonight, Cora. I, 
I told Haynes I'd go for a walk with him in the park. I, I've got a few little things I want to talk about. Who are you men? You're a pretty tricky old gent, aren't you? Please, please, you'll put down the gun, please. A big wholesale house, and instead of a safe, you wrap your money all up in grease paper. <laughs> And hide it here in your cold storage room. Get it, pal. Sure. Please. Please, it's all the money I got. You know, some people recently have been very foolish. They've tried to identify me to the police. It's a big mess of it here, boy. Just shove it in your bag. Now you, you won't identify me to the police. Please, I'm an old man. There's a lot of money there. Take it and go away. I've got a big haul, boy. It was all done up in nice little packages. Yeah, that's why I cased this place for a week. Now, mister, it's your turn. Holy smoke, she threw him right over your head. Yeah, the fall knocked him unconscious. Come on. Close the refrigerator door. Right. That'll hold him. Oh, icebox starting to freeze again, Kazara. <laughs> what do you know? Maybe you'll be frozen still. Unnecessary cruelty points to Matthew Casera, dangerous gunman who's been terrorizing Pittsburgh. Report to headquarters for confidential instructions. Well, you've done enough primping, Cora. All right, Casera. Come on, let's go out and eat, huh? Uh, Haynes is always for eating. <laughs> Gee, I... I wish we could find the kitty. Oh, it'll show up. Come on. Okay. You boys will have to give me a lot of attention tonight. Hey! hey what is this? Is. Let go of me. What's the meaning of this, officer? Hold the girl and get the cuffs on that one. Cut I haven't done anything. Cut it out. Now you. You're Kazera. That's right, officer. Don't you move a muscle. Frisk him, Sergeant. <laughs> I haven't got a gun, if that's what you're looking for. We were just going out to eat and... Oh, 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 my, my heart. Oh. He's had one of his heart attacks. Well, well that's a queer one. Now, see what his eyes look like. Perhaps he isn't too bad off. <laughs> now, for you, copper. I've never seen nothing move so fast in my life. Now, I've got the gun. <laughs> I wasn't trying to kiss him. Well, you two will have to look after yourselves. I'm getting out. What'll I do? Now I'm in on a killing. Hey, try to get these cuffs off me, Kazara. Hey, Kazara, you can't leave us like this. The identity of the gunman responsible for the killing of Detective Lorch and for many recent robberies has been established beyond doubt. Killer is Matthew Kazara. Five feet, eight and a half inches, brown hair... Blue gray eyes. This gunman is a killer and must be apprehended at once. Well, Superintendent Scott, with the identity of Kazira established and police on the alert for him, I know the rest of the case will be even more exciting. But right now. Every day, millions of people listen to Frazier Hunt report the news. This famous war correspondent and radio commentator writes, and I quote Mr. Hunt, The finest fountain pen I've ever written with is my new Waterman's Taperite. It writes as smooth as satin, makes such clean, clear lines, and to top it off, it's the best-looking pen of all. Well, thank you, Fraser Hunt. Friends, so many of you have been waiting patiently through the war years for a good quality fountain pen. You'll want to go to your Waterman's dealer and see America's newest pen. The new Waterman's Taperite. You'll want it the minute you lay eyes on it. Sleek, slim, trim. You'll say, it is a beauty. And what a Christmas present a new Waterman's Taperite makes. I promise you, no gift will be received with more delight. But better start buying now because the demand will exceed the supply. 
you can get Waterman's pens and Waterman's pen and pencil sets, both the new Taperite design and the new Standard Point design in a variety of styles and prices. Every one built to the standards of craftsmanship which have made Waterman's pens famous for their superlative writing. For America's newest, finest pens, ask for Waterman. Now back to Gangbusters and Commissioner Valentine. Superintendent Scott, police bulletin had been issued for Matthew Kazera. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. But Kazera was as wary and cunning as ever. He had other plans. Yes? You, Mrs. Flowers, who runs this boarding house? Yes. Uh, have you a room I might rent? Well, yes, I, I do have a room on the ground floor and back. May I see it? Well, I, I had just about decided I wouldn't rent any more rooms to single gentlemen. Oh, why? I'm a rather nervous person, and I... Oh, I don't blame you at all, Mrs. Flowers. You, you don't? No, not at all. I don't have any men rumors right now. I don't blame you, Mrs. Flout. Oh, what a beautiful canary. Yes, I've had him ten years. You like canaries? I love them. And cats. Uh, may I just step in a minute? Well, yes. Yes, I guess so. Oh, oh what an attractive pub. <laughs> I- I'm Jonathan S. Brooks. Jonathan. Oh, that's an old biblical name. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, don't you think I'm wise, Mr. Brooks, not to rent to strange men? Absolutely. But you know, Mrs. Flowers, I was just thinking, of course you'd really be safer to have one man in the house. Now, I never thought of that. Oh, yes, an emergency comes up, a drunk at the door, a, a leak in a pipe. I'm surprised you're not married, being so understanding of women. Well, of course, Mrs. Flowers, it's... As always, the first time. Well, that's so, I guess. <laughs> now, I-, I wonder if you'd show me the room you were speaking about. Why, yes, if you'd like to. It's down at the end of the hall. This way. Thank you. Car one, calling headquarters. I'm getting you, detective. I've just finished talking again with Haynes. Gazera's partner who was captured with Cora, his girlfriend. Nothing new on the whereabouts of Gazera. Then, take your map of Pittsburgh, Benaki. The one we divided up into squares. We'll have different squadrons cover each square for rooming houses. You're to take square five. Yes, sir. Step on it, Tom. Good afternoon, ma'am. We're the police. You operate this boarding house? The police? Why, yes. Yes, I'm Mrs. Flowers. Uh, won't you step in? Thank you. Do you have many men rumors? No, uh, no, I don't. Not now. I see. Well, if you don't take men rumors, there's no reason to bother you. The only man here is Mr. Brooks, Jonathan Brooks. But he's really a... Oh, he's just like one of the family. Uh, maybe he could help you. Where's his room? Uh, right down the hall. I'll show you. You say that Mr. Brooks isn't really a room. Oh, no. Oh, I don't know what I'd do without him. Well, I really don't know if there's much sense in talking with him, then. Right here. Oh, Mr. Brooks is such a capable man. I see. We're looking for a man who's a killer. A killer? Yes. Oh, ah, then I'm awfully glad I've got Mr. Brooks staying with me. Jonathan? Jonathan? I guess he's not in. Oh, I just happened to remember. He must have gone downtown to do my shopping. Well... Uh, shall I have him call you at police headquarters? No. No, it's not necessary, as long as you say he's really not a boarder, but one of the family. Attention. Attention. The Consolidated Drug Supply House just been robbed, and manager cruelly beaten. Manager has identified picture of Matt Cazera as the gunman. This killer must be caught. Approach with caution. Uh. 
I think I'll go downtown and do a little shopping, Mrs. Flowers. Oh, why, 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 yes, Mr. Brooks. Why, you seem so nervous. Oh, well, it's just all those radio broadcasts about that killer. Oh, you mean Cazera. Uh, yes. I won't leave you if you don't want me to. No, 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 I, I'm all right. Well, then I'll, I'll see you later. I won't be going long, Mrs. Flowers. All right. Operator. Operator. Number, please. Get me the police department. Quick, the police department. Police department. Detective Bernanke. This is Mrs. Flowers. I have a rooming house at the corner of Maine and Kelly. There's a man here. Oh, I'm awfully frightened. I I think he's that killer you're looking for. What? Cosera? Yes. We called at your place yesterday. You said he wasn't really a rumor. I, I didn't think of him as such, but I found a gun in his room. And I've been looking at him and thinking. I think he's dyed his hair, but I think it's him. Now listen carefully. If he's the one we want, he's a killer. Is he there now? No, he's gone out, but he'll be back. All right. I want to talk to my superiors, but we'll protect you in every way. I'll call you back around four o'clock. Well, suppose he's here. Pretend I'm somebody else. But listen to the instructions very carefully. All right. I'll be waiting. Hello? This is Detective Bonaki. Are you alone? Yes. We're going to wait until after dark to take him. Yes. Nine o'clock tonight. Hello, Mr. Oh. Flowers. Oh, yes. Uh, I- I'm on the telephone, Mr. Brooks. Oh, excuse me. Well, I'm... I'm awfully sorry, Hattie, to hear about it, but I- I'm sure you'll feel better. I get it. But you must listen carefully. Uh, uh, when did the doctor say you should go to the hospital? Be in your sitting room at nine o'clock. Oh, that's a shame. If Cosera is there, keep the shade up. If he isn't there, put the shade down. You got it? Well, I'm awfully glad you called, Hattie. Don't miss up on those signals. That's all. Oh, oh, I dropped the receiver. Somebody sick? Uh, yes, yes, a friend of mine. She, uh, she's quite sick. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'll sit down and keep you company. Then, if you'd like to, later this evening, I'll take you to the movie. Come in. Mrs. Flowers, this is Inspector Monaghan. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Mrs. Flowers? We could tell from your sitting room shade because there wasn't him. But he'll be back any second. We're going to try to take him in this hallway. Now, the sitting room on this side... Blank wall all along here. His room's at the end of this hall. Let's see just where. That's his room. Mm -hmm. And there are the cellar stairs. Wasn't there a cellar door there? Yes, sir, but he took it off and didn't put it back. Hmm. All right. Let's get back up the front door. Now, there may be some shooting. I want you to go upstairs. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Detective Bernanke, we'll darken the hall so we can make a grab as soon as Kazera comes in the door. Right. Snap the light. Remember, this guy's dynamite, Inspector. There's a signal. Are you sure? Positive. That was no regular telephone ring. Charlie's watching the house across the street. I told him if he saw Kazera coming to have the operator just take him the phone. Look. Turning in. That's him, all right. We've got to be positive it's Kazera, though. As soon as he closed the door, you jump from there. You'll be hitting him from that side. And lock his arms to his side. Quiet. Watch yourself. <laughs> I've got him. Turn the light on. All right. All right, copper. I... Back you up. Frisk him, Bernanke. I've got his arms pinned. I'm through, coppers. I admit it. I'll give up. Here's his gun, Inspector Monaghan. A police revolver. The one he took away from Detective Lodge and then killed him with. Oh. 
Can you beat that, Menaki? He thought he could break away. Won't wake out of that beating till tomorrow morning, Inspector. Is, is the creature subdued? He's unconscious, but you stay up there. Well, we better get the cuffs on him and lug him out. Yes. Roll him over and put him on. None of your tricks, Gazette. No. This is a gun. I've got it in the head. And I'm using you as a shield. Shoot him, Inspector, even if he does shoot me. Drop your gun, Gazette. Stand back, Inspector. Or I'll blow every brain out of this copper's head. I'm taking him with me to the end of the hall. And if you try to follow and move a muscle, I'm killing him. You won't get away with it, Gazette. Don't kill him. Stand back, I said. I've killed one cop, and I'd just as soon kill this one. Now, cop, I'm going to throw you down the cellar stairs and then kill the other cop. You throw me down the stairs, and you're coming to it! I'll get into this way, too, Kizera. I've got my finger wedged in front of the hammer of Kizera's gun, Benaki. He can't fire. You Stay have... back, Benaki. You have to this, Inspector. You're going down these stairs. Not without you, Kizera. <laughs> Instead of Kazara landing on top, I landed on top. He tried to get my gun. I let him have it. Roll him over. A bullet through his heart. One through the head. This time, Kazara really is dead. Superintendent Scott, I want to congratulate Inspector Monaghan and Detective Vinocchi. For getting this killer. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. And everyone in Pittsburgh gave a sigh of relief when they knew that Killer Cazera was finally dead. Now we come to one of the most important parts of our program. The broadcasting of police bulletins and wanted notices concerning persons, persons most urgently sought by the police at this time. These clues, which are broadcast by gangbusters as a public service to help combat the present crime wave, so far have resulted in the apprehension of almost 300 criminals, many of them murderers, kidnappers, and bank robbers. While these clues are being checked for last-minute developments, here's a word from Waterman. A doctor asks, I seem to write several hundred more prescriptions when I use Waterman's blue-black ink in my fountain pen. Can this be so? A secretary asks, does Waterman's blue-black ink go farther, or do I just imagine it? Well, the answer to both questions is, Waterman's blue-black ink does go farther, up to three times farther than any other inks tested by a nationally known independent laboratory. When you use Waterman's blue-black ink in your fountain pen, every filling means up to 6,500 extra words before you have to fill again. Why? Because Waterman's blue-black ink is all ink, no dilution, no solvent. So for greater writing convenience, to save time and bother, get Waterman's blue-black ink, only ten cents at all stores. There are seven other brilliant Waterman's colors, jet black, washable blue, South Sea blue, brown, green, purple, and red, all in the famous tip-fill bottles, and all only ten cents. And now, Gangbusters Clues. Gangbusters is the only radio program set up to broadcast throughout this entire nation actual clues to persons most urgently sought by the police. Attention, please. Attention. Urgently sought on charge, bank robbery. Matthew Kimes and Olaf Alvin Rogers. These men alleged to have robbed State Bank at Morton, Texas. Forced employees and others into vault, and escaped in stolen car with more than $17,000. Listen carefully to their official description. Matthew Kimes, K-I-M-E-S, 38, 5 feet 7 inches, 181 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, ruddy complexion, heavy build, wears colored glasses most of time. Second alleged bank robber. Olaf Alvin Rogers. 39, 5 feet, 7 and 1 half inches, 120 pounds, dark brown hair, blue-gray eyes, 
Tattoos, woman's figure on upper left arm, woman's head on lower left arm. Be on alert for Matthew Kimes and Olaf Alvin Rogers, alleged bank robbers. Texas authorities are seeking the slayer of Elnora Collins, 30, whose burned and bruised body was found in a lonely spot on the outskirts of Beaumont, Texas. The man most urgently wanted for questioning in connection with this murder is Riley Brown McCain. Listen carefully to this man's description. Riley Brown McCain, 40, 5 feet 11 inches, 150 to 165 pounds, ruddy complexion, dark brown hair, thin and gray, combed straight back, turquoise blue eyes, Eyelids twitch when talking. Speaks rapidly. Wanted for questioning, Riley Brown McCain. These are the clues of the persons most urgently sought by police tonight, November 24th, 1945. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Now here's Commissioner Valentine. Next week, gangbusters will present Inside Facts on the last of the Wild West gunmen, a case history of a gangster's activities that covered close to half a century and ended in one of the most unusual ways I've ever come across. For the thrilling, authentic dramatization of the last of the Wild West gunmen, listen next week, same time, same station, to gangbusters. And any time, anywhere... When you are buying a fountain pen or when you are buying ink, always look for the name Waterman. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Ink present Gangbusters. the foxholes of Europe, from the steaming jungle swamps of the Pacific, our men are now coming home to a new America. A wave of crime has followed every war, and we must not allow lawbreakers to tear down here at home the very ideals that our men have fought to preserve. Tonight, gangbusters present the authentic inside facts concerning a killer who felt he was even too tough for the army. And so, Louis J. Valentine, who has just resigned as commissioner of the largest police department in the world, takes over to interview by proxy Chief A.S. Harper, chief of police of Amarillo, Texas. Commissioner Valentine. Chief Harper, I believe that one of the surest ways to combat crime is to expose it. Now we would like to have you rip this case wide open tonight. Well, Commissioner Valentine... I'd like to start back in October 1942 at 10.30 in the evening. A small-time gangster, Doc Rickett, was sitting with his girlfriend in a fashionable Cincinnati nightclub. You're a snappy-looking number tonight, Cora. You like this dress, huh? Yeah, it fits you like a glove. You're the... Hey, what are you staring at? Huh? What are you staring at? The big red-headed man over there. Any objections? Bloody, you're my girlfriend. <laughs> the redhead doesn't think so. He's smiling. Why, oh, that... Hey. Don't pay any attention to him, Cora. Why not? That's Red Beaver. Red Beaver? He's dynamite. The FBI and Secret Service have sent out coast-to-coast alarms. He was a deserter from the Army. He's the quickest trigger man I know of. He only pulls the biggest jobs there are. Thanks, Rickett. I thought he was interesting. Now I'm sure. Now you've done it. He's coming over. You cross him and you get a bullet through your head. And you thought you were a big shot. I bet there are a million girls who wish they were in my place right now. He's sharp. 
Hello, pretty lady. How about a little dance? Lay off, Beaver. She's my girl. So you know who I am, I reckon? Sure. I, I spotted your red hair. I'm no Sunday school teacher myself. I blow around. How'd you know my name? When I spotted good looking here, I asked a few questions about who she was with. What's your tag, Sugar? Cora. Cora Weston. Mm hmm. You've got what it takes, Cora. Move over, I'll sit down. I told you, Peter. Cora's my girl. Sure, sure, I had you. You know, Rickard, I think I could use you. Maybe put you up in the big dough. Yeah? Yeah, I could use a smart guy right now in my business. What kind of business, Beaver? <laughs> the entertainment business. Yeah? Sure, I like to entertain. Let's see, we'll uh, start with a little Halloween party. A Halloween party? Where? In the Avondale branch of the Second National Bank. Oh, I get it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Halloween. You know, sweep the bank clean with the witch's broom. Suppose you take a walk for a couple of minutes, Rickard. I, I want a little board of directors meeting here with Cora. Well, I... Graham. Okay. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll get a drink at the bar, and then I'll be back. Smooth, honey. You're plenty smooth. You're kind of sugar-coated yourself, Beaver. <laughs> Believe in holidays, Cora? I guess so. Why? Today's Columbus Day. Remember, Columbus discovered America and moved in. So? So I'm taking a tip from him. I just discovered you, so I'm going to do like him. Move in. Bad, Cora. Sit in your apartment. You plan to me. Want me to fix your cocktail, Beaver? <laughs> After two weeks, you have to ask me. I'll answer. Oh, no, I'll do the answer. Hello? Oh, uh, is that you, Beaver? Sure, it's me. Well, uh, I haven't got anything to do. Suppose I drop up, huh? No. Cora's my girlfriend now, Richard. Oh, uh... Get your surprise package? Yeah, yeah. But a clown suit and a cowboy suit. What's the gag? Tomorrow's Halloween. You dress up fancy on Halloween, don't you? You ought to wear the clown suit, see? <laughs> Good gag, huh? Oh. Besides, the clientele at the bank will have a tough time describing a clown and a cowboy. I get it. Wait with me a while, Rickett, and you'll learn things. National Bank just robbed at seven thousand dollars by two men in Halloween costumes. One dressed as a cowboy, one as a clown. Approach with caution. These men are heavily armed. That's all. Well, Agent Hurley, we put that warning on every teletype through the state. We at the FBI appreciate your cooperation, Captain Morse. The bandit's stunt of dressing in Halloween costumes was a touch of genius. Nobody can seem to identify them. But I've always noticed that when a man gets money easily, he spends it easily. So, as just one possible trap, I sent out an alert to nightclubs, bars, racetracks, and pool rooms to watch for men who seem to be spending money too freely. Good. Perfect. I never guess they're spending a little too much money is what we're waiting for. Like this nightclub, Cora? We've sure been covering them all, haven't we, Red? <laughs> That's me, Cora. Everything in a big way. Yeah, but Red, you've been cracking so many banks. Every day, headlines in the papers. <laughs> Rickett's so scared, he doesn't even dare leave our hideout. He's pretty jealous, you know, Red. You taking me away from him. You leave Rickett to me. Baby, I've got the biggest job yet lined up. A hundred thousand. Yeah? When? Christmas. At Christmas time, everybody gets presents. I figure maybe the uh, Charleston Trust will want to give us a present. Why do you always pick a holiday, Red? 
Holidays are made for guys like me. On holidays, the suckers stuff up with turkey and guzzle booze, right? They get slow and careless. Gee, I never thought of that. Booze makes them slip up. They let themselves. Uh, uh, waiter. Yes, sir. Waiter, bring another bottle of that champagne over here. You're coming up, sir. You're spending your money awful fast tonight, Red. That's the way I make it, isn't it? Banks have lots of money, you know. Yeah, but you've been drinking a lot. You said tonight. When a man was drinking, he wasn't himself. That's for other guys, not me. You couldn't tell by the way I talk I've had a drink. Here you are, sir. A faulty champagne. You know, someday I'm going to take a bath in that stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, sir. The bubbles are tickled. <laughs> Quick on the trigger, ain't he? Pour it. Certainly, sir. Anything else, sir? No. Here. Buy yourself a house for Christmas. Here, take it. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. You blowing your top, Beaver. Giving that guy a century for a tip? Shut up and drink your champagne. Dames will crab all the time get on my nerves. You couldn't just slip the weight of the hundred. Oh, no, not you. You had to make a production of it. I said shut up. First thing you know, you... Now you're putting that loose slip of yours or I'll slap you again. Now you've done it, you fool. That army sergeant saw you slap me. Oh, yeah? I eat army sergeants on toast. Oh, he's going to use that for an excuse to come over and meet you, huh? He's going to just win like I did to get you away from Rickett. <laughs> What's the matter? Something wrong? What's it to you? Can I do anything for you, miss? No. No. Everything's all right. Hey. What was you figuring on doing, Chum, if it hadn't been all right? Ah, take it easy, buddy. You've been celebrating a little too much. I suppose because you're in the army, you figure maybe I'm easy pickings, huh? Ah, uh, look, I don't want any trouble as long as the young lady says she's all right. Okay, I'm leaving. Oh, so you're going to pull up Prince Charming stuff, huh? Put that gun away. This time, Sergeant, you ran into a tough customer. Oh, if you're so tough, why don't you join the army? We need some good fighters. Oh, the army, huh? I don't see you being so brave. And besides, I don't like the looks of an army uniform. Follow me. We gotta get out of here. Hey, how long are we gonna stay holed up here in Chorus Flat Beaver? As long as I say so, Rickard. Stop playing that piano, Cora. Sit down, Beaver. You're driving us nuts with that walk. Shut up. If it wasn't for your nagging, this wouldn't have happened. Can you beat that? Red gets a snoop full, blows his top, shoots an army sergeant, then tries to pin the rap on me. You hadn't ought to be so quick with that rod, baby. You gonna start telling me how to operate? Oh, no, and I Killing comes it. pretty easy to me, Rickard. I'd remember that if I were you. The same goes for you, huh? And what's that? It ain't a woodpecker. See what it is, Cora. Open up in there. Cops. Stall him. Give us a chance to get out the back window onto the fire escape. If it's the cops, I'll blast them from there. Open up or we'll break in the door. Take your time, boys. Take your time. Okay. What you selling? I'm Captain Morris of the Cincinnati Detectives. Mr. Hurley's a federal agent. So what? We're looking for a man who was seen coming into this building. Why well, pick on me? Every man who comes in this building don't come up here, unfortunately. Cut the comedy. We know he's here. Step aside. Hold it, copper. I'm old-fashioned. I don't let strange men into my apartment unless they've got search warrants. Really? Yeah. And that goes double for coppers. Well, by an odd coincidence, I happen to have a search warrant. Right here. Well, if you must come in... What was that? Come on. Come back from that fire escape into the room again. With your arms up. We guessed if we came in the door, you gentlemen might go out the window, so I had a few of my men out there. Smart guy, huh? I know one of them, Captain Morris Rickett. Rickett's an old-time gangster. The redhead's a new one. I'm just an innocent bystander. The redhead is the one who shot the army sergeant. You got nothing on me, Captain. No. We had all the nightclubs tipped off to report men who were spending money too freely. The waiter who waited on your table called us up. 
We examined the hundred dollar bill you gave him as a tip. I want to see my lawyer. I don't blame you, Red. Suppose we go down to headquarters for a talk. And, uh, if I say no? Well, if you should say no, I'll tell you. You'd come along a good deal like this. Let go of me, Papa. Let go. Let go of me, will you? So Red Beaver started moving fast, Chief, Ho- Chief Hopper. Yes, Commissioner. Red Beaver didn't know what had struck him till he was safe behind bars. But the crime history of Red Beaver had not yet reached its peak. Tonight marks the first broadcast in this L.E. Waterman Company presentation of Gangbusters. And we're proud to have been able to select as chief investigator and commentator for these programs a man who has been a police officer for almost half a century and who last midnight resigned after 11 years as police commissioner of the New York City Police Department. Louis J. Valentine, as head of the largest police force in the world, has made contacts with and influenced police procedure on a nationwide scale. Federal, state, and local police departments throughout the country know and respect Commissioner Valentine as being in the forefront of our constant war against crime. Gangbusters and the L.E. Waterman Company are proud that Commissioner Louis J. Valentine will act as chief investigator on these factual cases. Well, Commissioner Valentine, how does it feel to be facing a microphone? Frankly, Mr. Gardner, it's harder to face than a gangster with a gun. But the L.E. Waterman Company has provided me with an opportunity to do something I've wanted to do for a long time. To me, gangbusters, which names names and states facts, is the ideal way to prove the folly of crime to those who might otherwise be led astray. And it's going to be my purpose to see that every program is pointed to bring about a better, safer, happy America for all. Thank you, Commissioner. And now, in recognition of your never-ending fight against crime, the L.E. Waterman Company makes the year's first network presentation of its Waterman's Deluxe Pen and Pencil gift set to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. It certainly is beautiful. But I already have a Waterman set, one that was presented to me when I became a captain of police in this department 19 years ago. And I'd rather miss one of Mrs. Valentine's home meals than lose that set. Well, Commissioner, I don't blame you. But we do want you to have this newest model Waterman. Thanks, Mr. Gardner. I accept it gratefully. And I'll use them both. And now, Commissioner Valentine, back to the case of Red Beaver. Chief Hopper, Red Beaver was in the Cincinnati prison. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. And it was 16 minutes before 9 on the evening of February 12th. Red Beaver lay sprawled in his bunk, watching water pouring from his wash basin to the cell floor. Finally, he walked over to the bars separating him from Doc Ricketts' cell. Hi, Ricky. Where's all the water coming from, Beaver? <laughs> I told you we'd break out of this joint. But if it's all the same to you, I'd rather walk out than swim out. Know what day today is, Ricky? Sure. February 12th, so what? February 12th. Lincoln's birthday. What do you want we should do? Eat birthday cake? Yeah. You never heard what Lincoln did? He got him so shot. Is that what you're aiming for us to get? Yeah, but before he did, he uh, freed the slaves. So? Today's Lincoln's birthday, so we'll do like him. We'll uh, free the slaves. Us included. Just like that, huh? How? Plug up your base and let the water run on the floor. Why? Yours is running plenty. You gonna start raising fish in there? Do like I say. Okay, okay. Good. Now we'll wait a minute and we call the guard. And what? We yell for a dry cell. While we're switching, we hit him over the head and make a break. How's the water coming? You could launch a ship in here now. Okay. Round the cup. God! God! Help! Help! Hey, We're God. being flooded! Get us out of here! Police, escaping prisoners Red Beaver and Doc.
Doc Rickett have just held up the Second National Bank and are escaping. Green, 1940, Chrysler Sedan. License number 293-348. That is all. To Kansas City Police, to Kansas City Police, Believe Killer Red Fever and Pal Rickett are driving toward Kansas City. These men are heavily armed. Suggest roadblock. I can't stand this strain much longer, Fever. I'm cracking. Don't worry. We'll be all right here in Kansas City. The whole country's looking for us. <laughs> I always do things in a big way, Rickett. But I tell you, Kansas City's safe. I got it all figured out. Roadblock up ahead. Where those rotten coppers are. Coppers all over the place. I'll run over them. I'll kill them. Hold on. Come on. I'm all in. All this what's going on for days is cops shooting at us. Hiding in cellar in Kansas City. Rickett is now under arrest. Red Beaver escaped and is believed hiding in one of the southern states. Hello? Hello, Edward? Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. This is Edwards. That you, Helen? Sure. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let me sit down, huh? You tired? I'm just not used to this Texas weather yet. Mm-hmm. How do you like it here in Amarillo? Oh, that depends upon how well you like me, baby. <laughs> but I haven't seen you very often. I'll see you tonight. All right. Sure, we'll go to a club at... Wait a minute. What's the matter? Hold it. Can you beat that? Huh? <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> Two women out in the street, they bump cars. <laughs> Are they mad? Uh-oh. But the little one's shoving the big one around. No, no, the big one, she won't take it. Wow. <laughs> what happened? The little one gives the big one a slap. Uh-oh, the cop's seen him. Hey, this is a grandstand scene. <laughs> hey, they're looking up here at the window. They can see me laughing at them. <laughs> so you're as good as a radio fight announcer. Uh, the cop's walking across the sidewalk toward my window here. Hey, this is a laugh. Why? If you only knew, sister. Hey, mister, you saw these two women bump cars, didn't you? Sure, I seen them, officer. I was looking right out the window here. Uh, which one was at fault? Ah, uh, no, you don't. You don't get me between two dames, especially those dames. If one of them was cute, it might be difficult. Hello? Hello? Uh, wait a minute, baby. I'm talking to the cop here. Well, I guess I have to take him up to the station house. Will you uh, come up with me and tell what you saw? Now, wait a minute. I'm not going... Uh. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure, I'll go with you. I'd be much obliged if you would. Sure, sure, I will. Uh, hello, sugar. I'll call you back later. All right, Edward. I gotta go see justice, son. Well, copper, lead the way. I'll put on my hat and be right with you. This is the gentleman I was telling you about, Captain Kirkman. He was sitting in the window and saw the two women bump fenders. Oh, I appreciate your coming up to the station, huh? That's all right. Uh, what's your name? Jack Edwards. Oh, I'm Captain Kirkman, and this is Captain King. I'm glad to meet you. Oh, uh, sit down, Mr. Uh, Edwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. Ah, you got a pretty good police station here at Amarillo, haven't you? Oh, it serves its purpose. You a stranger in Amarillo? I've been here a couple of months. Uh, you want me to tell you about those two women bumping cars, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you don't happen to know a man by the name of Red Beaver, do you? <laughs> uh, who? Red Beaver. He's an escaped convict and a killer. No, I never heard of him. What do you ask me? I was just wondering, Red, that's all. Call me Red. My name ain't Red. It's Jack. Jack Edwards. Oh, I see. Here. There's a wanted circular for Red Beaver for desertion from the Army and killing an Army sergeant. No, I don't know what you're talking Detectives about. Detectives standing back here. You all have their guns out, Red. No, no, no I, I didn't kill nobody. It wasn't me. I, I, I didn't kill him. I... Uh, what a sucker I am. Yes, you are. All police officers have been on the lookout for you. Think of me ending up here. For them two dames to bump their cars, I could bump them off. Didn't figure it might be a little plan to get you up here without any shooting. And I thought I was smart. Me, me, Red Beaver, being took in by this one-horse joint. 
I didn't kill that guy, though. We'll leave that to the United States Army, Beaver. They're asking for you. No, 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 look, I, I, I'll do anything. I'll tell you anything you want to know, but the, don't let the Army get a hold of me. So, don't, don't, don't let the Army get a hold of me, please. Sale. Harry Red Beaver, as convicted by a court-martial at Fort Sill, you will, on this morning of September 26, 1944, be hanged by the neck until dead. Harry Beaver, have you anything to say? No. No, I guess I ain't got nothing. May God rest your soul. And Commissioner Valentine, at 6.37 a.m., 20 minutes later, Harry Red Beaver was dead, executed by the United States Army. Chief Hopper... This has been a terrific case tonight, one I doubt that we will ever forget. I wish that every person in this country might have heard it. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. To Red Beaver, the men in the uniform of their country were suckers. He knew better. He knew how to get easy money. But it didn't turn out that way, and it never does. And now, before we present our urgent last-minute bulletins on persons wanted by the authorities at this very moment, The case of Red Beaver is over, but the case of the missing words remains a mystery to millions of Americans. Their only clue is the peculiar behavior of a fountain pen, a pen that sometimes writes on and on without ever seeming to run dry. Then again, it seems out of ink almost before it starts. The reason is that in the first instance, the pen was filled with Waterman's wonderful blue-black ink and thus gave thousands of extra words. The second time, however... A different ink had been used, and fewer words resulted. This tremendous difference, ladies and gentlemen, is because Waterman's blue-black is all ink, true ink. No solvents, no added chemicals, no dilution. That's why, by actual test, Waterman's blue-black ink gives you up to 6,500 more words per filling. Think of it. Up to 6,500 more words per filling than other inks tested. Now you can cut those messy pen-filling chores perhaps in half. Now you can write steadily for hour after hour after hour without pausing to refill your pen. And all you have to do is to make every filling a waterman's filling. Yes, you can solve your own case of the missing words forever with Waterman's blue-black ink. And remember, Waterman's ink is also available in seven other pleasing and distinctive colors. All come in the convenient tip-fill bottle. Each, only ten cents. Now, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues. Chief R.F. Worstner, Dayton, Ohio Police Department, announces a reward of $8,500 is being offered for return of two-and-a-half-year-old baby Ronald Thompson and conviction of his kidnapper. Here is description given gangbusters by Dayton police of alleged kidnapper. Woman, known as Mary Wilkie, 40 to 45 years old, 5 feet 6 inches, about 150 pounds, ruddy complexion, reddish brown hair, believed henna, brushed back and up, speaks with slight accent, possibly southern or eastern, Pleasing personality. Renew vigilance for this woman. Reward now offered by Dayton, Ohio Police, $8,500. From Denver, Colorado Police, urgent bulletin concerning suspect wanted for questioning in connection with murder of J.A. Richardson, that city. Suspect described as follows. Andrew Hypus, alias Jack Wood, alias William Hammond, 36, 5 feet 6 inches, About 150 pounds, dark hair, brown eyes. When last seen, according to police, wore a khaki shirt or jacket with blood stain on right shoulder and sleeve, where he supposedly was shot in struggle with victim. Suspect believed to have left scene of crime in company of woman in green Pontiac sedan, 
bearing Los Angeles license ending in numerals 8-0, watch for Andrew Cyphers, wanted for questioning, murder, Denver Police Department. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Valentine, who has just resigned as commissioner of the largest police department in the world, takes over for gangbusters to interview by proxy Chief of Police Hans Halverson of Ray, North Dakota. Commissioner Valentine. Now, Chief Halverson, the official police reports show that John K. Giles was an exceptionally cunning criminal. And uh, deadly, Commissioner Valentine. So you're going to start tonight's case back at Leech Lake in Minnesota? Yes. There was a tall, wealthy sportsman, a Mr. George William Stubblefield. He had one of the fashionable cottages with a Mr. Barton. And they were there for some bass fishing. Now, in that same section was reported to be the super criminal John K. Giles, like lightning with a gun. At 10.30... In the evening of September 2nd, Mr. Stubblefield and Mr. Barton were in their cabin, alone, looking over their bass fishing equipment. I think I'll try my double spinner with a bucktail streamer tomorrow, Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah? Well, let me see it. The water is pretty warm in the lake, and I think the bass are down pretty deep. Here somewhere. Uh, get those hands up. Both of you. Get those hands up or I'll shoot. Well, we have company. I know you're both rich and you're alone out here in this cabin. I guess he means it too, Mr. Stubblefield. Young man, don't you realize that crime doesn't pay? Uh, I don't want any sermons. I want cash. Well, it so happens we have our hands in the air. Very little money grows on ceilings. All right. You first. Me? Yeah, you. The name is Stubblefield. All right. Uh, lower your right hand and pick out everything there is in your pocket and drop it on the floor. It'll get all dirty. Do as I told you. All right. All right. But I only have a hundred or two in my pocket. There's some. And here's some more. I wouldn't try to pick that gun up. Don't you anymore. Hey, don't. Look. Look. My hand. I told you, young man, crime doesn't pay. The easiest thing to do, Stubb, would be to put a bullet through the back of his head and drop him into the lake. Hey, no, no. You can't do that. Hey, let me go, will you? Say, you don't suppose he's that famous gunman they say might be around this section? That John K. Giles? Oh, I doubt it. No. Hey, no. I'm not... Hey, I'm not Giles. I just pull little stuff. All right. I'm going to count to three. If you're still around... One, two, <laughs> streak of lightning. Huh? <laughs> That's the best show I've had in weeks. If he only knew, he tried to hold up the famous John K. Giles himself. Yeah, he ought to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. You know, Barton, the feel of this gun in my hands. Well, thank you. Yeah. The one I've been planning. The bank at Ray, North Dakota. But what's the matter with what we're doing now? Two wealthy fishermen, the bass are biting good. You've got three rich dames here crazy about you. <laughs> There's plenty of women and plenty of bass other places. Start packing up, Barton. This little gun, you and me, we're going to pay a visit to Ray, North Dakota. Yeah, I didn't figure this Ray, North Dakota, would be such a busy place, Charles. You ready? We'll take a little walk into the bank. Okay. Wait a minute. Don't huh? turn around. 
Somebody's walking up and back in. Who is it? Johnson, the chief of police. I checked on the police earlier this morning, and I'm sure. I saw you two men standing here. I was wondering if you wanted anything special. Well, that's nice of you. We're strangers in town. Well, what's on your mind? Well, we heard there was some good bass fishing around. We could find a place to stay. Well, there are a couple of good hotels. Uh, my name is Stubblefield. Uh, this is Mr. Barton. Howdy, hi. I happen to be the chief here, Chief Johnson. Now, uh, there's a good hotel right down the street. Where? Well, you get down there to the third street, and then you take a... We knew who we were all the time. He's not dead. Mm. Now, come on. Beat it to the car. Instead of this bank, I know a couple of other jobs we can pull. Then we'll separate until the heat's off. Hop in. Hey, haven't you got any nerves at all, Carl? Uh, not at a time like this. Well, after we separate, what then? We'll meet again in Nevada. At Reno. Mr. Barton, come on up. I'll be right there. Hmm. Hello? Don't you ever stay in your room? Oh, hello, Mrs. Lawson. I told you to call me Patty. I'm giving a cocktail party this afternoon. You've got to come. Well, I'd love to, but I'm playing golf with Mrs. Ward. Oh, that's a shame. It's getting so the divorcees around here won't go to a cocktail party if you aren't going to be there. <laughs> well, that's very flattering, but <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll see you at the roulette table tonight. You will? Will you drive me home afterwards? Hey, what a swanky choice. Oh, somebody just come in? My butler. Oh, you lucky thing to have a butler. Well, now I'm one of them things. I'll remember. Tonight at the roulette table. Bye, my dear. I'll be there. Don't you dare forget. I won't. Goodbye. So now I'm your butler, huh? Oh, <laughs> sit down, Barton. Yeah, things have been pretty rosy since I saw you last. Yeah? What have you got lined up? About ten divorces for a relaxation. And the gambling casino for us to take over. Hmm. Say, how about a little first question, huh? Champagne? Oh, no, no, no. It gives me a head the next day unless I drink a lot of milk before I go to bed. And milk's making me fat. <laughs> a slug arrived. I got a whole closet full. I just got in the room myself as you called. Get my hands up, Giles. You too, Barton. Well, police popping out a liquor closet? Police popping out a bathroom? Any more under the bed? Cuffs on both of them. Yeah, oh, I I don't get a nice reception I get, Giles. Don't worry, Barton. We'll get a little rest for a few days. And we'll break out of whatever they put us into. Pretty cocky, aren't you, Giles? As cocky as you cops are lucky. No, it wasn't luck, Giles. After you killed Chief Johnson and Ray, North Dakota, you robbed the First National Bank of Genoa. Then you hired a private plane to bring you from Salt Lake City here to Reno. Well, huh. where do we go from here? You're going back to Iowa. You've escaped from every prison you ever put into, Giles. But you ever hear of the specially built Potawatomi prison? Hey, that's quite a name, isn't it? The Potawatomi... Pot... <laughs> oh, never mind. I'll be out of it before I can pronounce it. And so, Commissioner Valentine, cop killer and escape artist John K. Giles is headed for prison. But we've just started our case. Well, Chief Halverson, we certainly want to hear what happened next. Now, back to tonight's gangbusters case of John K. Giles and Commissioner Lewis J. Valentine. Now, Chief Halverson, cop killer John K. Giles was headed for prison. And Commissioner Valentine, Ottawa Prison in Iowa was the last word in prison. 
Giles and Barton were being ushered through the prison corridor. Now, this will be your cell, Giles. And Barton. Quite an iron box, this, isn't it? You're quite an escape artist, Giles. That's why a special cell like this was built for guys like you. You see, it's built on the turntable made of steel. There's only one door to it. The floor is steel. Well, in fact, you might try it out with a hacksaw blade. I would, if we had one. Use the one you have hidden in the heel of your shoe. Oh. Hmm. Well, I guess they've got us this time, Giles. All right. Seeing you know I've got a hacksaw blade, I'll try it just for fun. When you go through a door and have metal on you, it signals. Doesn't bite in, does it, Giles? Quite amusing. Another thing, Giles. All we allow you is bunk blankets, overalls, and his living implements, toothbrushes, paper cups and plates, and wooden spoons. Oh, that's perfectly all right. That's enough for me to escape with. Oh, cut it out, will you, child? Now, if you two will step into your cell. What do you think of it, Giles? Well, personally, but of course, it's just my own opinion. I think it stinks. I tell you, Giles, I can't stand it in this cell. I'd rather rip up this blanket and string myself up. If that's what you want. This is the end. If I'm going to do any killing, it'll be the guard. Not me. Well, okay, okay, but if we kill the guard, how can we get out? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Maybe we can kill the guard and use the uh, Joe, Maybe. shut up that speaker and take it on the earphones while I take this call. Hello? How long before you come home, Walter? Well, I probably won't even be home tonight, dear. Oh, why not? Well, I'm in a little room in the basement under the special cell. We're determined that Giles isn't going to escape. But Giles is a de escape proof cell. He couldn't escape out of that cell. Well, this Giles is superhuman. We're not taking any chances. We've got a microphone hidden in the wall, and one of us stays down here by the speaker every second. Are they still plotting to escape? Giles can think up two new ways every ten minutes. We let them go ahead and then stop them just about as they start something. Walter. Hmm? The baby's got a new tooth. No kidding. That's what I wanted to tell you. Oh, that's well. Uh, I'll call you back, darling. I've got to listen to Giles and Barton. All right, Joe. Put you back. Okay, I see. So killing the guard is out. Maybe somehow we can get into a fight. Be badly hurt. Uh, even then, I don't think they'd let us out of this cell. Oh, I'm going to turn it, Giles. I'm all in. My brain won't work. As if my brain starts to work the best. I don't want to stay cooped up in this cell the rest of my life. All right, go to sleep. Let me do the thinking. Uh, I wish I'd been a Sunday school teacher or something. Uh, good night. What's the matter, Barton? Think you're dreaming? Huh? You all finished? Sure. Say. You done stir crazy, Charles? Why? What's the matter? You thought I was asleep, didn't you? But I've been watching you for an hour, putting water through that little hole in the wall. <laughs> no savvy? What's the gag? The cops have got a microphone in the wall. What? They've been listening for days to every word we've said. How do you know? I sounded the wall. Well, why didn't you tell me? I wouldn't have said some of the things I did. I wanted you to talk just like you didn't know. You were making up all those crackpot ideas to escape. It kept them busy, their minds occupied. Well, I was doing some special thinking to myself. Yeah, but why the water? Can't they hear us now? Water short circuits wires, Barton. That's what I've been pouring it through this little hole in the wall for. They'll think just something has gone wrong with the amplifier. While they're sending for a radio repair man, we'll do our real planning. Have you thought of something? We're going to start out of here in about two minutes. Oh, listen, you wouldn't kid me. You wouldn't kid me. No, that. that. We didn't have anything to work with. But I made something. I chewed up part of a paper plate till it was a pulp. Yeah? Then I chewed up a few cigarette papers. And using that as a plastic, I pushed it into the cell lock here. And I got an impression of the lock. Holy smokes, but what good will that do? Then I used both of our toothbrushes. By rubbing them on the sharp corners of the cell, I shaped them with the right notches and curves. 
And those brush handles will unlock the lock. Oh, you're crazy, Charles. It wouldn't be possible. Then you stay here. I'm leaving. Just outside in the garage is a blue police car. The door of the garage is steel. But if the car hits it hard enough, I think it'll give. I don't know whether I'm awake or dreaming. Here. Here's the toothbrush handle. Let's get started. If you can open that big sun lock with that rig... Ah, oh, it can't be done, Charles. Wait. It's open. Holy smokes, I'm straight. Come on. So you come out of the movies. How'd you like it? Well, not bad. You haven't got a bad little town here. They say that Concord, New Hampshire don't take second place to any town. You know, there's a lot of excitement in town today. Yeah, why? That criminal Giles, you know, in the papers. Yeah? They found the car he'd been driving in town in a parking lot last night. They sent him to the arm. Yeah, okay, bud. Don't, don't move a muscle, Giles. There are four officers who've come up behind you with submachine guns. They'll cut you in two. So that was the store, huh? And I fell for it. Yeah. And we have your pal Cook, too. Remember, boys, this guy killed one chief of police without giving him a chance. Oh. Well, men, welcome to Alcatraz. Giles. Step out. You have a nice sea breeze out here, Dodd. Well, Giles, you're supposed to be an escape artist. But never since Alcatraz was built has a man successfully escaped. Not yet, huh? Not yet. It's two miles to the coast of California. The tide's on eight miles an hour and can't be swum. The prisoners are not allowed to talk to each other. Prisoners are counted every 30 minutes. Oh, you guys here can count, huh? You're assigned to the laundry. Pressing clothes. We're doing the laundry for the army now. And besides, Giles, a cop killer isn't very welcome at Alcatraz. All right, men. Start marching to your assigned place. Stick me in the laundry with this steam pressure. Let me talk to anybody. Hey. They made a mistake by letting me help load the wash into the army boat with a dock. Uh -huh. The guy could get a GI outfit. Pants, shirt, belt, and socks. He might slip on board the boat when it's leaving. Yeah. You can't steal an outfit all at once. You gotta be patient. A year, maybe. Yeah, one thing at a time. Hiding under the dock. And everything must fit me exactly. 
or I'd be noticed when I go on board. Yeah. Alcatraz, Doc, the better I like it. What's the matter, Sergeant? Cold? No, no, I just... Just thought I'd sit down here behind the lifeboat and take a little rest. That's quite a sight, isn't it? Alcatraz fading in the distance. Yeah. I hate that dump. Some of those guys in there are pretty tough babies, huh? Yeah. Yes, a fellow in there has a pretty helpless feeling. See nobody ever escape. Yeah. Not like sitting out here with the wind and the sea. Yeah. This is great. What has just come through? There's some trouble. Yeah? I just came from the radio house. They just made their 30 minute count of Alcatraz, and one of them cards is missing. Holy smokes. A fellow by the name of Giles. He's a cop killer. Hey, wait a minute. You mean. Radio says one of them Alcatraz guys is on our ship? Yeah, a fairly tall guy. Good looking. They're going to start a search. Oh, look, guys. If there's a killer like that on the ship, what'll they do? They're swinging now, see? We're starting to head back to the rock. <laughs> Heading back to the rock? Yeah. What's the matter? You seasick? Yeah, I guess I'll go over the rail. What's the matter with him? Hey, notice how he acted? I don't think he's seasick. Hey, I'll bet you... I don't recognize him. I'll bet you he... Hey, he's starting to climb the rail. That's Giles. Sure, he's going to commit suicide. Come on, let's look at him. Get back. Well, Giles, okay. Okay, you got me. I'm through. I'm washed up. Yeah, washed up. The keeps. I'll go back to the rock. And die there. <laughs> Giles attempted that escape less than two months ago, Commissioner Valentine. July 31st. And I understand, Chief Halverson, that his failure broke him. He's no longer the escape artist. But a, but a broken wreck of a man. Yes, Commissioner. John K. Giles has no more spirit left. You might call him a, a walking dead man behind those massive walls of Alcatraz. Well, Chief Halverson, this has been a terrific case and just proves again that crime cannot pay. For next week, same time, same station, listen to Gangbusters. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement department throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. <coughs> Gangbusters! Saturday, December 22nd, 1945, a crime wave of the most serious proportions is spreading throughout the United States. A serious crime is being committed every 40 seconds and a murder every three hours. And so we present Louis J. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police force in the world, who will interview by proxy the Honorable Fred N. Hauser, district attorney of Los Angeles County, California. Commissioner Valentine. Mr. Hauser, I know that tonight's case is about one of the cruelest killers of the last decade. Commissioner Valentine, the facts of tonight's case are almost unbelievable. During January of last year, such police flashes as the following were cracking out over the California airwaves. Attention, Al Simeone, most dangerous gunman at large today. Epidemic. 
epidemic of vicious holdups along California coast. Simeone cutting with penitentiary. Simeone, burglary, December 4th, 1930. Rearrested, sent to San Quentin, 1933. Assault with deadly weapon. Attempt to commit murder, 1933. Simeone, killer, age 32, 6 feet, 150 pounds, slender build, dark complexion, piercing eyes. This man is fanatically cunning. Approach with caution. Hello, darling. Oh. Oh, Al. Listen, baby, I'm treating you to a late dinner tonight. Well, then I can see you tonight. Yeah. The Flamingo Club for dinner and dancing. Oh. Get a table about 11 tonight. Oh, look, if I'm a little late, order a big dinner for us, huh? Steaks, ice cream. Working late again, darling? Yeah. Al, I'm crazy for you. <laughs> you know me for one week and you're crazy for me. <laughs> you know I am. <laughs> okay, Louise, have a big dinner ordered. I, uh... <clears throat> Like a big dinner after I finish my work. <laughs> hey, this is a nice place you got here. Well, we like all people to be happy and gay in Ash's Cafe. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to gaiety and to life. And to the success of. He got a gun. He got a gun. Yeah. Stranger. Put away that gun. All of you stay right where you are. This is a hold up. <laughs> you the owner. Open the cash register. Well, you're, you're, you're joking. Open the cash register. But but you've been sitting at the bar drinking for an hour. <laughs> you're a friend. You're, you're joking. I'm late for an appointment. Open that cash register. All the money. This is all of it. Turn your back and close the register. Why should I close it? Turn your back and close the register. Hey! If anyone moves, I'll kill them, too. I'm late for a dinner appointment. So long, folks. Okay, Emergency killing at Ash's Bar. Wanton murder of proprietor. Killer, slight of build. Black hair, dressed as fashion plate, has nervous habit of clearing throat. Description fits that of lone gunman Simeone. This killer is fiendishly cunning. Sound a general alarm. This man must be taken dead or alive. Oh, darling, I've ordered the most wonderful dinner for us. La Flamingo is best. <laughs> you, uh, you like that, huh? Steaks, French fries, and broccoli with hollandaise. Only a brunette would know what a man loves to eat. Do you really like brunettes better than blondes, Al? I never look twice except at a brunette. Oh, well, you're terrific. I've only known you a week, but I'd die for you. <laughs> what a charming way to make love. Al, mm. why were you so late coming tonight? What, what business are you in? Well, uh, <clears throat> you laugh. Why? I'm a toy salesman. I sell children's toys. No, why would I laugh at that? That was why I was late tonight. I had to meet a man at the cafe. I could make more money, but the pleasure of knowing when you sell toys, little children will play with them and be happy. Oh, Al, you're so sweet. I didn't know there were men like you. Didn't you? No. But you do make money at it, Al. You always seem to have so much money. And the way I got things planned, baby... I'm going to have lots more. <laughs> this is a hold-up. <laughs> Quiet. It's the blackhead bandit. You've all been hearing a police flashes recently. You know I shoot quick if anyone moves. Well, that strange, a woman tending by him. I am Mrs. Ortega. My husband owns this tavern. I only do it sometimes to help him. Uh, <clears throat> your husband here tonight? Yes, in the back room. Mrs. Ortega was a veteran of World War One. We have a son who's fighting in the Pacific now. That's nice. Somebody turn the radio on. I like to have music. <laughs> Thanks, that's the idea. Now, Mrs. Ortega, open the cash register. I will not do it. My husband and I work hard for our money. Music sounds pretty. 
Now let's have the music at a cash register opening. No. I should. You should the mother of a boy who's fighting for your country. He will hear you and not dare talk to me like this. But he isn't here. Don't you talk to my wife? No. I stand in front of her. Oh, dramatic, son. Oh, you're the one I wanted anyhow. Forget the cash register. Open the safe. I will open it. You can have everything there is. So it's me. Open it. Take it. Scoop it up and give it to me. Put it in this bag. Now you'll turn your back and close the safe. You have everything. Now go and leave us. I said to close the safe. It's all right. My husband, my husband. You got my husband. All patrol cars, murder, Ortega Cafe, 5124 Madison Road. Gunman, slight, black hair, immaculately dressed, shot and killed proprietor Louis Ortega. Investigate at once. Description fits killer Simeone. Squad 4, proceed to section and block off. On the bench. Oh, it's so dark, I didn't see you, Alan. Gee, I've been so scared waiting for you. Yeah. Come on, sit down. What's the matter, honey? No cute little blonde ever ought to be scared. Well, the park's so dark, and you're late. Then all of a sudden, I heard the sirens of police cars. Oh. Yeah, <clears throat> some uh, unscrupulous person probably pulled a hold up. No, I was foolish. Now you're here, I'm not afraid. <laughs> I love blondes. <laughs> No brunettes. I hate brunettes. I'm afraid you'll sweat me off my feet, Al. Five days and you're it. <laughs> Good. I had a little work to do, but I've looked forward all evening to meeting you out here on the park bench. Al, hmm? what do you do for a living? Me? Oh, you'll laugh if I tell you. No, I won't. I'm a salesman for artificial limbs. Limbs? Artificial limbs, legs, arms. I don't know, it it gives me a feeling of worthwhileness, bringing happiness to people who are unfortunate. Oh, Al, you do. I could make more money other ways, but what's money beside the finer things in life? Al, you're wonderful. Well, I don't think I'm so good, but what's my opinion against thousands? <laughs> there goes the police siren again. And are you nervous? Of course not. Not with you here. It's just a police car, probably hunting down some gunmen. Well, I hope they get him, too. Sure, sure, sure. They're probably after that gunman who's been doing a lot of killing in cafes. Oh. Oh, but don't worry, honey. You've got me right here to look after you. i got a lot of plans, baby. And you're in every one of them. Mr. Hauser, I certainly agree with you that Al Simeone was one of the cruelest killers of the past decade. I know you have many more interesting facts to tell us. But first... Now, back to Gangbusters and Commissioner Valentine. With Killer Al Simone. Loose, Mr. Hauser. I know the district attorney's office as well as the police. We're faced with quite a problem. We certainly were, Commissioner, because Simone combined the worst features of a master criminal. He was vicious, tricky, unpredictable. One particular instance should be noted. Another scotch and soda lady up this way. Attention, please. All cafes and restaurants. Quiet, everyone, please. please. All cafes and There's restaurants. a special announcement coming on over the radio. We are breaking in on this program to make a very special announcement. The killer who has been operating in cafes and taverns is still at large. We ask all cafe owners and tavern owners to keep as little cash in their safes as possible. Special plainclothes detectives are covering many California cafes. This killer who has been causing a reign of terror is vicious. Now we will continue with our program. Turn off the radio. It is too depressing. Yeah. There's some music, please. Yeah. You know, if that killer came in here, I'd give him a clip on the jaw and knock him flat. Oh, don't talk that way. No, I would, I would. 
He's probably yelling through and through. It is the man who talks too loud who is the most frightened. Yeah, well, I still say I'd hit him with my fist and knock him out. Yeah. Do not talk so loud, please. The people are laughing at you and they... <laughs> An amusing way I have. You think I'm the braggart. No, I'm him. Up in the cash register. Don't shoot. Don't. I will give you all the money we have. Open it. Yes. Yes, I will open it. I've been watching this place. You have extra money in hand. You would take that money from us so hard, my husband and me work. Don't, don't get him angry, Mama. Let him take all the money and go away. No. We worked for it too hard. Don't make a move, anybody. You, you shot my wife. My wife. Not me. Don't I'll shoot anyone else who tries to stop me. Emergency double shooting. Southgate Cafe. Mrs. Gertrude Nelson in serious condition. Mr. Frank Nelson, her husband, has died. Killer, slight of build, black hair, immaculately dressed, fiendishly cunning. This killer must be caught dead or alive. Special officers are being assigned to all cafe districts. The Miori. <laughs> you look strange, Fingers. The last time I saw you, there were bars in front of you. The same to you. See, you're hot, Simeone. The cops are sending out flashes about you every night. But I'm like the ghost who disappears. I can use your fingers. How'd you get in my room here? How'd you know where I was? I have ways. Uh, mind if I put this bag of eggs down here on the bed? Eggs? Yeah, yeah, I... Uh, <clears throat> I was on my way home. I get hungry sometimes after jobs, so I buy a few eggs and carry them around in this little paper bag. You go nuts. Uh, don't move quick in the bed and break them, Fingers. <laughs> Maybe if I put them under the covers with you, you might hatch them, huh? <laughs> Am I awake or are you a nightmare? Fingers, I've thought up a new racket, and I can use you. Yeah? Yeah, I pull my last hold up of taverns and cafes. I'm going to give the cops a different kind of headache. Look, all over Los Angeles, they have check cashing stations. Yeah, they got banks, too. So what? At all the big industrial plants, they got checkbooks. So? So these big corporations make checks out to the employees. The employees go to any one of a couple of hundred cash windows and cash their checks. Go on. You're getting interesting. There are so many of these places, the cops couldn't possibly cover them all. Yeah. Now, uh, if I had a light-fingered man who could visit a lot of corporations... And Pick up a lot of loose checks. I could forge the checks, go to one of these cashing booths, and, uh, shall we say, cash in? Brother, this ain't no nightmare. It's a dream. So says what? So says you're good. So says you does it, Venice, hmm? What do I get? Ten percent. It's a deal. It's good for a couple of grand a week. Oh, careful. I hope I didn't break those eggs in your little paper bag. Look inside and see. What do you think of my bag of eggs? A gun, 38. What a beaut. <laughs> what a gag. <gang. laughs> yeah. I walk around like a little stuffed shirt with my little paper bag held in front of me. <laughs> if the cops should start trailing me, I drop the little paper bag. It isn't mine. I don't know what's inside, and they can't hold me for carrying concealed weapons. And when you go to a window to cash a check? I'll place my little paper bag on the window, and if there's any trouble, there's the little gun right at my hand. <laughs> You're crazy, Simeone. Crazy. Crazy like a fox. <laughs> I have a hunch, Fingers. This little check cashing racket's gonna have the cops a poppin'. Pardon me. <gasps> Pretend you know me. I'll scream. I'll shout for an officer. I'm an officer. Here's my badge. Oh. This is very confidential. I know who you are. A cashier at the Acme Check Cashing Service. What? Well, yeah. We're contacting you this way so as not to place you in any danger. Shake hands with me. Yeah. Well, that's a picture I'm putting in your hand. A picture of a criminal we're after. If he stops at your cash window, tell him you can't cash his check. But to go to the check cashing window in the terminal building. 
You understand? Yes, sir. That's all you need to know. We didn't want to contact you at your home. Thank you, that's all. Hello? This is the Los Angeles police. Mr. Henry? Why, uh, yes? We're mailing you a picture. Please keep it in the strictest confidence. What do you mean? A picture of a criminal. If this man comes to your check cashing window, tell him you can't cash his check. He'll have to go to the check cashing window in the terminal building. I'll do anything you say, sir. The picture will arrive by mail in the morning. Please keep this in the strictest confidence. Yes, I shall be glad to, sir. Headquarters. Captain, this is Inspector Harwood. Yes, Inspector. There are scores of check cashing windows in Los Angeles. Now, between the district attorney's office and our own department, we've contacted almost every clerk. If this black-haired killer goes to one of these windows to cash any more of those bogus checks, I think there's going to be fireworks. Good work, Inspector. We've laid enough traps, but he's avoided every one. We've got to get him before he murders any more people. And if we can, take him alive. Well, I'm going to cover the terminal building myself, sir. And if he's sent there... Yes, what's your plan? The way the terminal building's built. I'll have to be a hundred feet away from the booth. But I've had my shoes, rubber, soled, and heeled. I think I can make a run and hit him with a flying tackle. He's quick as a cat with a gun. Well, he's going to have to be this time, sir, because I want to keep on living, too. Well, hello. Good morning. I am. <clears throat> I want to cash a check. And uh, don't knock this paper bag of eggs off your window ledge. <laughs> I didn't know eggs were so scarce. You men had to carry them around with you. <laughs> Fresh ones are. I um, have a wage check I want to cash. Well, let me see it. Yeah. So don't you get lonesome sitting in that booth all by yourself? Hmm? Sometime. Then I read it then. Yes. You, uh, work for the oil company? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. $250, eh? I'm a scientist. You are? Mm. A scientist who loves redheads. <laughs> Flatterer. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, I'm afraid you'll have to go down to the terminal building to cash this. Why? Well, uh, we're a little low on funds. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. The terminal building. Uh, there's a cashier's booth there, like this one. Oh, you can't miss it. It's right in the middle of the building. Well, all right. Oh, don't forget your bag of eggs. Uh, you know, I got a weakness for redheads. Have you? Mm. Look, after I get my check cash, suppose I come back and see you. Well, maybe. We could have a lot of fun. All right, I tell you. Um, you cash your check down there and... Uh, if you aren't doing anything afterwards, come back and see me. <laughs> it's a date, Red. You'll be seeing me. Maybe. Operator. Operator. Give me the terminal building, quick. Is this the terminal check cash and window? Yes. I've got a check on that cash. No, certainly. I'll uh, <clears throat> just... Put this bag of eggs up on the shelf here. Oh, don't drop them now. I don't want any scrambled eggs at this window. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this is a paycheck of $250. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. This is your signature? It is. That's nice. You worked there long? Oh, about five years. I'm in a research department. You must like that work. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, can you cash the check? Oh, yes, yes. Let me see now. I've got to get my money out. What identification do you have? Well, I have my cards, and I can show you some of my papers. Oh! oh! Good work, Inspector. Feet out, cold, Captain. What a football tackle. He's a slippery article, Inspector. He had, he had his gun in his bag. I'll get these cuffs on him. Inspector, you've tackled the cruelest killer on the West Coast, and he still doesn't know what struck him. He will, though, by the time the courts get through with him. That's why I wanted him alive, so they could give him what he's got coming to him. Uh, what hit me? What hit me? The law, Simeone. 
the law. Well, Commissioner Valentine, Simeone was convicted of murder. And just three weeks ago today, he was taken into the death room of San Quentin Penitentiary at two minutes past ten in the morning. Eight and a half minutes later, Simeone was pronounced... Dead. 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 Thank you, Mr. Hauser, for telling us the facts in tonight's case. Clever as Simeone was, he wasn't clever enough to beat the combined forces of the law. And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Tonight's Gangbusters case. A special presentation. Inside Facts, dramatized for the first time on the Battle of Alcatraz. Just one week ago, the law-abiding citizens of America, slowly recovering from four long years of war, were shocked to hear of a new battle on a 12-acre island in San Francisco Bay. The Battle of Alcatraz. Alcatraz. So named in 1775 by the Spanish settlers of California, Isla de Alcatraces, the island of the pelicans, a heap of rocks jutting up into the Golden Gate, a mile and a half northeast of San Francisco's famous waterfront district. For nearly 100 years, the island of the pelicans has been a prison, first as disciplinary barracks for military offenders of the United States Army. For the last 13 years... The place of confinement selected by the United States Department of Justice for discipline, segregation, punishment of the most desperate and hopelessly incorrigible criminals. For 280 convicts, the rock is the last stop before hell. Last week, there was trouble on the rock. Five dead, 16 wounded. <laughs> Was the revolt of the nation's most desperate criminal spontaneous? Was it the result of a moment's opportunity? Or was it the result of years of meticulous planning? Four years ago, in the summer of 1942, at another federal penitentiary on McNeil Island in the state of Washington, a veteran convict, a notorious dealer in accurate grapevine information, walked up to a guard who was on duty in the prison kitchen. You better get back to slicing those apples, Tom. Yeah, sure, but... Can I say a word to you, mister? Okay. What is it? Hey, look. I got the dope. You're up for a transfer to Alcatraz. You're going to be a guard on the rock. So what? You're headed for trouble. What gives you that idea? I wouldn't be telling you, except you've been a pretty square guy with us cons. Well, maybe I can do you a favor. Don't take the job on the rock, mister. No? Why not? Don't take it, that's all. It's going to be a big break there. It'll be a long time coming, but when it does, it'll be a regular massacre. A massacre? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. A massacre on the rock? Impossible. Alcatraz is escape-proof. Silence at all times in the cell house. Cell bars of tool-proof alloys. Photoelectric cells that detect even the smallest pin. Machine guns. Concrete walls. A 20-foot cyclone fence topped with barbed wire. Then the water. A mile of treacherous tidal currents, you see. Alcatraz is escape-proof. What makes you think so, bud? Let me tell you something. That con up at McNeil Island has the right dope. 
He ought to get a knife between the ribs for cracking his yet. Shut up, will you? I'm telling this guy something. Okay, okay. You see, this big building is right next to the water. We figure once we get out and take care of the tower guards, we'll have our pick of the boats at the dock. Oh, you're wasting your time. No one escapes from Alcatraz. You couldn't even begin. Wasting our time, huh? We got lots of it to waste. What's time? And where could we begin? Show him the handkerchief. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. See that handkerchief? That little rag. That's what we'll use to crack out of Alcatraz. That's what'll whip your machine guns and the steel bars and the electric eyes. We'll tie a knot in the handkerchief. We'll use it to reach through the bars and pick up a pair of pliers from a workman's kit. Oh, it'll take time, lots of time. But we got plenty of time. And with the pliers, we loosen some plumbing. And when we get ready to use the pipes, we put them all together with the pliers. And we got a nice little gadget that spreads bars like they was paper. Also a nice little gadget to bump some guards over the skull. Okay. So here's how we got it figured. You see, this big cell house has four cell blocks. A, B, C, and D, running the whole length of the building. Now, the only guy with guns is a guard that walks in what they call a gun gallery. And this gun gallery runs across the end of the cell house. It's really a catwalk stuck on the end of the building, but separated from the cell tiers by iron bars. Well, this guard walks back and forth in the gun gallery looking things over. We take care of this guard. We're sitting pretty. Don't forget about the guns. Yeah, yeah. This guard is always carrying a rifle and a sweet little forty-five automatic. Now, Bernie Coy and another con got the job sweeping up the corridors between the cell block and the gun gallery. Once in a while, Coy manages to climb up and give the bars to the gun gallery a little spread so they can squeeze through. And the idea is, get the guns and stick up the floor guards who got no guns. And it's all set. I guess it's around two in the afternoon that they're going to squeeze through and lay for this guard. It was a tight squeeze, Coy. I didn't think you'd make it. I did, didn't I? Boy, if I'd been waiting for this. As soon as the guard passes, I'll grab him, slug him, and I'll grab his guns. Shh, he's coming. Now, hey, slug him, right? I'll get the cell block keys and let you other guys out. You got him? Got the keys? Uh, I got the keys. Uh, get his guns, too. We're going to make it all right. I'll let Tretz and you other guys out. Okay, come on. Shut up, you guys. Shut up. Okay, we'll get the key to the outside door. Tell me how quick the thing's cooked, I say. All right. We counted on this guard having the key to let us outside the cell house. Okay, he didn't. But we got his guns and we got a fighting chance. Well, I ain't giving up. Me neither. Okay. Fine, right, would you? How do we wake it? All right. Make some noise, see, and the other guards will come running. They won't expect nothing. Yeah, one of them ought to have the outside keys. A dozen or more dangerous criminals now have the appetizer to their meal of freedom. They are out of their cells and armed. But without the keys to the outside door, their chances of full freedom are hopeless, and they know it. In the meantime, the four o'clock shift of guards is in a locker room in the same building adjacent to the troubled cell tiers. Changing into their uniforms, about to go on duty... These relief guards who carry no guns have no idea that a score or more desperate convicts are free and armed on the other side of a heavy steel door. Hold it, fellas. Huh? Quiet. Just a minute. Well, what's up, Harry? Shh. Hear that noise through the door? Yeah, from the cell blocks. Yeah. Come on. Let's have a look. All right. Yeah. I'll get the door. Hey, it's quieted down. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Hey, look. This 
Ward's first cell. It's empty. Hey. Hey, watch it. Hey, watch it. They're loose. Oh. Right into the cell. Oh, they got me again. All right, the rest of you. Act dead. Open that cell door, Coy. Okay. See if those guards got the keys. All you guys start searching them. They all look dead. Yeah. Well, search them. If we're getting out, we need those keys. Hey, there's one still kicking. Let me add him. Hey, you. Oh. Give me the keys to the outside. I have no keys. Oh, you haven't. Oh. That's for not having the keys, and this is for nothing. Hey, Kretzer. Yeah? The other guys ain't got no keys either. Huh? Oh, looks like we're cooked, guys. Maybe we better call it quits. Well, what do the rest of you guys say? No, oh, no, 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 Okay, we fight it out. We can't get out one way, we'll take the other, right? Oh, I'm with you, Kretzer. Head up, boy, Thompson. Who else? Help me in. Okay. Let's think this out a little. From the warden, United States Penitentiary, Alcatraz Island, to the United States Navy, Coast Guard, and San Francisco Police Department, serious trouble has broken out. Convicts are armed and at large in the cell house. I have issued a riot call and placed armed guards at strategic locations. Most of our officers are imprisoned in the cell house. 3.18 p.m. To the Commandant, San Francisco Naval Base. Subject, Alcatraz Riot. One, dispatch immediately one company U.S. Marines to assist Warden, United States Penitentiary, Alcatraz Island. Two, assign all available patrol craft to surround and maintain constant vigilance, Alcatraz Island. Signed, Commandant, 12th Naval District. All Thursday night, May 2nd, the traces of the attackers and the ping of bullets of the besieged streak the sky over the Golden Gate. The battle rages without let-up. Residents of San Francisco lined the waterfront to see firsthand what they had heard in the special broadcasts and in the papers. People throng in fascination, for death is the label on each of the bullets which line the sky in blood red. On the Great Golden Gate Bridge, a sailor and his girl edge to the rail. What are those red streaks? Fireworks? Those are the bullets, baby. Tracer bullets. Gee, there are a lot of them. I don't understand it. If they haven't got a chance, what are those convicts fighting for? I don't know, baby. They probably figure they'll get electrocuted or something anyhow, so maybe they'd rather do it this way. I wonder who they are. Not very nice to know. I guarantee you that. You know, I feel kind of sorry for them. Well, anyway, all those tracer bullets and everything, it's pretty. Yes, young lady, very pretty. And who are the men, those prisoners of other men, decent men? Who are those convicts trying to blast their way to a freedom that could mean nothing but more violence and more bloodshed? Those men for whom you feel kind of sorry. Listen. Joseph Paul Kretzer, murder. They also robbed banks, 15 or 16. I forget which. Myra and Edgar Thompson. I killed a cop. Morris Franklin Harbin. Me, I shot a cop too. Kidnapped another one. Bernard Ball Coy. I'm on the rock for robbing a bank. This is my fourth time over. <laughs> Clarence Carnes, murderer, kidnapper. <laughs> Sam Shockley, kidnapper, bank robber, escape artist. <laughs> Those are six of the men. Six of the ringleaders. Six desperate killers. In a moment, you'll learn how they came to be inmates of the Rock. Now, back to gangbusters and tonight's special dramatization of the Battle of Alcatraz. <laughs> The list of 280 Alcatraz convicts recalls murder, bank robbery, kidnapping with each name. High up the list, and the murderer of Alcatraz guard, William H. Miller, stands... Joseph Paul Kretzer, Alcatraz, number 548. Wanted on warrants, 
charging more than a dozen bank robberies, Kretzer and a woman companion sped through the streets of Michigan City, Indiana, on the early morning of June 7th, 1939. Cops. Aren't you going to make a run for us? Me run from the cops? <laughs> I'm not going to let him take you. Watch. Give me that gun. I get it. Here he comes. Let's go, Ben. Right. Do you think you killed him? I don't know, and I don't care. But every cop we meet is going to learn the same thing. Joe Crutcher's one guy, they're never going to stop. The Federal Bureau of Investigation traced Kretzer through acquaintances of this gun mall to an apartment on Chicago's north side and arrested him. He was sent to McNeil Island Penitentiary for 25 years. A year or so later, he escaped, but was recaptured. With his accomplice, Kretzer was in the anteroom of Federal Court in Tacoma, awaiting trial for escape. I'll be here for us in a minute, Kyle. Yeah, Kretzer? Look, I ain't going back to no solitary. Yeah? There'll be two of them. You take one and I'll take the other. Go for the guns. Hey, look, Kretzer, that's suicide. I'm... So not... what? It's better than rotting away the rest of your life. Okay, I'm with you. Shh, shh, shh. They're coming. All right, Kretzer. All right, let's go. Okay, okay, don't rush it. Now, what are you doing? They got no guns. All right, let's go. Right. Kretzer and his companion got only to the end of the corridor. There they were subdued by other federal officers. The United States Marshal, struck down by Kretzer, was killed by a blow to the head. Thus, Joseph Paul Kretzer came to Alcatraz for life, for murder. Bernard Paul Coy, number 415. I'm Coy. I'm a bank robber who didn't like being caught. They sent me to Leavenworth for 25 years. They expected me to sit down and wait those 25 years. I showed those guys I was too tough for Leavenworth. Thus, Bernard Paul Coy came to Alcatraz. Marvin Franklin Hubbard, number 645. I'm Hubbard. I broke out of prison three times in Oklahoma and Idaho. The last time a cop tried to stop us near Chattanooga, Tennessee. Instead of the cop taking us in, we took the cop along. Then we ran into a bunch of cops. I shot one, but they nabbed us. Thus, Marvin Franklin Hubbard came to Alcatraz. Myron Edgar Thompson, number 729. I'm Thompson. I killed a cop, I kidnapped three people, and I broke out of jail eight times. You ever hear of Blanky Thompson? Well, he was a Texas bad man. He was my brother, see? The cops at Amarillo got him. I hate Amarillo cops. Yes, Myron Thompson claimed Blackie Thompson as his brother and swore vengeance on the Amarillo police. About a year ago, shortly after his last jailbreak, Thompson and a companion were driving toward Amarillo. See that curve right ahead there? Yeah, what about it, Thompson? Right there is where my brother Blackie Thompson was killed by the Amarillo cops. Yeah? Yeah. He shot the tires off his car... He jumped out, but the cops mowed him down. Had 30 slugs in him. Laying right there. I hate cops. But I hate Amarillo cops most. And one of them's in for the surprise of his life. Standing by our car, Thompson. He's a cop, all right. An Amarillo cop. Yeah, you just keep going. We'll walk right up to him. Just a moment, you two. Oh, he, 
You speaking to us? You strangers here in Amarillo, aren't you? Oh, I... Sure. Is this your car? Well, we borrowed it from a friend. It's got stolen plates on it. Oh, it has? Turn around. <laughs> I got no gun. We'll see about that. Hey, you see, I, I told you. Yeah. You'll have to go up to headquarters anyway. Answer a few questions. Okay. Anything you say. Headquarters only up about three blocks. Uh, Amarillo seems to be a pretty good little town. Yeah, there's nice folks in this town. This like... is a pistol in your ribs, copper. Where'd you get that gun? I got it, that's all. And I hate Amarillo cops. I got the wheel. Good. I'll sell them out, Cotton. Look, you dumped him right in front of the police station. Hey, I thought he searched you. Yeah, he did. He didn't find that pistol. Go on, give her the gas. Yeah. Well, Amarillo cop kills Blackie. And I kill an Amarillo cop. A short time later, Myra and Edgar Thompson kidnapped a young woman and two servants and transported them across the New Mexico state line where he was apprehended. Thus, Myra and Edgar Thompson came to Alcatraz. Those are the ringleaders, the desperate criminals who control most of the inside of Alcatraz's impregnable cell house, armed with a variety of weapons. Two hundred odd prisoners not participating in the revolt are herded into the prison yard under the guard of the machine guns of the United States Marines. Navy and Coast Guard boats patrol the island. Join the Navy and see the world. Yeah, and look at us. We circle Alcatraz so many times, I'm dizzy already. And you'd think those cons would have better sense. You know, they know they ain't got a chance. Yeah, they remind me of the Japs, in a way. Yeah? Oh, there they go again. Oh, I look at them traces. I take my word for it, I'm glad I'm not up on that rock. I had enough people shooting at me the last four years. Thursday night, 7.35 p.m. Prisoners continue to hold possession. Two guards wounded in attempt to storm stronghold. Friday, 4.35 a.m., special load of fragmentation bombs and other modern warfare equipment arrives in Alcatraz Island from Benesis Arsenal. Guards launch vigorous assault. By mid-morning on Friday, the entrenched convicts are still holding out. The order is given to drill holes in the roof of the cell house over cell block D, built as escape proof, but conversely, proving attack proof. Through the roof, Alcatraz guards and Pacific veterans of the United States Marine Corps drop hand grenades. It's getting pretty hot, boys. Yeah, I told you we shouldn't go through it. Yeah, this is better than the electric chair. You can say that again, Kretzer. Hey, outside the window. Get the feed on him. Good shot. Hey, hey. that grenade was close. So close. The battle continues with varying intensity all Friday night. But Saturday morning dawns quietly over Alcatraz. The lull continues. It is deathly still. Shortly after noon, Saturday, May 4th, it is decided to storm the bastion. Armed guards, some flown in from Leavenworth and McNeil Island. Volunteers from San Quentin approach a steel door. None knows what inferno awaits him on the other side of that steel door. All right. Open it up. All right. When they start shooting, men, jump for cover. Okay. Let's go. Guns ready. There's one. Flop. <laughs> He's not moving. I'll crawl up to him. Yeah. 
It's Kretzer. He's dead. There's two more dead. Hey, guards! We surrender! Closer. We give up! We give up! We give up! We surrender! We surrender! We surrender. Quiet, all of you. All right, march out of here with your hands over your head. And then when you try the trick, you'll get shot. Now, come out. Thus ends the Battle of Alcatraz. Casualties. Five dead. Sixteen seriously wounded. The dead... William H. Miller, guard. Lieutenant Harold P. Stites, guard. Joseph Paul Kretzer, convict. Bernard Paul Coy, convict. Marvin Franklin Hubbard, convict. At least three other convicts face execution on charges of murder. A week later... Alcatraz Island, an establishment of the United States government for the confinement and punishment of the most dangerous criminals, with no attempt at rehabilitation, is quiet. Gang Busters! Gangbusters, brought to you, the men and women of America, by the makers of Sloan's Liniment. With the cooperation of leading law enforcement officials of the United States, Gangbusters presents facts in the relentless war of the police on the underworld. Authentic case histories that show the never-ending activity of the police in their work of protecting our citizens. America's crusade against crime. You, too, can help in our crusade. Here's a last-minute police bulletin. Nationwide alarm. Attention all citizens. Watch for Clifford Davidson, 32, 5 feet 7 inches, 208 pounds, brown hair, blue eyes. This man, veteran criminal and escape artist, broke from jail. We woke Oklahoma last week where he is awaiting trial for murder, allegedly committed following a previous escape from prison. Caution, this man is dangerous. Gangbusters urged you to be on the alert for this criminal. We will have more clues for you at the end of our program. In a moment... We'll be ready for our proxy interview between Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf and prosecuting attorney Stanley Wallach of St. Louis County, Missouri, who will discuss the strange case of the missing corpse in which a dead man convicted his murderer. But first, April showers, they say, bring May flowers, but they also bring the muscular aches and pains that often go with damp and windy weather. Yet there's no need for any member of your family to suffer the discomfort of a stiff neck or sore back just so long as you have that handy bottle of dependable Sloan's liniment on your medicine shelf. Here's Sloan's 1-2 heat treatment that has brought such quick and comforting relief to millions. One, pat on some Sloan's liniment. Two, relax for a few minutes. Then, like a heat treatment, Sloan's glowing warmth goes to work on that tight and painful spot. In almost no time at all, Sloan's will help soothe your pain away. You'll find Sloan's quick action is a welcome friend whatever the cause of your muscular distress, accident, overexertion, or exposure to raw and biting weather. Ask your druggist for Sloan's liniment if you need a fresh supply after the last few wintry months. Sloan's costs so little, and you're so grateful for its soothing help when you want relief in a hurry. Now for our proxy interview between Colonel Schwarzkopf and prosecuting attorney Stanley Wallach of St. Louis County, Missouri. Picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. Colonel Schwarzkopf. The case of the missing corpse. Prosecutor Wallet, that sounds almost like fiction. Tonight's case may appear fantastic, Colonel Schwarzkopf, but it is a matter of public record. This case concerns Elma Dowling and Izzy Londy, two crafty criminals whose viciousness has seldom been matched by any criminals anywhere. We begin in St. Louis one late afternoon in February 1938. 
in the hideout apartment maintained by Alma Dollar. Drink up, Landy. Thanks, darling. I asked you up here to explain what I got in mind for you. What do you mean? I'm considering you as trigger man for my outfit. Trigger man, huh? Yeah. Next thing I consider is what's your experience. I got plenty. I got it all right here on my desk. Here on this case history card. Here's Elandi, known as Monkey Ears. Robberies and other jobs, market prison 10 to 20 years. Shot way out of jail, handy with guns. How'd you find out all that, darling? That's my business, to find things out. And to get things done. Why should I join your mob, huh? Listen, Landy. When I want a man in my mob, he joins. But I've been away for 13 years. I've been out of things. I'll teach you the ropes. Then you'll be a big asset to my protective organization. Protective organization? Yeah. For businessmen and storekeepers. They pay us so much dough per week for protection. <laughs> protection from our own gang. <laughs> but suppose the storekeepers squawk to the cop. They know better than that. It's cheaper to pay up and shut up than to stop a bullet or get crippled for life. Yes. Sounds okay to me, darling. Blondie, before we're through, we'll have every store in the city in our protective organization. They're going to pay us, and they're going to pay plenty. Good morning, mister. You remember me? What are you men back here again for? Hey, listen, mister, this is your last chance. Are you joining our protective organization or anything? No, I'm not. Okay, boys. Got that paint all over the place. Give them the work. Right, right. Okay. No, stop it. Don't, please. No. Yeah, we're going to teach you a lesson, mister. And if you ever blab to the cops, you'll never see your wife or kids again. Go to it, boys. Don't answer that phone, buddy. My business comes first. You got the money for the organization? I tell you, I can't pay you. I'm not taking enough money in my store. You find the Welsh on the organization, huh? And I'll show you. What are you going to do? You know what's in this can? Oh. Pass it. Oh, don't. It's all yours, mister. Right in your oh. face. Oh, boy! That's the dry cleaning store on the corner, Red. The one Dowling wants us to take care of. I got the dynamite already, Laundy. All right, drive by the store and I'll light the fuse and heat it. Hey, Laundy, there's a guy down the block. Don't worry about the guy down the block. I'll light the fuse. There. Step on it, Red. Hey! <laughs> Dynamite was used to blow up that dry cleaning store. More, we can be pretty certain who's back of this outbreak of violence. Racketeers extorting money from businessmen. It's an ugly situation, Captain. We can't get witnesses to testify against these crooks. Yes, crooks like Elmer Dowling. Uh, we've got another bombing on our hands, and still no witness. I'm assigning additional squads of plain clothes on to cover various business places and stores. And... Yes? Captain, there's a man out here by the name of Louis Lee Baker. He wants to see you. What about? He says it's about the bombing of that dry cleaning store tonight. The bombing? Send him right in. Yes, Captain. Right away, sir. Oh, open the door. Yes, sir. Come right in, sir. The captain will see you. Thank you, officer. I do, Captain. My name is Baker. Glad to see you, Mr. Baker. Have a chair. Thank you. You say you know something about this bombing tonight? Well, I don't know if this means anything, Captain, but I thought I ought to report it anyway. Report what, sir? Well, at uh, 10 o'clock, I was walking along Franklin Avenue. Yes. And just as I was about to cross the street, a car came racing down the avenue. What happened? Well, there was an explosion. I, I didn't know then it was a bomb. Later, I got thinking about it, and the bomb and the speeding car. Uh, what kind of a car was it? It was a Chrysler sedan. I didn't see the license number, but I did get a good look at one of the men in the car. Oh, is that so? Uh, he was uh, sort of pasty looking. Had very black eyebrows and big lips. Anything else? Well, the one thing I noticed most of all were his ears. His ears? Yes, sir. Stuck way out. What's that? Well, uh, I never saw a man whose ears stuck out so much. Was he stockly built? Well, yeah, yes, he was. This means something to you, Moore? 
I'm not sure yet, Captain. But I used to know a criminal who fitted that general description to a T. Monkey ears, they called him. If it's the same man, he's a gunman of the worst type. All right. We'll have Mr. Baker go through the identification files. If he can pick out the picture of the same criminal you have in mind, we'll have our first positive identification to help smash this gang. And the picture that Lewis Lee Baker identified, Colonel, was the picture of Monkey Ears, Izzy Lundy. The authorities moved fast and arrested him in a few hours. Who good police work, Prosecutor Wallach. Indicted for this bombing, Lundy posted bail and was released by the courts pending trial. We immediately phoned Dowling. Yeah, Dowling, that's why I'm calling you. That Baker guy's identified me for the bombing of that dry cleaning store. I'll go to jail. Hold it, Lundy. Where are you calling from? From the truth store. I'm afraid to come near you. The cops are on my trail. Yeah, I thought so. Now, let me think. This is serious, Dowling. You've got to help me. Yeah, I know how serious it is. Once the cops throw you in jail, they'll probably get more information that'll lead to me. You? I'm the guy that's in the jam. I don't think of the spot I'm in. Hey, wait a minute. What did you say is the name of the guy who saw the bombing? Baker. Lewis Lee Baker. Baker, eh? Is he the only witness the cops got? Yeah. You sure of that? Positive. Good. What do you mean, good? If something should happen to this witness, the cops wouldn't have no case, would they? That's right, Tony. Well, something is going to happen to him. We're going to find this guy, Baker. And when we do, he won't be a witness. He'll be a corpse. Meanwhile, Colonel, at headquarters, the captain was talking with Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, your identification of Izzy Lombi as the cleaning store bomber is the first good break we've had in our campaign to rid this city of racketeers. I'm glad I'm able to help, Captain. You realize, Mr. Baker, that your life is in constant danger. Yes, sir. That gang will stop at nothing, absolutely nothing, to prevent you from testifying at Londy's trial. So we're going to hide you on a little farm near Sykeston, Missouri. You know where that is? Uh, yes, sir, about 150 miles south of here. Yes. Under no circumstances are you to leave the farm unless accompanied by our men. I understand, Captain. When we want you... Our men will show their credentials and will tell you, the captain wants to see you. Now remember that phrase, the captain wants to see you. Yes, sir. the captain. Mr. Baker was taken to this farm, Colonel, and given ample police protection. Then a startling event occurred. Prosecutor Wallet, we're anxious to hear this startling occurrence, but right now, here's Charles Stark with a few words. Mowing the lawn for the first time after the long winter months is always a chore. The ground is uneven, the grass is tough, and you yourself are probably more than a bit tired and sore when you've finished. That's when you need Sloan's 1-2 heat treatment to bring you quick and comforting relief for muscular aches and pains. Here's all you have to do. One, take your bottle of reliable Sloan's from your medicine shelf and pat on some of this quick-acting liniment. Two, relax. And then, like a heat treatment... Sloan's helps ease those stiff and aching muscles. You can actually feel that penetrating, glowing warmth easing away your pain. Sloan's liniment has helped millions in just this quick and easy way during the past 50 years. And Sloan's will probably do you the same good turn. You'll find Sloan's liniment a true family friend in need. Welcome to the members of your family all through the year. For whatever the cause of your muscular distress, accident, overexertion, or exposure to chilling drafts, you'll find that Sloan's will help you forget your aches and pains in almost no time at all. So make sure you always have a bottle of Sloan's on your medicine shelf. Ask your druggist tomorrow for Sloan's liniment. Now back to Colonel Schwarzkopf. Prosecutor Wallace, with Mr. Baker hidden out on a farm near Sykeston, Missouri, and with Elmer Dowling threatening to kill Baker to prevent his testifying at Izzy Londy's trial, you said a startling event occurred. Baker stayed close to the farm, Colonel Schwarzkopf, awaiting word that the captain wanted to see him. Then, one week later, Baker was standing at the farm entrance when two men drove up and got out of their car. Oh, Baker. Mr. Baker. Uh, yes, sir. You gentlemen want to see me? Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Baker. We're detectives from headquarters. Detectives? See our badges? The captain sent us out. He wants to see you right away about that uh, bombing. The captain wants to see you. Now, if you just get in the car... But uh, I'd like to leave word with the men at the farmhouse where I'm oh, going. We haven't so got that... time for that. This is urgent, Mr. Baker. We don't want to keep the captain waiting. Well, you know best, sir. 
Sit right here in the front seat. Thanks. Right between the two of us. You don't know what the captain wants to see me about, do you? I'm not sure. But I think it has something to do with murder. Gentlemen, we've been driving for an hour. It's getting dark. We're going in the wrong direction. This isn't the way to town. Take on. Yes, sir. We are not going to town. What? The captain was going to meet us at a house with a big man's room. Oh. Why didn't you tell me about this before? We got our order. Here's the place now. Uh, that house looks deserted. There's no light. Don't worry about that, baby. Well, where's the captain's car if he's going to meet us out here? That's where the murder is. How about it, huh? I guess we are. Well, let's go in the house anyway. Yes, sure. Come on, baby. Uh, I'd rather wait here in the car. No, Bacon. We're going inside. Come on, Baker. Orders are orders. All right, I'll, I'll do what two men say. Quiet around here. Ain't it, Baker? Yeah. Maybe I did. Let me take your arm, Baker. Take my arm? Yeah, it's so dark. You may stumble. You're. You sure the captain will be here? Step inside, Bacon. <laughs> so dark in here, I can't see. Turn on your flashlight, pal. Sure. Go on inside, Bacon. Hey. There, there's no one in this house. It's, it's, it's empty. Deserted. That's right, Bacon. That's why we brought you here. So, what do you mean? Just this. <laughs> Get I want to make sure. Now, we got nothing to worry about, Red. Two bullets right through his head. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Darling, do you think anybody could have heard those shots? Nah. No one lives within miles of this place. Let's get in the car and scrap. Hey, Red. Wait a minute. What's the matter? We ought to get rid of that body. Not me. I ain't going back to touch no corpse. Red. Unless you want the same thing Baker got. You better come with me. Okay, John. But I don't like it. Yeah. Qu- quiet around here, ain't it? And dark. Good spot for a job like this. Flash your light. Darling. Look. Say, what the... The coat, the body. It's gone. But it can't be. It was right here on the floor a minute ago. Flash your light around. The room is empty. But he was dead. I killed him. Two bullets right through his head. Then where is he? A dead man can't get up and walk away. I'm getting out of here. Yeah, me too. Ask you to wallet. You mean to say the corpse, the victim's body, was actually gone? Yes, Colonel. By a strange miracle of fate, Lewis Lee Baker had not been killed. Though suffering intense agony... He had managed to crawl out the back door of the deserted house and hide. He saw the two gunmen return and then run off in terror when they found that his supposedly dead body had vanished. So that's why the corpse was missing. What did Mr. Baker do? He dragged himself to the side of the road where some passing workmen found him and rushed him to a hospital. Later that night at the hospital, Baker talked with police officers. That's the whole story, Captain. They shot me twice in my head. Well, I guess I'm too tough to kill. I don't feel I ought to question you any further, Mr. Baker. You need rest. I, I want to tell you all I know. All right, Ma, take this down. Yes, Captain. The, the man who shot me was a big fella, six feet, about 200 pounds. Yes. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Now, take it easy, Mr. Baker. I had a broken nose, no chin. No chin. Big fellow, blonde, blue eyes, broken nose, receding chin. Why, Captain, that description fits the man we arrested on suspicion but couldn't hold. Yes, Elmer Dowling. Captain, you know the man? The man who tried to kill me. Yes, Mr. Baker, and we're going to get him. When you do, I'll be in court to testify. Yes, sure. All right, now relax and get some sleep. Yes, sir. You'll need every bit of strength you've got. Yes, Captain. Come on, boy, we've got work to do. Baker has more courage than a dozen men, Captain. He certainly has more. 
two things I can't understand. How Dowling found Baker at the farm, and why should Dowling want to kill him? Uh, seems you can't hide anything from that gang. They probably followed every move Baker made. But I know why Dowling wanted to kill him. Baker's our only witness against Izzy Londy. If Baker had been killed, Londy would have gone free. Then you think Londy and Dowling are part of the same mob, eh? It points that way. Yes, it does. Laura, I want you to grab Izzy Londy and throw him back in jail immediately. This time he's going to stay in jail till he goes on trial. Right, Captain. Meanwhile, I'll get to work on Dowling. We're going to put the heat on every member of that gang until we get Dowling or they turn him over to us. Within five hours, Colonel, the police had again arrested Izzy Londy, and the search for Dowling was on. Warnings was flashed from coast to coast. Attention, all field agents, Federal Bureau Investigation. Attempt to locate and hold for questioning Elmer Dowling in connection with attempted murder. Dowling is six feet tall. Urgent, police of Eastern Seaboard. Arrest on site Elmer Dowling, fugitive. Dowling weighs 200 pounds. Special notice, West Coast Police. Elmer Dowling reported in California. Wanted for attempted murder. Dowling has blonde hair. Attention, all Missouri police. Be on watch for Elmer Dowling, fugitive gangster, now at large. Dowling, believed to have returned to St. Louis, may be hiding out somewhere in the city. Dowling. Dowling. That's you, Rick. Yeah. Open up. Why'd you come here? Look at this newspaper. It's about Izzy Londy. Sandy, he was sentenced for that bombing today. Got 25 years. 25 years? The guy who sent him to jail was that fellow you tried to kill, Baker. He testified in court against Londy. That was a mistake of my life. Not making sure that guy Baker was dead. Now look what he's done. Has me hounded like a rat. The cops sure are rats here, darling. I can't stand much more of this. Cooped up in four walls, afraid to show my nose outside. Afraid every noise I hear on the stairs is the cops. I'm going nuts. I can't sleep no more. I lie in the bed, hour after hour, just listening and waiting. That's all you can do, darling. If you show up on the streets, the cops will grab you inside of ten minutes. So where's the rest of the gang? Why don't they do something for me? They're hiding out from the cops, same as you. Oh, where's Jaime? You ought to be able to find Jaime. Yeah, he must be with the others. The yellow rat. Just when I need him, they run out of me. If I ever get my hands on him, I'll... Hold it, Red. Don't open that door. I'll wait till I get my gun. That ain't the door, it's the phone. What? Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello, darling. Uh, who's this? Me, Jaime. Oh, Jaime. Well, where have you been? You got no idea how glad I am to hear you. Now, listen, Jaime. I'm on a spot, see? I need dough to beat town. Tell me where Rick can meet you so you can go and... Listen, some... you dumb cluck. Dumb cluck? Why, I'll break you. Now, now, wait a minute. What's the matter? Plenty. Now, what do you mean? The cops got the gang smashed. Half the boys are in jail already. The cops ain't gonna stop till they get you and every one of us. Yeah, well. So there's only one thing for you to do. For me to do? The boys say for you to give up to the cops tonight. What? Are you crazy? You've had your warning, darling. We'll be watching you. Yeah, now wait, Jaime, wait, wait. Now remember, darling, it's the cops or us. Hello. 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 What is it, darling? The gang. They're throwing me over. Put me on the spot. On the spot? Yeah. But how did they know where I was? No one knew where I was, but... What are you looking at me like that? You. You were the only one who knew. You're in with him. No. Darling, put out that gun. Shut up. Uh, hand over your money. Oh, sure. Sure, darling. Here. Here is every, every cent I got. Here. I ain't licked yet. I'll get out of this town. And I'll kill anybody that tries to stop sure, me. Sure, you would. Sure. Now, Red, it's your turn. Don't, don't shoot. Please. Don't. I ain't shooting. I need these bullets for the cops. But here's what you're no, getting up, man. No, 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 no. Hello, headquarters. Listen, Carpenter. You want Elmer Dowling? I know where you'll get him. Who is this? Have a mind who it is. Oh, take this call. Listen right. to me. Go out to the waiting room of the Taylor Avenue car station, and you'll find Dowling if you get there fast enough. Yes. Maury, hung up. What was it, Another tip on Dowling. Get a special squad. We're going out to the Taylor Avenue car station. It may be a false alarm, but we're going to investigate at once. All right, Maul, pull up here. There's the car station. Right, Captain. We'll leave the car here so Dowling won't see it. Follow me, men. Yes, sir. Any special instructions, Captain? If Dowling is in this waiting room, we've got to be careful. He's sure to be armed. 
And I don't want any innocent person hurt. Yes. We'll have our guns ready. I'll uh, no doubt in the second I see it. Here's the waiting room. Be careful now, men. A lot of people in there, Captain. See that big fellow sitting there hiding back at that newspaper? It's Dowling. I wonder if he sees us. He's getting up. Now hold it, men. We don't want any shooting. He's going out the back way. Good. You two men guard this front door. Yes, Captain. Oh, you and I have to run back. Come on, fast. Right, Captain. Ready to shoot, honey? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hold it. There he goes. Back of that house. Oh, you wait here. I'll cut around this side and try to head him off. Up oh, with your hands. Come on. Darling. Oh, I'll kill you if you don't do what I say. I'm using you as a shield. Start walking. All right. Oh, I'll kill you. I dropped that gun, darling. Oh. Okay, let go of my arm. Let me that gun, I said. Are you all right, Captain? Yes, more. I'm all right. But this right isn't. Put the handcuffs on him. There's a man waiting at headquarters to see you, darling. What man? A man you tried to murder. A missing corpse. Helmut Darling was positively identified by Lewis Lee Baker, Colonel, and went on trial for the attempted murder of Mr. Baker on March 4th, 1940. He was convicted and was sentenced to 30 years in the state penitentiary at Jefferson, Missouri. This has been a most interesting case, Prosecutor Walla, and I want to congratulate you on your successful prosecution of Dowling. One of the most impressive features of this case is the fine courage displayed by Mr. Baker, who refused to be intimidated in his efforts to help the police smash this mob. In these days of national stress, America needs citizens who support the law enforcement authorities and who are not afraid to face the gangsters and reveal them as real enemies whom this country must face. Thank you, Prosecutor Wallace, for helping us to prove again that crime does not pay. Now, before we broadcast our nationwide clues, a few words from Charles Stark. I should like to leave you with a reminder. Muscular aches and pains often arrive without warning or invitation. During the summer months to come, when we are all more active... Take the wise precaution of always having a bottle of dependable Sloan's liniment on hand. You'll discover that Sloan's will help you get the quick and comforting relief you want. One, pat on some Sloan's liniment. That's all. Just pat it on. Two, relax. And soon you'll feel that welcome, gentle warmth as it penetrates right to your sore and stiff muscles, easing and soothing the pain. Ask for Sloan's liniment when next you visit your favorite druggist. And now, the clues. Attention, citizens southwest. Look out for man wanted concerning murder. Negro, 33, 5 feet 7 inches, 135 pounds. Black pinky hair, brown eyes, left eye punctured and may be completely out. Three razor slash scars, left arm at shoulder. May wear dark glasses to conceal defective eye. This man wanted connection murder near Muskogee, Oklahoma. <laughs> Caution, citizens New England, New York, New Jersey. Watch for James. Joseph Moran, 39, 5 feet 9 inches, 180 pounds, brown hair turning gray, brown eyes, tattoo initials, J-J-H, right forearm, large ears, eyes slightly crossed. This man, veteran robber who has been operating in New York and New Jersey, wanted by federal authorities for questioning concerning robbery of banks at Suffield, Connecticut. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Tonight's broadcast is the last of the current season for Sloan's Liniment. But we have some glad news. Sloan's will again sponsor gangbusters in the fall. Until then, we wish to thank all of you who have sent us so many splendid letters. And we want to thank the police organizations of the country for cooperating with the producers of gangbusters in proving so conclusively... That crime does not pay. And speaking for Sloan's, a very happy summer to you all until we meet again in the fall. America's crusade against crime. Enforcement departments throughout the United States 
the only national program that brings you authentic police case history. Gangbusters! Tonight, the case of the costume killer, who was an old hand at his trade and a hard master to his apprentices, until he learned the first lesson of society at the hands of skillful detectives. And now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked Chief J.A. Pitcock, who recently retired as Chief of Police, Little Rock, Arkansas, after 31 years of service, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the costume killer. Chief Pitcock, from what you've told me, I know tonight's case is so fantastic, the facts about this criminal are hard to believe. Yes, Don Gardner, but I've got his signed confession to murder right here in my hand. Well, when did you first hear of this man, Chief Pitcock? Well, Don, our reports start not too many months ago in the city of Paragold, Arkansas. A tall, slim man about 40 had been sitting in the front parlor of his rooming house. He'd heard a knock at the door and he was on his way to answer it. All right, all right. Hello, Mr. Oswey. Well, come in, come in, Joy. Don't stand there like a tired old field horse. Yes, sir. Look, Mr. Oswey, don't be sorry at me because I... Don't tell me here. Come on in the parlor. Yeah. Kids, spend your days and nights trying to pound a little something in their pumpkin head so maybe they'll amount to something. Get in there. Yes, sir. Well, what are you going to tell me, boy? Get it out of here. I think he wasn't born with a tongue. I tried, Mr. Oswey. Really honest, I tried. Sit down. Yes, sir. Now, you got to listen to me, boy. For years, I've been showing kids how to do this. Kids, they all think they're smarter than you. Oh, I don't think I'm smarter than you, honest. Uh, well, if you listened close to me and done exactly like I told you, you wouldn't have had no experience like that. I tried, Mr. Oswey. Really. You didn't do it like I told you. You didn't do a thing I told you. Oh, I was awfully scared. That cop came pretty close, awful close. Well, if you'd listened to me and if you'd opened the window like I showed you how to open it, you'd have been in there and out with a stack full of stuff before that cop even got close. Yes, sir, I guess I would, but... But nothing. I got boys all over this city and lots of other cities. I showed them what to do and how to do it. Now, me and you are going back to that store tonight, and me and you are going to come home with a gunny sack full of stuff. Yes, sir. And then after we get that, I'm going to show you a few other things. How to disguise yourself up good so nobody can pick you out. How to pick a lock with just a hairpin. How to break a man's arm with just one twist. Do I have to learn that? Of course you got to learn that, boy. Sometimes you got to hurt people. Sometimes when you don't hurt people, you get hurt yourself. And hurt bad. Did you ever hurt anyone? Only because I had to. Bad? Bad enough. I killed him. Killed him? Uh, only two. Oh. That's what I did my time for. And if I'd killed the third one, I wouldn't done no time at all. But I got soft-hearted. Serves me right. Now, never you get soft-hearted, boy. Oh, no, sir. Now, you listen to me. And I'll tell you how we're going to get in that store tonight. Maybe you ought to use the glass cutter some more. Shh, boy. Sure, I got it. Okay, Joey, I'll give you a boost up. You unlock the window. Yeah. Now grab a hold. Okay. Now, up you go. Okay, now. Reach in, unlock the window. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. A little higher. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I got it. Good boy. Now come on down. If you hadn't did it like this last night, we wouldn't have all this bother tonight. Got your gunny sack? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to boost you in. You know what to take. And when you get it, you meet me back the room. Ain't you coming in with me? There ain't but one way to learn, boy, and that's do it yourself. But Mr. Oster... Don't stand there arguing with me. Now, come here. I'll boost you. It ain't fair. Now, up you go. Oh, oh, gee, that's enough. Now, jump down. Everything all right? Yeah, I think so. Good boy. I'll see you back the room. All right, all right. 
Right, I'm coming. Joey? Yeah, it's me. Just a second. Come in, boy. Yes, sir. Ah, good work, boy. You did fine. You... Where's the gunny sack? Oh, I got it, Mr. Ostry. I left it in the shed. Well, I told you to bring it so I could give you what you got coming. I was gonna, but... But, but what, boy? Speak we... up. There was a cop waiting in front of my house. A cop? It's a good thing I saw him, Mr. Ostry. An awful good thing. You snitch. You... Please, Mr. Ostry, let go. I didn't have anything to do with it. What's he doing there, then? I don't know. Huh? Let me go. <laughs> All right, boy. If this cop's waiting for you, that ain't good. What do we do? Well, I'll tell you, boy. Uh, you go on home and get to bed. But the cop will That get don't me. matter none, boy. You got no record. You get off easy. But I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to. I'll just give you a talking to. With me, it's sight different. I'm on parole. They send me back to prison for life. You wouldn't want that to happen to your old friend, Slim Osry, would you? Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't. Well, now you see why I got to leave town. Anyway, I got some, some of my other boys to look in on. I'll be in touch with you, boy. You'll hear from me. You're a good boy. So, Don, Slim Usry, a parole murderer and tutor in crime, fled to his native town of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where he sought refuge at the home of his sister Etta. But Slim Usry's sojourn in Hattiesburg didn't prove as pleasant as he had hoped. Slim? Slim! Slim! Yeah, what's ailing you now? I asked you to weed the garden. Instead, you sit there all day like you were the landlord waiting for his rent. If you want the garden, weed it, weed it yourself. I ain't budging, Etta. I ain't budging an inch. Honest, Slim, it just ain't right. If I feel like it, Etta, I'll sit here all week. I don't know how many times I have to tell you, Slim. You ought to be out working like other men. Now, look here, Etta. If there was work I felt like doing, I'd be out doing it. There ain't no kind of work around this town I feel like doing. Can't you get that through your head? If you don't work, you're blown back at the penitentiary. Now, look here, Etta. I said the penitentiary. Don't you talk to me like that, Etta. The whole town's talking about you. They all know what you are. I got to bear the shame. Who cares? I could see that you're sent back to jail. You shut up, you oh, old king. No, no. <laughs> Why should I dirty my hands on you? Fine home you give your own brother, always nagging. Don't know when to stop. I guess it was a mistake taking you in. More of a mistake not coming back. I guess you better leave, Slim. I reckon I best. I want you to be packed when I get home. Yeah. What time are you coming back? I won't be back till late tonight. Hey. What? Who's going to fix my supper? Nobody. You're not eating here again. Hey, Edda. You old hen. You ain't sending me back to no penitentiary. You ain't even going to think about sending me back. That, Don, was the moment Slim Usry made up his mind to murder his sister Etta. He knew she would walk home that night, and he waited in the clump of weeds until he heard her footsteps. Etta? <laughs> Howdy, Etta. You have a nice time? Oh, Slim, you scared me. Did I, Etta? What were you doing back in those weeds? Did you did you lose something? No. I'm just fixing to lose something, that's all. What do you mean? Nothing, Edda. Nothing at all. Are you all packed to go? I, I don't want you in my house tonight. I changed my mind, Edda. I'm staying. Who, who said so? I said so, that's who. No, not in my house. No? You, if you don't go tonight, I'm calling the police. You call him, Edda. You call him. Slim, no. No, no, no. Oh, him. Try to send me back to the tension, will you? Oh, you little tweeter brother. You. <clears throat> you old hen. I'll show you. Treat your brother like a little dog. Take care of you. Huh? Deputy Sheriff Clarkson. Deputy Clarkson, this is Slim Osry. Yes, Slim. Uh, it's my sister, Edda, Deputy Clarkson. She she left the house yesterday to go visiting. She didn't come home all night. Where'd she go, Slim? Well, I don't rightly know, Deputy Clarkson. Uh, but you know Edda. That ain't like her. Something must have happened to her now. Would, would you help me find her? All right, Slim. I'll be right over. So, Don, 
The murderer, Slim Usry, reported to the authorities that his sister Etta was missing, although it was Usry himself who killed her. But in carrying out his plan to fool the police, Usry ran into unexpected difficulties. Now, you were telling us, Chief Pitcock, that Slim Usry murdered his sister Etta and then reported her missing. Yes, Don. And an investigation was started. The weeded area of the neighborhood was on the list of places where deputies thought the woman might be found, and the search there was in progress. Deputy Clarkson? Yes, Slim. You don't reckon we'd find Etta in here? If anything happened, Etta, it'd break my heart. I know how you feel, Slim. Let's cut the talking and look. Okay. Uh, Etta. Etta, Slim. Etta. Hold it, man. What's the matter? What's the matter? Did you find something, Slim? Uh, Good Lord. Etta. Come away from us, Slim. Come away. I won't sleep a wink till I get the man did this. I won't sleep a wink. I'm in. Hello, Deputy Clarkson. Slim. They said you wanted to see me. Yes. Come on over and sit down. Sure, Deputy Clarkson. Well... You got any idea who killed my sis? Yes, Slim. I've got a few ideas. Well, you just tell me who it was. I could wring his neck with my two hands. I could... You could what, Slim? Well, you can't blame me none, Deputy Clarkson. Holy letter, never did no harm, no one. Murdered in cold blood like that. You killed two men yourself, Slim. Well, that, that was different. What was so different about it? Well, I paid for it. I spent 19 years put away, and I... You don't think it was me killed Etta? Well, I didn't say you killed her, but you could have. Well, I didn't. What did I be killing my own sis for? I haven't any idea. Well, it's a fine thing. I come down here to help you, and I, I get accused of murder. Just because I've been in a little trouble once or twice, you, you can't let a man have no peace. Not even when they're fixing to bury his poor sister. Hey, Slim. Huh? Come here. What do you want? How come it was you, out of all the people looking for Etta, that found her body? You seem to know just where it was. Well, she just happened to be where I was looking. If I killed her, you don't think I'd be fool enough to find the body, do you? Slim, I don't know what to think. Well, Don, a few months went by and no new evidence turned up. Then one day Slim Musry left town and went to Little Rock, Arkansas. Shortly after he arrived, Usry walked into a costumer's shop on Commerce Street and asked to look at a wig and mustache outfit he saw in the window. Yes, sir. Finest wig and mustache in Little Rock. There you are. Yeah, not bad. That seemed better. I uh, take it you're going to a party? Oh, I figured on a couple of parties. You got a looking glass here? They look good on. Maybe I'll take them. Right in back here, sir? Oh, yeah. The uh, mustache sticks right on. I can see how it works. Very good. Very good indeed. Nobody'd recognize you. Not with that on. How much? Well, now, let's see. Uh, that'd be, uh, oh, $11.80 with the tax. Okay. Shall I wrap them up for you? Sure, wrap them. You don't think I'm going to wear them now, do you? Attention, all squads. Be on alert for bandit who robbed auto rental agency, Six and Scott, of several hundred dollars in cash. This man, described as tall and slender, apparently wore black mustache and wig as disguise. Caution, this man is armed and dangerous. Oh, come on in, Sergeant. What a morning, Captain. I had that witness look at every picture in the file. No luck. 
Not with that wig and mustache disguise. Good disguise. You know, I can't remember anyone using a disguise like that on a holdup in years. This must be an old-timer. Well, the victim thought he was about 40, Captain. It doesn't make him too much of an old-timer. I wonder if he bought that wig and mustache in one of the shops here in Little Rock. Maybe. But they can't tell whether that stuff came from their shop until they see it. And it looks like we'll have to get our man before they can see it. Hello, Mr. Osprey. Huh? Well, Joey. Sit down, boy. Sit down. Thanks, Mr. Osprey. Uh, call me Slim, Joey. People around here know me as Slim. Okay, Slim. I agree that you growed. How about a beer, Joey? Oh, no, thanks. Later, maybe. Well, I uh, came as soon as I got your letter. Yeah. Well, I wrote to you, boy, because I like you. And I want to do something for you. I was sure glad to hear you didn't go to that reformatory. Well, it was like you said. They gave me a talking to and let me go. <laughs> they haven't caught me since. That's yeah, good boy, Joey. I uh, figured when I got your letter, you uh, needed some help. Uh, not just yet, boy. First, you better finish your lessons. Lessons? Well, I could do okay now. I've been doing okay. Well, maybe you could, but we've got to be sure about it. Now, tonight, I'm going to try my old disguise trick again. You recollect I was telling you once about disguises? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, boy, tonight, I got a nice little old cafe all picked out. It'll be so easy, I won't need help from you. I wouldn't need you even if you was ready. So you just stick around my room. What do you have? This hey, got... what? Reach. What's the matter? Everybody quiet. Wait a minute. I'll... Wait for nothing. I'm in a hurry. Where's the dough? I'll get it. I'll get it. Hey. 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 It, it, it was an accident. I don't like accidents. Oh. Oh. I don't anybody move. Oh. I'm gone. Oh. Anybody follow? Get the thing. Get him. Get him. Oh. Oh. Get him. How bad is he, Sergeant? Luckily, not so bad. Both flesh wounds, Captain. This is his room. Okay. Let's go in. Hello, Mr. Walters. How do you feel now? Oh, not... not bad, considering... I'm Captain Crossman. Oh, hello. Mr. Walters... Do you think you could recognize the man who held up your cafe and shot you? I... I, I don't know. Maybe I could. I, I ought to know that mustache anyway. Mm-hmm. Is this the mustache? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I'd swear that's it. It was found in an alley near your cafe. The hold-up man was seen running up that alley. <laughs> that's, that, that's it, all right. Thanks, Mr. Walters. We know where it was bought. Now all we've got to do is find the man who bought it. I'm telling you, Joey, just like I tell all my boys. If you miss doing something one way, no matter how many times it worked, it ain't good no more. Uh, that seems crazy to me. All you gotta do is get another mustache. No, boy, police and everybody else on that mustache and wig trick. I gotta try something else. Yeah, but you promised I could try the mustache trick. I said no, boy. When I say no, I mean it. Maybe we'll pick up and go someplace else and try it. But not here in Little Rock. Oh, it's not slim. And we're just getting set here. Well, I don't know where I'm going to stay or not. They got a big charge again me. I could have killed that man last night. Oh, well, the guy was shot up a little. Serves him right. Maybe I should have killed him. Sure. So, he'd have been number three. Uh-uh, Joey. Number four. Number four? You heard me. You mean you killed somebody since I saw you last? What if I did? You want no account. We're getting back, we gotta change our way of operating. We gotta just Boy, where are you going? I'm uh, going out for some air. Well now watch out where you go and what you do. Just going out to get you a present. Present, boy? For me? Sure. And uh, one for myself. I'll uh, see you later, Slim. This is Sergeant Woods. We've got men planted at that costume store. Nothing doing yet, Captain. Well, keep them there. And at the other stores, too. 
Okay, Captain, but it's pretty much of a shot in the dark. This fellow would be a chump to come back for another mustache. Maybe. But if he does come back, I want a welcoming party for him. Joey? Yeah, Slam, open up. Where have you been, boy? Get in here. I told you I was going out to buy a present. Oh. Is that it there? Uh-huh, that's it. Well, don't stand there, boy. If you're going to give it to me, give it here. <laughs> I got two of them. What is it? Give it here, boy. Ah, uh, not until you promise I can use one. One what? One of these mustache outfits. Wait. Mustache outfits? Uh-huh. Where'd you get it? Hey, let go. Hey, please, let me go, will you? Where'd you get it? At the same store you showed me. Hey, please, let me hurt me. Please. I ought to kill you, boy. I ought to beat your brains out. No, please. You could have brought the cops here. You know that. There were no cops. I look good. Let go, Slim. Huh? No cops? I'm positive. I didn't see anybody. Uh, well, as long as you didn't see no cops, I guess be no cops coming here, huh? Sure. sure. Everything's okay. Yeah. You didn't listen to me, Joey. I kill people who don't pay no attention. I slim. Don't do nothing. Come here, you miserable. No, I go. I didn't mean nothing. Didn't mean nothing, eh? Oh, please. <laughs> Police officers, you're under arrest. Huh? Me? Please, I didn't do nothing. He was trying to kill me. We'll see about that, son. Come on, both of you. Mm. Watch who you're pulling. Come on, you. Okay, kid. Let's go. No, I don't want to go to jail. Come on, boy. It's just another lesson. It should have been the first lesson. It should have been the first. So, Don, that was the end of the teacher of crime. An Usri who thought he had committed a perfect murder made the worst mistake of all. He told someone about it. And the boy, Joey, told the police. In the Little Rock jail, William Usry confessed the murder of his sister, Etta. Usry was returned to Mississippi, where he died in the electric chair in the Forest County Jail a few months ago. Well, congratulations, Chief Pitcock, to you and to the men of the Little Rock Police Department who solved this terrible crime. <laughs> Principal roles in tonight's dramatization were played by Bill Smith and Jack Grimes. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Gangbusters presents Louis J. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police force in the world, who will interview by proxy Lieutenant Tom McGrath, Chicago Police Department, retired. Commissioner Valentine. Lieutenant McGrath, I know Winslow Urban, terrorized the Midwest for years. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. To Winslow Urban, crime was a big business. For other sort thousands, he went after millions. Urban was so cunning and so daring... That on one occasion he was able to rob hundreds of families of their life savings at one blow. And that's tonight's case, Lieutenant McGrath. Where would you like to begin? A few months ago in Chicago, Commissioner, a slender, wiry man named Lou Morgan was keeping an appointment in a large gymnasium where prize fighters exercised and trained. Hi, Joe. Been waiting long? About time you got here, Morgan. Urban's getting impatient. This time he wants everything set and perfect. And no more excuses. Everything's okay now, Joe. I got it all figured like Urban was. You took enough time. He wants a clean job, Joe. It takes time. Okay, okay. Come on. Urban in the back room here? Yeah, he's getting a rough down. Let's go in. Morgan says it's all set, Urban. Hi, Urban. Fill it, Morgan. It works. What are you waiting for? Oh, I don't know some of this rub-down guy. Ah, oh, he's deaf and dumb. Right? I'm not Urban. I'm the front man. I can't take no chances. Just tell me, I tell you. Okay, I say. That's enough rubbing, Mickey. See? He can't hear nothing. Look, I'm a nervous guy, Urban. Okay. Joe, send Mickey out of here. Hey! Hey, Mickey! 
Urban says that's enough rubbing for now. You should come back later. Yeah, later. Okay, Morgan. What's it look like? It's an easy mark. I've been ought to be 200 grand. I told least. you to find out about the burglar alarm. I did, I did. Well? No burglar alarm. How do you know? Well, that's what took me so long. Like I told you before, the place looks like a business office, see? But they got a big vault with a tin door. Some people don't like to keep money in a bank. So they rent safe deposit boxes from this outfit. They got hundreds of bucks. How do you know there ain't no burglar alarm? They got a watchman instead. He lives upstairs over the office. Me and him, pals. I make friends with the guy, see? We take a walk, have a couple of beers, and before you know it, I got the layout of the whole board. The same as if he handed me the blueprints. Yeah, it'll be a cinch. But you could drop a bomb in there. Nobody'd hear it. What about the doctor that has his office in the second floor? He's the only one upstairs besides the watchman. You case the doctor? Sure, even let the doc examine me. You got nothing to worry about him. Goes home every night. Hmm. You gonna do the job, Eden? Yeah. Wait. Friday night. Then I guess I'll blow out of town for the weekend. You want your ten percent? You do a piece of work for it. What do you mean, Evan? Somebody's got to put this watchman on the spot. We don't know him, so you're the one who's going to do it. All right, but I can't. I'm up to my neck now. If I put the finger on that watchman, the cops will hang it on me. Sure. You'll do like I say if you know what's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When's the watchman make his rounds at the vault? Every hour on the nose. Takes him 15 minutes. He carry a time clock? Yeah, he punches at the fire station. What's he do after he makes his rounds? Takes a walk, maybe for 45 minutes, but look at that. You're going to have that watchman in tow. I figure it'll take three hours to open the vault and crack the lock boxes inside. You got to make the watchman's rounds for him and the alarm will go off. I'll take care of that, Urban. Meanwhile, I don't want no nosy cops spotting a Jimmy door. So we go in with the watchman's key. We keep the watchman where he can do no damage. Yeah, yeah. And I see your point, but Friday look... night, you'll take a walk with that watchman at 10.15. When you get to the corner drugstore, go in for cigarettes. Leave the watchman standing on the corner. Me and the boys will handle the details from there on. Just you have the watchman outside that drugstore. <laughs> Say, I hope you didn't mind walking down here by the drugstore. No, no, it suits me as long as we're walking. Okay. You know, walking's why I like being a night watchman. Yeah? Yeah. You can go out for air, you know, between rounds. Yeah. Well, I just want to step in here for a minute. Okay, let's go. Uh, no, no, uh, all I want is cigarettes. Uh, you wait here a minute, huh? I don't want to come to think of it. I need cigarettes myself. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah. Uh, okay, what do you smoke? I'll get them for you. Oh, now, listen, I couldn't let you do that. I'll come on. Oh, what's a pack of cigarettes? Just stay here a minute. I'll bring you some out. <laughs> okay, but... Uh, not me, mister. Uh, we dropped a key on the curb back there. Yeah, we wondered could you hold a match while we look for it. Why, yes, I guess so. I think I got a box of matches someplace here in my pocket. Yeah, it's light, you see. Uh, uh, right here is the spot. Sure. Just a second now, I'll strike a match. Right. Now, Joe. Hold him up. Now, oh, here comes the car. All right, get him in the car, quick. Okay, step on it. Head for the vault. Gold mine. Look at all them rings and things. Oh, come on. We ain't trying to play with a crack this box. What a haul. Am I seeing right? Hundred dollar bills. Yo. Yeah, Urban. Come here. Keep on cracking them boxes. The way until I see what Urban wants. Did you ever see so much dough, Urban? That's going to be the biggest haul anybody ever got. Uh, what time is it, Joe? It's almost one. Time to make another round with a watchman's time clock. Yeah, I'll take care of it. How about the watchman? I just checked him. He won't wake up for hours. When he does, it'll take him a week to untie himself. Perfect, Joe. Perfect. All right, hurry up, you guys. Get them last boxes open. We're getting out in 20 minutes.
Looks like whoever broke into this vault made quite a haul, doesn't it, Sergeant? No telling how much, Captain Rogers. Oh, what a mess. Look at it. Mortgage papers, registered bonds, heirlooms. Everything they couldn't use. Thrown it all over the place. They left this behind. Imagine what they took with them. Uh, any fingerprints, Sergeant? Not a print, Captain Rogers. Did you take that Watson story? Yes, sir. I'm sure he's in the clear. But he's all we've got to work with right now. Somebody cased this job perfectly. Yes, they knew every corner like a book. Right now, it points to the man the watchman took a walk to the drugstore with just before the robbery. What's the watchman have to say about this man? He's given us a pretty accurate description, but it could fit a thousand suspects. All right. But then they're questioning everyone in the neighborhood, side. Maybe someone else noted this finger man. Meantime, we'll get an estimate of the loot. I hate to think of the figure when it gets totaled. Stop playing on rings and things, Joe. I'm trying to add. Boy, oh boy, what I take. How much, Urban? How much? Let me check the figures and let's see. Currency, coins, negotiable bonds, jewelry. Eight, thirteen, twenty-two, thirty, thirty-eight, sixty-four, four. Hmm. How much, Urban? How much? Just a second, wait a minute. There. Take a look. Three hundred grand. Take another look, Joe. Three hundred. Oh, three thousand, thousand. You're kidding. No. That's the total. Three million bucks. Yeah. Three million plus a couple of thousand and all the jewelry. I didn't think there was that much dough in the world. There was in them tin boxes. And we got it. Yeah. Joe. Don't bother. I've been dreaming about spending my cut. That's what I want to talk about. What do you mean? That's already settled. Look, Joe. A three million dollar score makes this dough the hottest stuff in the country. So? So we can't let the boys push it out too freely. No? Well, my idea is everybody takes fifteen grand a piece and we pack the rest away until it cools off. Who packs it away? Who's the boy? You. Then I take care of the money until we split the balance. I know, Evan. I know. You think I'm crazy enough to blow out with all this dough that the boys have cut my head off? And I'd be there with a the sharpest knife. Okay, so it's settled. Each takes 15 grand and I'd back away the rest. It's settled, Urban. But don't forget what I said. About the sharpest knife? Yeah. Three million. Why, that little punk Morgan. He had the right dope. You gotta give him credit. Yeah. Morgan's in for casing his job is 10%. You know what 10% of 3 million is? 300 grand. So what? 300,000 is a lot of dough. More than we expected from the whole job. He earned it. Ah, what business a punk like Morgan got with 300,000? It's dangerous. For him? For us. He tosses that dough around, he gets picked up. The cops make him sing and we cry. You can't spend no 3 million in Jolly yet. So we give him peanuts. We give him nothing, Joe. He's his front man and sooner or later the cops will nab him. When a copper says boo, a punk like Morgan sings. You mean we got to give him the business? Yeah, the business. But make sure it's a clean job. Morgan's out of town now, sitting with his alibi. He'll be back Monday for a split. You and the boys will see that he gets it. Between the eyes. Not 24 hours after Urban robbed the vault commission of Valentine, he was planning to dispose of the weakest member of his gang. Lieutenant McGrath, Winston Urban, had given instructions to his gang to murder Lou Morgan. The man who led Urban to the three million dollar loot. What happened next? Well, Chicago detectives questioned hundreds of people, Commissioner Valentine, to uncover even the smallest lead to the man who cased the vault for the gang. One of those questioned was the doctor who had his office above the vault. Captain Rogers went there to talk. I remember every detail, Doctor. As I said, the night watchman has told us he first met this suspect in the hallway, outside, coming out of your office here. About ten days ago, you say? About then, Doctor. The watchman said he was wearing a plaid shirt and a Wait. pair of... I think I do recall him. Good. Uh, let me look back in my records. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here. February 2nd, J.L. Smith. Well, he'd use a phony name. I'm certain this is the man. You examined him? Thoroughly. He complained of feeling sick. Was he? Well, I could find nothing wrong. Hypochondriac type. Well, tell me, when you were examining him, Doctor, did you notice anything about him? Any peculiar scars or marks? Oh, yes. He did have a tattoo. 
Bathing beauty tattoo. Where? The uh, left forearm. Good. I noticed the tattoo while taking his pulse. Yes. Any other marks, Doctor? Uh, an appendectomy. Good. How about his teeth? Uh, I recall several molars missing. He wore a dental bridge. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks very much. I hope I've been helpful, Captain. Doctor, you don't know how helpful you've been. This was a professional job. The man involved probably had records. And that tattoo, the appendectomy scar, and the missing teeth are distinctive clues. They may lead us to these criminals. Identification Bureau to Captain Rogers. Have checked cross-file system for known criminals with one bathing beauty tattoo, two appendectomy scar, three missing molars, and dental bridge. Results? Seven known criminals answering general description and having those marks. Sending these criminals' records to your office at once. I asked you two gentlemen to come here to police headquarters to look at some pictures. Yes, sir. Uh, doctor, will you please sit on one side of that table and the uh, watchman on the other? Uh, good, Captain. Uh, uh, I have here seven photographs. Doctor, I'm going to hand them to you first. If the man who visited your office is in that group, pick him up. All right, Captain. Uh, here, Captain. Uh, this one. Mm hmm. All right, I'll just make a note of that number. Thank you, Doctor. Now, I'm going to shuffle these same pictures a bit and hand them to the watchman. Yes, sir. Now, sir, see if the man who went walking with you on the night of the robbery is any one of these seven men. Yes, sir. I'll try, Captain. Take your time. It's, uh, it's, it's this one, Captain. I had no M anywhere. I, I swear it is. Yeah, give me that photograph, please. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Number 45682. Lou Morgan. It seems you gentlemen agree. I, I, I knew him. I, I know him in, in a minute. Thank you, gentlemen, for your cooperation. I'll assign the entire robbery and burglary squad to get a line on this Lou Morgan at once. Hello? Evan. Yeah. Lou Morgan. I just got back to town, Evan. Hey, we did good in our deal. Good enough. Hey, it was seven figures. Yeah. So what? An awful big chunk of dough for you, Morgan. I get 10%, don't I? You're going to pay off. Sure, sure, I'm going to pay off. Uh, how about coming around tonight? Boys will be here. Boys? Yeah, we're planning a little party. Party? I don't want no party, Evan. Don't you want what's coming to you? I don't know how you wake up. I'm not doing anything coming around. I said come around here, Morgan, or I'll send the boys after you. No, no, Evan. I don't want a knife in my bag. Leave me be. Leave me be. Open up, Morgan. We know you're inside. Open up, Morgan. Push the door in. Okay. You don't seem to be here. The closet. Keep your gun ready. Okay, Morgan, come out of that closet or we'll shoot through the door. Grab him. No, no, no. Look, I'm, 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 I'm sweet. I'm sweet. Tell him, will you? Tell, tell him to keep the door. I don't want any dough. I don't want any dough. Oh, Look, I don't want to die. Please. I don't want to die. Look, tell him I don't have to roll. I don't want any dough. See? I'll, listen. I'll... Hey. Hey, who are you? Who are you guys? They didn't send you to. You're coppers. Yes, Morgan. We're police officers. What were you saying about Urban? Huh? Urban? Urban? I, I don't know any such guy. No. Well, you've told us what we want to know, Morgan. Take him downtown, Sergeant. I got a piece of bad news for you, Urban. Yeah, what? We went to get Lou Morgan. No? The cops got there first. What? what? Nearly hooked us, too. You gotta move fast, Joe. Round up all the boys. Have them at the hotel at seven. I'll meet you there. We split up the balance of the dough and blow. As soon as Morgan sings, Chicago's not gonna be so healthy. This is Captain Rogers, Sergeant. You get any more out of Morgan? Not yet, Captain, but he'll talk in time. We can't wait, Sergeant. As soon as word of Morgan's arrest spreads, that gang will scatter to the four winds. The loot with them. We'll get Urban, Captain. We'll work day and night until we do. Well, it's important to recover the loot, too, Sergeant. Hundreds of people have lost their life savings. Now, you check every place Urban's been seen. Couldn't carry three million dollars around with him. Must be hidden out someplace. 
Find it. Okay, Irvin, wake up. Come on, oh, come hey, on, wake up. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Hello, Irvin. Joe, I... I... Huh. Hiya, boys. I am. Yeah, I brought the boys along. You took this little room 60 miles out of town. Didn't think we could find you, huh? Look, guys, you got this all wrong. Yeah, you were supposed to show up at the hotel at 7 o'clock three days ago. Instead, you took the dough and skipped. I'm telling you, Joe, you're wrong. I ain't got the dough. Remember, Urban, I said I'd be the guy with the sharpest knife. Cops were getting too close to me. I tried to reach it. Where's the dough, Urban? Same place it always was. Where? Where is it? You get your end in time. We want it now. Where's the dough, Urban? If I tell you, you'll grab the three million and take a walk with my split. Where's the dough, Urban? It's hid good. Hey, what is this? Am I boss of this mob or ain't I? You ain't, Urban. You're just stalling for time, but we want that dough quick. Go to work on it, boys. Make no. them tell us where it is. No. No. No, boys. No. 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 I tell you, Joe, we shouldn't have killed Urban until we got our hands on the dough. He wasn't lying about the dough being up here in this attic by the pipe. Are you sure? After that workout we gave him, Urban wasn't telling no lies to us. Okay, Joe. You're the boss. For now, anyhow. All right, you guys. When we go in the attic, no noise, no lights. The dough's in a tin box under the floor by a pipe. Uh, now, I don't want myself cut to pieces and dumped in a ditch like Irvin. So we split the dough right here. Okay? Okay. Open the door. Quiet now. That's the corner over there. That crowbar ready? Yeah. Shut the floor. Sorry, Joe. Try up the floor, boys. Easy now. <laughs> you see it yet, Joe? Not yet. It's here, though. We shouldn't have knocked her been off. Yep. What did I tell you? Here it is. Help me get the box out. Okay, okay. What? I said no lights. Who turned them lights on? Nobody turned them on. Who turned them on? Put your hands up, everybody. Coppers. Keep them up. You're cut. All right, Sergeant. Start putting the cuffs on them. All right, Captain. What's this all about? We found Winchell Urban's body in a ditch near Kankakee a few hours ago. So what? And Morgan told us about this house. One of the many places Urban used. When you headed here, it was quite obvious where the loot was hidden. You walked right into our trap. That Morgan, he'll get what's coming to him between the ribs. Uh, you won't be the ones to give it to him. You've got your red-handed. You're going up for a long, long time. Lieutenant McGrath, tonight's case is an outstanding example of efficient police work. What happened to Urban's gang? All seven of them, Commissioner Valentine, are now serving terms ranging up to life imprisonment. Congratulations, Lieutenant, to the Chicago Police. Even though this vicious gang staged one of the biggest robberies in criminal records, their loot did them no good, and all they got for their trouble was death or long sentences in prison. Gangbusters is a Philip H. Lord production. And now, Gangbusters! <laughs> Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable Saul S. Sherrison, Assistant United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, to narrate tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the kidnapped paymaster. Mr. Sherrison, before you begin, I think the gangbusters audience would like to know that you brought to the studio 
a man who played a very important part in tonight's case. That's right, Don Gardner. He's right over there, and we'll hear from him later. Right now, I think we ought to get on with the report. All right, Mr. Sharrison. The main events in this case occurred right here in New York City. Isn't that right? In the section of New York City known as the Bronx. Almost a year ago, Don, on a Saturday afternoon, the stores in the Fordham Road District were crowded with shoppers. At one particular shoe store, a young woman customer was trying to get fitted while her companion sat next to her. The trouble clerk was on his way with still another pair of shoes to show his hard-to-please customer. Just look what he's bringing over this time. For crying out loud, Terry, you're going to buy a pair of shoes, or aren't you? If I see something that's chic, yeah. Uh, here, madam, is a style that's very smart. Pumps, I asked you for. Do these look like pumps? Well, as I told you, madam, pumps have gone out. They're not wearing pumps this year. If the lady wants pumps, get her pumps. Yeah, get me pumps. Well, I'll take one more look. Excuse me, please. I'll be right back. How do you like the nerve of him, huh? Well, you're not exactly the easiest one in the world to please. If I want pumps, Mac, I want pumps. That's the price you've got to pay for keeping me slaving away in that shop. Look, Terry, I don't want to hear no more about it. You stay on the job there until the time is right. And when's the time going to be right? Meanwhile, I'm breaking my back running a drill press at 40 bucks a week. Who needs it? You'll keep running that drill press until I'm set. I need another guy or two. Hmm. Who are you looking for, Dillinger? Shut up. Ain't four months long enough to find somebody? I wish you'd get your shoes and get out of here. Well, let me take my time, Mac. I'm the one that's got to wear them and I... Oh. Well, how do you like that? What? Right. Here comes that Charlie McCarthy of yours. Bud, where? He's coming. He'd find you in Times Square on New Year's Eve. Hiya, Terry. Mac, I said you went shopping. Did you come to carry the bundles? What do you want, Bud? I had to see you, boss. I'm in a little jam. A cop or a dame? Lay off, will you, Terry? What kind of a jam? Where's that monkey with the pumps? I need about 300 bucks quick. 300 bucks? Well, 280 to be exact. <sighs> Must be a dame. For crying out loud, why? I owe it to a guy. Stall him. You can give him to him after we pull off the big deal. Mac, I gotta pay him off tonight. If I don't pay him, I get my head beat in. Who's got this dough coming anyway? Johnny J. Johnny J? Yeah. Don't you have no more sense than to borrow dough from a rotten loan shark? I needed it. The horse is out at Belmont. We're hungry. So what? How much did you borrow? Two bills. What's the 80 for? That's interest. Interest? Only 5% a week. Hey, you idiot. Where do you have to meet that cigar smoking chiseler? Oh, it's some bar. Tonight. Okay, he'll be met by the two of us. Where's that guy with my pumps? You don't need any shoes. Let's get out of here. Hey, wait a Come minute. Come on, let's get out of this joint before I run you out in your bare feet. Okay, okay, but why get sore at me? I didn't borrow no dough from Johnny J. Let's go, I said. Let's go. I'm coming. Don't rush me. Hello, Johnny. How was up at the bar? Told you this booth. Sit down. Got a match? Yeah, someplace. Yeah. Thanks. Well, give my dough, I'll buy you a drink. Look, Johnny, I haven't got it. That's what I want. You want to get paid, you rotten welcher. Wait a minute, Johnny. Wait, nothing. Told you what had happened. Ever see a guy get his face burnt with a lit cigar? He'll get you dough. I bet, and tonight. There's a guy here. Has he got the dough? Yeah. He's got it. Oh, and you say so. Let's go get him. We don't have to. Here he comes. Oh, Johnny. How long's it been? That's the guy? That's him. So now, Mac. Well, you come taking care of the kids' troubles, McIntyre. I look after my boys. Okay, bud, scram. Hey, wait a minute. If I don't get my dough, I want his hide. Get out of here, bud. Go on. Yeah, so long. I'll be safe. Hey, wait a minute. Come in. Sit still, Johnny. He only listens to me. You got a lot of nerve, Mac. One more thing, Johnny. You can stay, but that cigar's got to go. Oh, yeah? Give me a match. I said put the cigar away or I'll shove it down your throat. Well, as long as you ain't got no match. How much did the kid take from you? Comes to 280. I didn't ask, but it comes to what did he take? Got 200. But I'm entitled to my interest. Here's your 200. And now look, Mac, I'm in business. I got it. You've got to nothing. You don't want the 200? Give it back. 20, 40. It's all there, Johnny. Put it in your pocket. Yeah, I guess it is. What do you have to drink? Nothing. I'll see you again sometime. 
Hey, Mac. What? Don't get the wrong idea about me. I'm still as tough as I used to be. Be as tough as you like? I'm a three-time loser, Mac. Once more, they put me away for good. I don't want that. But remember, I can only be pushed so far. Johnny, have you got any idea why I laid out two bills to get this bird out of soak? Didn't think it was out of the goodness of your heart. He's got a trick, Johnny. He can take the door lock right off a car without leaving a scratch. So, what do you want me to give him, a medal? We take it to a guy, and an hour later, we got a key that fits the ignition and the door. Sweet. Awful sweet. But it takes too many cars to build up a nice score. I want it quicker. And I'm going to get it quicker. Huh? Johnny, I got a deal in the works that I'll have to have a bushel basket to carry away the dough. Yeah, that thought a book at me this time, Mac. Told you I was a three-time loser. I'm not interested in anything except staying out in the street. This will be a soft as frozen custard. Worth it? Can you count up to a hundred thousand? I tried hard enough. Want to hear about it? Can't put me back in for listening. This is a big foundry over in Jersey. I planted my girl in there. The payroll runs fifty to a hundred grand every week. They pay off in cash. Payroll's got guts, Mac. They get a yard of more guts, they got. Look, I've had my girl in that shop for four months. I know that place inside and out. Thursday nights, the payroll lays in the safe with nobody around but an old creepy watchman. What about the safe? I don't think that'd be so creepy. That's where the gimmick comes in. The paymaster lives right here in the Bronx. We grab him at his house, take him back to Jersey. He opens up the safe. That's all there is to it. It's going to take a lot of doing. For a lot of dough, I can stand a lot of doing. Okay, Mac, figure me in it. Didn't you uh, ask me for a match before? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Go ahead. Light up that big black cigar. I love him. Thanks. Hey, waiter. Waiter. Another round of drinks here. Make it snappy. So, Don, <clears throat> the criminal Na David McIntyre had completed his organization, which he intended to use in robbing the payroll. He had everything worked out nicely except a few details, like a set of stolen tires and an unexpected doorbell. It was such clues as these that set the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the right trail. But in the meantime, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was looking into the interstate car thefts in which McIntyre and young Bud Aldridge were previously involved. These cars were being stolen in Bronx and Westchester counties, New York, then taken to Connecticut and New Jersey, where the accessories were stripped and sold. Special agents Haynes and Martin were at the New York field office discussing the case. Well, Haynes, looks like those car thieves are going to be harder to catch than ever now. They just quit. At least while they were operating, we had a chance to get them with the goods. Uh, I don't know. I don't think they have pulled out of it permanently, Martin. Maybe they got something else to do for a few days. Maybe they took a vacation. Well, they've sure been doing well enough to take a vacation. You'd think after all this time we'd at least be able to get a line on them. We'll get our line on them. All we have to do is keep checking those junk shops and second-hand parts places. We'll find where they're selling the stuff. That's all the line we need. Well, I'd better get going. Jersey City? Yeah. I'm going to do a little hunting. Maybe I can turn up something over there. He's going to pull into that parking space down the block, Mac. Okay, double park right here. I'll keep your lights on. Yeah, Mac, sure. All well set, Johnny. You kidding? Let's go. When you see his car pull out, bud, get right behind us and stay there. I know, I know. Come on. Right with you. On the sidewalk, let's go. Good break, good break. Nobody's out tonight. Let's do it fast and quiet. Never seen a faster guy. Here he comes on your toes, huh? Step here. Pardon me, mister. Yes? Got a match? Yes, I think so. Those cigars of his keep going out. He runs himself and everybody else out of matches. Oh, some cigars are like that. Keep your hands at your sides and don't move. Hey. Uh, walk back to your car. Listen, here you... Walk, he said. Okay, okay, but be careful with that gun. Reach in your pocket and give me the keys to your car. All right. Well, what do you want from me? I don't carry much money. Just give me the car keys. Yeah. Here they are. Here, pal, open up. Get 
right in, Siegel. Get... Where are you taking me? Where do you think? Get in. Oh, please. Go on, get in. In back, in back. Okay, in back. Climb it back with him, pal. Right. I don't understand all this. What do you want from me? Explain it to him, pal. You're going back to your office. You're going to open that safe and you're going to hand over tomorrow's payroll. Just like that. But I don't know the combination. Now tell me what you know. But I don't, honest. Kid's right behind us, boss. Okay. I told you I don't know the combination. Listen, friend. See this cigar? You know how hot it gets when it's lit? I don't know how many thousands of degrees hot. Please let me out. Anyway, it gets awful hot. You open that safe or you got the end of the cigar right in your eye. Let me out. I want to get out, please. Shut him up. I can't open the safe. Shut up. I can't. Okay, wise guy. <laughs> Stay shut. Don't knock him out. Not yet. I want him sitting up when we cross the bridge. Okay, okay. No sense getting those cops at the toll gate suspicious. Keep him up and keep him quiet. We'll give him a treatment later if we have to. So, Don... The two criminals and their victim, Mr. Julius Siegel, drove towards the George Washington toll bridge, across the Hudson River in Siegel's car, with the third criminal, Bud Aldridge, following in their own car. Within a few minutes, they were on the approaches to the bridge and nearing the toll gate. All right, Siegel, sit up straight. I will, but don't hit me again. Now we're going to stop at that toll gate. We're going to pay the guy, and you're going to keep your mouth shut. You got it? Don't worry, I won't say anything. You better not if you don't want the cigar. Remember. On your toes, pal, a toll gate. Here you are. Fifty cents, right? Fifty cents. Hey, the motor died. I know it. She won't kick over. I should say. I will, I will. What's the matter, Master? You got trouble? Yeah, officer. She won't kick over. Maybe you're out of gas. No, there's plenty of gas, officer. It'll be all right. You'll have to get it out of here. Those cars want to get through. I'll uh, give it another try. She's catching. Feed it gas. Let's go. Well, I would have figured one like that. Well, there's a trick to starting it sometime. Oh, ask to... you. <laughs> Take it easy with her. Gotta open that safe. Okay, okay. I'm only playing. Kid still behind me? Yeah, he's following us. Don't worry, go ahead. Get that a plan. I want to see what a payroll looks like. Special Agent Haynes. This is Martin. I'm glad I caught you at the office. Yes, I had to finish up something. What's up, Martin? I found a fence over here in Jersey City, Haynes. I think he's the one who's been buying the accessories of those stolen Bronx and Westchester cars. Oh? Uh-huh. What does he have to say? Nothing. That's the point. We found two radios and three sets of tires. He says he bought them in good faith. Says he doesn't know the fellows who sold them. Well, what's the name of this fence? Denver. Joe Denver. He's got a long record for receiving, never a conviction. All right. How about bring him into New York? I'd like to talk to him. Right. We'll be there in an hour. Oh, and say, Haynes, will you call up my wife? Tell her I won't be home tonight. But I'm telling you, I don't know the combination. Did you hear him, boss? He says he don't know the combination. I heard him. We know different. We know you open that safe every morning and close it every night. That's not true, honest. It is. That ain't true, huh? Hey, boss, give me a match. Why don't you carry your own matches? I'm driving. Catch. Thanks. Make it snappy. The plant's in the next block. What are you going to do? Hey, I'm going to light my cigar, that's all. Just light my cigar. Good cigar, ain't it? I wouldn't know. <coughs> Told you how hot they get. Now you gonna open that safe? Uh, uh, I... You wouldn't like it in the eye, would you? Okay. I'll open the safe. Now you're acting smart. What do you care? It's not your dough, wise guy. Okay, hold on. We're turning in. There's a kid right behind us. Good. Now sit up, Siegel. Feel like we tell you, you won't get hurt. Bad. All right. I'll do anything. Come on, let's go. Okay, Siegel, move. Go on, get out. All right, I'm going. Here's the kit. All right, Siegel. 
Walked right up to the office door, just like it worked here. Which he does, which he does. Get going. Yeah, I thought you were goners on the bridge. Shut up and do your job. All right, I'll get excited. Here's your key, Siegel. You open up the front door. But, but what? Move, John, move. going to open up that front door of the office and walk right to the safe, you understand? But if I open the door, the burglar alarm will ring. What's this, another store like the combination? No, I'm telling the truth, the burglar alarm will ring. You're lying, Siegel. There's no alarm in that door, I know. Listen, do you think we ought to take the chance? There's no alarm in that door. He just wants to wise up the watchman. Let me tell you something, Siegel. I know this place inside and out. I know how we'll handle that watchman once we're inside. Now open up the door. A look. It's a cigar, it's a cigar. Okay. Quick now. Holy, the joint's fucked. He was right. Get him in the car, fast. Come on, get to the car. Get to the car. All right, all right, I'm going. You're going to let me out here? Are you, please? Yes, yeah, Siegel, we're going to let you out. See what he's got on him. You want to get something out of this job? I'll still there, you. All right, I don't have much. Is his wallet. What's in it? Five, six, six bucks. Yeah. All this trouble for six bucks. <laughs> six bucks. Okay, he's out. Uh, take your gun and shoot him once through the head. Shoot him? I was looking for the chair. How can they tag us for it if he's dead? I'll tell you how. There's some people with big mouths, that's how. Who are you talking about? Not you. Who can tell about the kid or even the dame? Yeah, who can tell? All right, just work them over good. I want a head start in the cops. I'll work them over good. Don't worry. Ever see a guy get pistol whipped? Gun's good for more than one thing. Dirty rotten. He won't wake up for a week. Burglar a lot. Now, I just sent Joe Denver back to the detention cell, Haynes. We'll file charges in the morning, huh? First thing. You know, Martin, I've never seen it fail. When these guys think you got something on them, they'll sing their heads off looking for a break. Uh, what a business. Well, it's not such a bad business. Joe Denver sings, we clear up a string of auto thefts. Uh, not so fast. We still got to pick up McIntyre and this young sidekick of his. Well, the information says they're probably still living at that address in the Bronx and running with this Johnny J. They oughtn't to be so hard to trace from there. Uh, we'll see about that. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Hello, Special Agent Haynes. Uh, Haynes, this Crawford over at the Richfield, New Jersey Police. Oh, yes, Crawford. How are you? We've got the victim of a robbery up here. Oh? Uh-huh. They held him up in front of his home in the Bronx and brought him over here to Jersey to open up the safe. That's kidnapping. Yeah, they carried him over the state line. That makes it your beef, doesn't it? It sure does. The Lindbergh Law. What have you got to go on, Crawford? Well, the victim, um, Siegel, got the license number of their car, but that's not going to be much help. It was stolen last week in Westchester County. Westchester, well... Tie in with anything? It could. We're working on a Westchester case right now. Stone cars. Uh, Where is this victim? He's still here at our station. Doctor says he can go home after he rests up a bit. Well, keep him there a while. We'll be right over. Okay, I'll be looking for you. So long. Hmm. What is it, Haynes? Come on, Martin. We're going over to Jersey. I'll tell you all about it on the way. I'm ready. Oh, uh, you don't happen to have a picture of McIntyre on you, do you? Yes, I do. Good. Let's go. Six lousy bucks. I spent four months slaving at that drill press for six rotten bucks. I'm sick of hearing about it, Terry. If you found out about that burglar alarm, everything had been fine. So just shut that big yap of yours. What am I supposed to know about burglar alarms? And watch out what you're calling a big yap. Dad. Uh, oh, Bud. No. Oh, kid brains himself. Come on in, Bud. Better pick up them cars and then we better move them back. It's a long drive. I see the small time stuff's good enough for you now. If you ask me, it was always good enough. You're looking for a crack in the head, Terry. Yeah, from who? Let's go, Bud. Sure, I've been ready an hour. If you think I'm going back to work on that drill press, you've got another thing coming. Who's asking you to go back? Do what you like. Six bucks. Six lousy bucks. Come here, Terry. Why? Come here, I said. I want to kiss you goodbye. No, stop it. Now get your guts packed and get out of here. Come on, buddy. Cheer up, will you, Mac? Ah, let me along, will you? All right, so we got a bad break. 
Didn't work out right. Now, we know we should stick to this hot car, Rex. Listen, bud, I'll tell you what to stick to. Just watch where you're driving. You got a red light. I see it, I see it. We got a good thing. There's a million dames like Terry. A million. For crying out of sewer. Shut up. All right, I just... Hey, look at that car. That crazy driver's gonna clip us. Oh. That driver's the kind of... Hey, Mac. What? Maybe it's cops. That's what cops. Well, let's give a piece of our mind. All right, if you say so. Hey, what's the matter? Don't you guys know how to drive? All right, get him up, you two. Huh? FBI. Not me, you know it. You better just keeping your hands up. What's the idea? We ain't done nothing. We've got a warrant charging you with kidnapping. Kidnapping? Yes, you should always stop to think at a state line. Come on. Your friend Johnny Jay's been keeping a cell warm for you. He wants company. Okay, okay, I'm going. You don't have to push. That, Don, was how the arrest was made. David McIntyre and Johnny Jay were sentenced to 20 years each, and Bud Aldridge was given six years. They are now serving their terms at various federal penitentiaries for abducting Mr. Julius Siegel and carrying him across a state line. Well, Mr. Siegel certainly had a rough time of it. You know, Don, that for every crime, there must be a victim as well as a criminal. And I brought Mr. Siegel to the studio tonight. Well, so I see, Mr. Sherrison. He had an experience that any one of us may be called on to face any day. Well, we're glad to have you on, gangbusters, Mr. Siegel. I'm glad to be here, Don, but I must say that in all my years of listening to gangbusters, I never dreamed that one day I'd be a part of your program. And a very important part, too. I suppose that all of us think of crimes like kidnapping in terms of someone else. It must have been some sensation when you realized that this time you were the victim. <clears throat> well, Don, from the first I knew those boys meant business. But it wasn't until they were ready to leave me on, to leave me later on, that I started saying my final prayers. Well, just what happened? Well, when they got ready to go, one yelled to the other, kill him and dump him. But then he came back to me and said, we decided not to kill you. We're going to knock you out. And that's when they really gave you a going over? That's right, Don. But to tell you the truth, the beating wasn't nearly as bad as the mental torture. At first, I thought it was just another stick-up. But when my face hit the floor of the car, well, it seemed as though a million things flashed through my mind. Well, just what kind of things do you mean? Well, maybe this, these thugs had gotten to my wife and children. Also, even if they hadn't, I thought I'd never live to see them again. And then there was that one voice that kept yelling, if he opens his mouth, kill him. I can still hear it to this day. Well, that certainly must have been a grueling experience. Believe me, Don, it was. All I can say is, it's great to be alive. Well, thank you, Mr. Julius Siegel. And you, Mr. Saul S. Sharrison, for coming here tonight and being our guests on Gangbusters. <laughs> Leading roles were played by Ken Lynch and Joe Julian. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. And now, Gangbusters! <laughs> Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. <laughs> and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable John J. Sullivan, former chief of detectives and deputy police commissioner, city of New York, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the supersonic safe crackers. Chief Sullivan... I know the criminals in tonight's case certainly presented a problem to detectives of the New York City Police Department. A tremendous problem, Don Gardner. But they gave the investigating detectives an idea of what their successors may have to face in the future. Well, it sounds like you've got an interesting case, Chief Sullivan. Why don't you go right ahead? All right, Don. On the west side of New York, a little uptown from Times Square, there was a cheap restaurant, a chili parlor, in the basement of an old brownstone house. Miguel, the Mexican proprietor, on occasion prepared his peppery native dishes for special customers. One such customer was Russ Enfield, 
who, on a particular night about a year and a half ago, sat at a corner table with his girl, Myra, as Miguel took up their order. you some nice enchiladas, which we follow up with some nice cheese tacos, see? Fine, fine. That's the stuff, Miguel. Can't you make something simple, like ham and eggs? Ham and eggs? This is poison, ham and eggs. Go on, Miguel. Go on, go on. Whip the stuff up. Whip the stuff up? Well, this cannot be whipped up like, like, like ham and eggs. Ross. Now, look, Myra, it's all settled. You got enough clothes. You can't have it. You know. Hey, you know what I need. Yeah, I know what you need. Now, let's forget about it. Russ, I swear I'm not going to stand for this pushing around. There's certain things a girl's entitled to. If you don't keep quiet about it, I'll give you what you're entitled to. Now, don't let's start it. Uh-oh. Comes Jonesy and the guy. Ray. Where's this turtleneck sweater? All right, all right. Now, keep quiet. Well, here we are, Russ. Hello, Jonesy. Do you look sweet tonight? Yeah. Oh, I just got a head. Okay, okay. You're preble, huh? That's right. Uh, Joe Preble, Russ Come on, Jonesy. Right. Let's go over to the bar and have a drink. Is it okay, Russ? Sure, sure. Go ahead. I want to talk to Preble. Take care of my enchiladas. Yeah, I'll see. They don't get cold. Come on, Mary. Those enchiladas couldn't get cold inside. There he is. Have a chair, Preble. Thanks. You're a kid. She's just like the rest of them. No, Preble? Sounds okay to me, Russ. The way Jonesy explained it. Jonesy's not the best explainer in the world. Have any questions? What kind of questions? Safe cracking is safe cracking. With a few improvements, yeah. For instance, you don't have to carry that gun anymore. Who told you I'm carrying a gun? Nobody told me. I just found out now. You carry it in the shoulder holster under your left arm. Right? Now, whose mind you've been reading? I haven't been reading any mind. Just a dial on uh, this little gimmick. It's a funny-looking watch. What is it, anyway? Well, just a little gimmick I picked up. They used them in the war. Metal detector. Oh, cute. Cute as it come. But how does it open a safe? Might come in handy, just like everything we use. The walkie-talkies, the supersonic stuff, everything. You gotta show me that it beats the old way. You've been on ice too long, Preble. You got a sing-sing complex. Hmm. Now, remember what I tell you about the gadgets we work with. The scientific stuff can only go so far. Can't even go that far without a little head work. Okay, just lay it out. Now, hold it, hold it. Senor Ross, you would like the tortillas plain or toasted? A toasted, I think. Yeah, anything, Miguel. We'll just get it out here. I see, toasted. A toasted would be more better tonight because it's yesterday's tortilla. He should drown in a barrel of tequila. Well, Preble, you think you could come along and do what I tell you without giving me any argument? Look, I've been knocking the knobs off safes 15 years now. I can use your experience, but my methods are a little different. What do you come to be such an expert in this science stuff? The Navy, pal. The Navy taught me the works before they gave me the bounce. Oh, another blue ticket, boy. Yeah. After a hitch in Portsmouth Naval Prison, I've got my hands on every electronic device in the book, and I know how to run them. Hmm. I can open up any tin can of a vault in this town without straining a muscle. I'll show you what I mean. Now, you heard there was fortunes being made out of government surplus. The surplus anybody can get, Preble, it still takes a guy to run it. Mm, here comes Agua Caliente with your grub. Good. Yeah, let's see. All right, it's very hot stuff, senor. If you don't put your fingers Well, you think you could crack this safe the old-fashioned way, Preble? I might, I might. Come on, come on, Russ. How long does it take to get that junk rigged up? Here, plug this in the wall sock. There. The old-fashioned way ain't good enough. Now you gotta crack a safe with gadgets. Think of the combination, problem. Yeah, now you're talking. Okay, hold it. One tumbler dropped. It did not. I didn't hear it drop. I got the best ears in the business. It dropped, I tell you. The gadget told me it did. No kidding. 
We'll run the dial back the other way. Hey, easy. Yes. Hey, what's that? Shut up. What is it, Jonesy? Keep the light lower, Russ. I got a glimmer of her from the window just now. Right. Keep that light lower, Colonel. Uh, any radio cars around, Jonesy? Not a sign of one, Russ. How you doing? Okay, but we won't get it open if I talk to you all night. You just stay in the car. Keep your eyes out for cops. Okay. Hey, that's all right. The walkie-talkie's okay. I know it. Well, go on, get to work in that combination. Sure. Want to grab that dough and get out of here. Five feet, eight and a quarter. 31, 160 pounds. Investigation of homicide. Look, Captain Hanson, I hate to break in on the line like this. The sergeant, what's up? Just hit a call from the 32nd Squad. They got into the vault of the finance company office at 124th and Lexington last night. Got away with over 3,000. Does it look like the same boy, Sergeant? No telling. Come on, let's get up there. All right. Ryan from Identification is on the way up there now. Dust the place over for prints. Good. Walk off the way you came on. Go ahead, Sergeant. Yeah. The uh, car is parked outside, Captain. We can... Oh, Sergeant. Yes, sir? You say they fingered this safe open? That's what the 32nd Squad says. Oh. One of those boys must have awfully tender fingers. Probably took them all night manipulating that combination, just like they'd one last week, Captain. They could have blown the door off in an hour. I don't know, Sergeant. Maybe these boys have a way. A way? What do you mean, a way? Oh, we'll see. Let's get up there and look that ball over. Hey, Russ, I... Oh, hello, Jonesy. Oh, hi, Myra. Uh, Russ around? Sure, he's in there sleeping. He's got a night job, remember? Mm. I guess I'll come back later. What's your rush, Hanson? You can wait, and you don't have to wait standing up. Okay. Thanks, Myra. Not over there. Sit down here. Over there? Okay, if you don't mind. <sighs> Jonesy. Huh? Yeah, ma'am? Remember at the bar last night I was telling you about that dress? Yeah, yeah. Sounds nice. You couldn't let me have another 200, could you? Well... I know I owe you so much already, but you'll get it back every cent. Well, it's not the dough, ma'am. You've got the 200, haven't you? Sure, I, I got it, but... But what? Look, I, I told you before, Russ wouldn't like me giving you money. You know he oh, wouldn't. Oh, you don't have to be afraid of Russ. I wouldn't tell him anything about you and me. I'd like to get that dress today, Jonesy. Okay. You can have your 200. Ah, oh, <laughs> Jonesy. I knew you wouldn't let me down. I just knew it. Myra, you, you belong to Russ now. Russ is a good-looking guy. He can talk and... And What? Skip it. You got the papers around any place? Maybe they got something in about the job. Oh, no, don't. Don't you think? Oh. Hello, Jonesy. All right. Hi, Russ. Well, what's on your mind, Jonesy? Oh, uh, nothing important, Russ. I just want to tell you eight, eight o'clock is okay with Preble. He'll meet us at the chili parlor. Eight o'clock's fine. Oh, good. Uh, did he say anything about last night's job? <laughs> did he? He's really sold on this scientific stuff. Really sold. I, uh, think I'd better run along. But you hurry. Why? Well, I've got something to do. You got some coffee brewing, John. No, thanks. Uh, see you tonight at the chili parlor. So long, John. Bye. Well, did you have a nice nap? Lay off, Jonesy, will you, Myra? What are you talking about? If anybody can see the guy goes for you like a ton of bricks. You've been taking dough off him again. So what? You won't give it to me. I'm entitled to go look. Look all you want, baby, but just stay away from my boys. Want them to keep their mind on business. What do you think you are giving me orders? I'll show you who I think I am. Now stop playing with Jonesy. I'll start on you, and I won't be playing. Kevin Hanson talking. Hello, Captain. Sergeant Keel. Look, I'm with the chief engineer of the Euclid Safe Manufacturing. Well, what does he have to say? Nobody, he says. Nobody could open that new safe of theirs without blowing the door off. Did you tell him he was wrong? Did I? 
and I showed him the pictures, too. He still says that new model safe combination has silent tumblers and nobody can hear them drop. He says it looks like an inside job, and I'm about ready to believe him. Is there any way at all to open that safe without the combination? Yeah, just a minute, I'll ask him. Is there any way to open that safe without the combination? The captain wants to know. Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, he says they tested it, Captain, and the only way it could be done was you could hear the tumblers drop if you had a supersonic listening device. Uh huh. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, Captain. But what kind of a burglar carries a supersonic, whatever you call it? I don't know, Sergeant, but come on back to the office. We'll see if we can find out. So, Don, as the gang of criminals led by Russ Enfield prepared to extend their scientific safe-cracking venture still farther, New York City detectives had obtained their first inkling to their method of operation. It was the beginning of a long trail that didn't end until the threat of death lurked on both sides of a skyscraper skylight. Now, back to gangbusters. You were telling us, Chief. Sullivan, that the uh, criminal Russ Enfield led his gang in a number of successful safe crackings by using such modern instruments as supersonic listing devices and walkie-talkie apparatus to warn of approaching trouble. That's right, John. And New York City detectives had an idea of what was going on and were proceeding with their investigation. One night shortly before starting on a safe burglar they had planned, Russ Enfield had just finished dinner with his confederates and the girl Myra at the chili parlor the gang patronized. Listen, Russ, boss or no boss, this is the last time I go for this Mexican food. It can kill you. Yeah, it's like olives. you got to learn to like this stuff. And you will if you got a stomach left. Oh, what's the matter with Mexican food? I like it. Okay, Jonesy, it's getting late. Drive Myra home, will you? Yeah, Russ, right sure. Yeah, I thought you were taking me on this one. A dame's place is home. Who asked you? On home, will you? Come on, Myra. Now hurry back here, Jonesy. Pebble and I will have the whole thing gone over. Oh, yeah. uh, have a good time, boys. Let's go, Jonesy. You sure. To Lou. Yeah, I'll see you later, Jonesy. Yeah. I, uh, got the car parked right outside, Myra. That's sweet of you, Jonesy. Look, Myra, I want to talk to you. Now, about... wait, wait, wait. Where do we get outside? Okay. I'll get the door. Hey, buenas noches. Night, Miguel. Mm. Got warmer. Yeah. Where's the car? It's right there. Look, my right. Yeah. Your new dress looks nice on. Uh, does it? Glad you like it. Oh, wait a minute, my right. When is the payoff going to be? Jonesy, I told you you'd get back every cent. Eight hundred, isn't it? When a guy gives dough to a dame, she means something to him. Uh... Oh, Jonesy, you mean something to me, too, but I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared of Russ. Well, I'm not scared. Come here. Oh, Jonesy, please. <laughs> Myra. Jonesy, if Russ ever thought... Oh, kids, you're having a good time... Yeah, Russ. An awful good time. What's the idea? No, wait a minute, Russ. Don't get thinking anything. We Shut don't... up. Come on, Russ. If you want to argue about it, I'm willing to argue. You think I ought to get socked? Try it. You're not going to get hit, Jonesy. Not you. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait, nothing, Myra. I told you to cut this out. Russ, no, don't shut You me. had not have done that, Russ. She had it coming. Did I? I said you had not have done that, Russ. Come on, Myra. Grab a cab and get home. I'll take her home. You do what I tell you. Come on, Myra. Start walking. Don't you ever lay a hand on me again. You didn't have to hit her, Russ. You listen to me, Jonesy. Myra's no dame for you. If you want a girl, go get somebody else. Ain't that up to Myra? It's up to me. I came out to tell you to pick up an extra 20-foot extension cord for that job tonight. I get it before we start something that we can't finish. Yeah. An extra 20-foot extension cord. Well, get going. We haven't got all night. Don't worry about Myra. I'll take care of her. Get this straight, Commander. You say these are all the types of supersonic listening devices that are Navy equipment? That's right, Captain Hanson. There are two or three other types, later developments, but they're still secret. They all look pretty bulky. Except this one portable job. The Army had some types of their own, you know. Yes, I know. I checked with the Army. Uh. That wasn't sensitive enough to enable a man using it to hear the tumblers and the safe combination drop. 
I've heard of instances where it was used during the war by the OSS and intelligence on certain missions in occupied territory, and quite successfully, too. I don't suppose these devices have too many industrial uses. No, Captain, not too many. Wouldn't be too difficult to trace all sales of them through the War Assets Administration. Well, when I leave here, Commander, that's exactly where I'm going. Come on, Myra, come on, open up this door. Open up or I'll push it in. You all right? Gotta be bothered by... Boy, what do you want? What are you packing for? Where are you going? I decided a long time ago. No guy's going to slug me in and have me sit around to take his abuse. You sit around as long as I want you around. Hand me that pair of shoes. They go in too. Listen to me. <laughs> you hang that stuff back in the closet or I'll give you going over. You'll never forget. Don't you have something to say about that? I told you to stay away from Jonesy. Right, you stop. You'll do what I tell you. <laughs> You'll stay away from Jonesy. Get that through that head of yours. Now go on, hang that stuff up. All right. Put it that way. Yes, sir. Step right in. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I understand you handle a lot of war surplus. He understands I handle a lot of war surplus. Mister, this store handles so much war surplus, I'm thinking of starting my own army. <laughs> What would you like? We got pup tents, jeep tents, barrack tents, sailor suits, soldier suits, diver suits. Uh, Oh, okay, okay. Have you got any portable supersonic listening devices? We got any portable supersonic listening devices? Sure, we got them. Right this way. Thanks. Telling you we got a portable supersonic listening device the likes of which you've never seen. And they've been going like hotcakes, too. Everybody wants one, everyone. Uh Yeah? Sure. We run them in, run them out by the carload. Hey, take a look at this little number. My name is Sergeant Keel. Safe and loft, squad. Oh. Well, you don't say. It's a sergeant, huh? That's right. How many of these things did you buy from the War Assets Administration? Let me see. Ten, I think. They came with a job lot of other merchandise. Ten, yeah, ten. And they've been going like hotcakes? Well, not exactly. I sold one. One. Do you remember who bought it? Do I remember who bought it? I never forget a customer. Maybe sometimes I can't remember the face, but I never forget a customer. We got a record someplace. Uh, I'm going back and see what I can find out. Now, if you want to look around some of our fine merchandise for your own use, go ahead. Don't touch nothing over there. No, thanks. I think I'll just go in back and help you look. And then he hit you again. Huh? Yeah. But that's not the worst part of it, Jonesy. Like now, I can't even go to the beauty parlor without an escort. I'd like to help you, Myra, but what's the use? Nothing in it for me. You just run back to Russ. I hate him, Jones. You don't know how much I hate him. Then what are you sticking with him for? I'm scared. I'm scared to death he'll kill me. Jonesy. Hmm? There is a way. A way for what? For you and me. I thought you were scared of Russ. I suppose there was no Russ to be scared of. Now, wait a minute. Listen to me, Chauncey. That's safe tonight. There ought to be twelve, fifteen thousand in it. So? You and I could do a lot with fifteen thousand, Chauncey. An awful lot. Yeah, maybe we could. Russ told me he's taking both of you and Preble up into the place with him. I'm going to stay in the car. What about Preble? He don't mean nothing to you, does he? Not much, no. Okay, then. Okay, what? When the safe gets open and you've got the money, that's the time. Both of them, I I don't know. Well, you don't have to, you know, if you can do without me. Well, now, look, Myra. But if you don't kill him, Jonesy, we'll never get a chance, you and me. Never. Think of it. Fifteen thousand. Yeah, Myra. Yeah, I want that chance. Captain Hanson. Oh, Captain. Sergeant Keel. Oh, yes, Sergeant. How'd you make out? Uh, looks like this Russ Enfield's the guy, Captain. Got a pair of hoodlums for sidekicks. One of them is Joe Preble. Just finished 7 to 12 in Sing Sing. Good. I want them tailed, Sergeant. I want the man tailing each one of them every minute. Let's get him in the act of committing one of these safe burglaries. 
How about it, Sergeant? Been able to raise the captain? They're ringing him now. Captain Sergeant Keel, Captain. Talking from a call box on the corner of 93rd and 2nd. Russ Enfield and both his sidekicks just now broke into a building here. Oh, what about the girl? She's waiting in a car. And look, Captain, there's a finance company on the top floor of that building. That's probably what they're after. They got help on the way? Yes, sir, plenty. Okay, grab them as they come out. Right, sir. And I'm on my way. I'll be there as soon as I can. So long. Captain's on his way, Riley. Good, good. Now, look, that office is on the top floor. As I remember, most of these buildings around here have got skylights. Want to go up and have a look? Yeah, the watchman at that loft next door will let us up and we can cut over his room. Okay. We'll tell Gordon to get the men posted as soon as they get here. Let's go. Come on, Jonesy. We've been here long enough. Come on, let's get packed up and going. Hubble? I'm set. You know, Russ, I wouldn't be surprised if that adds up to 15 grand. Yeah, we'll see what it adds up to when we count it. Now, come on, get that stuff together. Russ. What? Myra told me you hit her again. What business that of yours? It's my business, all right. Is it? I told you, you hadn't ought to go around hitting people, especially Myra. Oh, forget it. Get that stuff together. Sorry, Russ, but Myra said okay. you... Don't no, move, Russ. Well, what's the idea? You too, Preble. Up, up. Yeah. Put that gun up your throat before I... Get... Okay. Hey. Hey. All right, hands up. Both. Okay, don't shoot. Drop that gun. Okay, don't shoot. Yeah, yeah. Not me, you don't get. Stop, you hog. Not me, you don't right. get. Oh, Hey, not me, you rotten... No, Russ. Right. Oh, no. Right, now, look, Hopper, look. Just take it easy. We got him, Sergeant. All right. There wasn't any sense running, Russ. All right. I got yourself killed. Scientific mind like yours had a reason we'd have every exit covered. Okay, turn around and walk back to the safe. We want to look that job over. That dawn was how Russ Enfield and his gang learned that not even a clever application of up-to-date scientific instruments can beat the law. They were all sentenced to long terms, which they are now serving in various New York State penitentiaries. Well, I was amazed, Chief Sullivan, that such equipment as supersonic listening devices could be purchased by burglars. Well, they can't anymore, Don. Because of requests by law enforcement officials and for other reasons, the sale of supersonic equipment was frozen by the War Assets Administration several months ago. Well, thank you, Chief Sullivan, for this extraordinary case history. And congratulations to all the New York City detectives who had a hand in breaking up this dangerous gang of safe burglars. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, CBS Radio presents... Gangbusters! Gangbusters! The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories has asked the Honorable Edward L. Dowd, First Assistant Circuit Attorney of St. Louis, Missouri, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Circuit Attorney Dowd. Thank you, and good evening, gangbusters listeners. Let's begin tonight's case on a cold winter morning a year or so ago in the city of St. Louis, Missouri. The proprietress of a small, unkempt confectionery store on South Broadway had just opened the place for the day's business and was tidying up the tiny soda fountain. Still no. Crying out loud. You think it was a fortune? You could stake a guy to a couple of hundred. Why? Now, oh, Annabelle, be reasonable. I'm good for it. You know I'm good for it. Why does a guy in your position need to come looking for handouts? You know where to get it. Why don't you go out and make it? The heat's on, Annabelle. A town is hotter than a two-dollar pistol shooting blanks. Don't blame me. I didn't make the heat. These guys have really been burning up the town. Remember that clothing store man? Yeah. Them. That was them. Of course, I'm not saying it was their fault the guy got shot. Somebody comes in and heist the place. A reasonable thing to do is give him the money. He fought them, so what does he get? A nice funeral. 
And the hotel clerk, I hear that was them, too. So you can see why all the heat is on, Annabelle. So I, I figure to get out for a while. I'll take a ride to Casey and take things easy for a couple of weeks. I should give you the 200 have to come looking for you in Kansas City. You won't have to come looking for me, Annabelle. I'm good for it. You know I'm good for it. Then go borrow from a bank. Listen to me, Annabelle. Heart to heart. A guy with a little heat on him can't even walk in the streets in comfort anymore. The first thing he knows, he's downtown with the law nagging the life out of him. You can't work under these conditions. My heart is bleeding for you. This mob has been burning up the town with one blast after another, and the pressure is coming down on the cops from all over. It's a risk to stick your head on the street while this mob is still operating. What mob? Who are they? How should I know who are they? I thought you knew everything, Wally. I never heard of them. What do you say, Annabelle? No is no. Well, I'm a redhead, the papers say. You know of any redheaded heavy men around town? No. Annabelle. I got an idea, Wally. Have a chocolate malted on the house. No, no, thanks. Much obliged. My chocolate malteds aren't good enough for you, but you'll take my 200. I ain't even had breakfast yet. What's wrong with a chocolate malted for breakfast? Annabelle, please. No. We've been friends for years. I know. I want to keep it that way. If I give you the 200, that's the end of our friendship. Come in, come in. Yeah, I'm in already. Will it be, mister? Cup of coffee. Hello, Wally. Red, how are you? We don't have coffee. How about a nice cherry phosphate? Nah, never mind. A malted? No, I skip it. What are you doing around here, Red? Yeah, seeing the sights. Yeah? How about a hot chocolate? That I can make you. Nah, forget it. How you been, Wally? Busy? No, not too. Uh-huh. I was uh, told I could find you around here, Wally. He's around here too much. I've got to do something with my time. Are you uh, looking to make a connection? That depends. You like milk? I give you plain milk. I want coffee. You want coffee, you have to go elsewhere. Red, it's a good deal. Yeah, it's been good so far. Come on, let's go get that coffee someplace. We'll talk about it, huh? It's in a restaurant I'm running. We carried what everybody asked for. I'd have a million dollars worth of stock. It's all right. I'm not to put out now. Well, go if you're going. Got plenty to clean up around. Come on, Wally. Uh, I'll see you, Annabelle. Yeah, don't do me any favors. No, 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 Sergeant Rickard, robbery squad. Now hold on, please. I'll connect you. Robbery squad. Sergeant Rickard. Here's Annabelle. Yes, Annabelle. You were looking to get a line on a redhead? Yeah, so? Maybe I just saw the one. What's his name? Red. His name is Red. Uh, that's not much help. This friend of mine was in the store crying about the heat around town because of all these heistings. Then this Red walks in. And Wally are sidekicks from way back, I think. He wants to know if Wally would like to make a connection. Well, what did Wally say? He didn't say. They left together to talk it over. For where? Now, should I know for where? Did I follow him? Okay, Annabelle, thanks. Keep your ears open now. In the meanwhile, we do some checking around. <laughs> Sugar, will you want it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. All right, tell me. What's the deal? Wait a minute. Take it easy, I'll tell you. First, I want to know, is there any heat on you? Heat on me? Yeah. You guys get all the heat in this town. You're running wild and the lid is on everybody. Are you still a good man at the wheel you used to be, Wally? Yeah, I'm all right. Downtown, for instance. Can you wheel a car in there and get it out? Yeah. What's a touch? Jewelry house. Just jewelry? There'll be some cash involved, enough. But plenty of ice. I don't like a jewelry deal. You break your back to get the scum and you can't turn it over for 20 cents on a dollar. Well, that shouldn't make any difference if there's enough of it. No, I guess it shouldn't. And it's only a three-handed job. Oh? Yeah, that's all. A fair-sized score split up only three ways wouldn't be bad, huh? 
What happened to the other two in the mob? What other two? Papers have been saying you were forehanded altogether. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, Wally, we were forehanded, but uh, two of the boys pulled out. Yeah? Why? They thought there was too much heat for the fireworks. They started to cry, so uh, Mac gave them the kiss off. Who's Mac? You wouldn't know him. They've been his jobs. What kind of guy is he? After this one, I'll have had enough myself. Cowboy? No, not exactly. He ain't wild. He's got a head on his shoulders. Maybe that's his trouble, too much head. He thinks he's a mastermind. I don't like that kind of deal. Every hand should have a say-so. Not with Mac, they don't. Who does this guy think he is? I don't know him. I don't know what he can do. Don't get so independent. You told me you were behind the six. You can't get dough by being independent. All right. I'll talk to him anyway. I'm talking to you for him. Are you in, aren't you? Okay, Red, I'm in. Good. Come on, let's go see this car. Take it easy, will you? Give me a chance to drink my coffee. Besides, we can't meet him till tonight. So, Matty, after making an appointment... He's a late sleeper. All right. Go ahead, drink your coffee. Wait out here, Johnny. Yeah, sure, Rick. I won't be but a few minutes. I'll see you. Sergeant. Now, oh, what'll it be? Oh, small lemon lime. Small lemon lime to a sergeant. Where does this Wally live, Annabelle? I don't know. He never said. We've been checking around. We got no address for him in the cards. Don't cry to me, Sergeant. That's your job to keep track of these heats, not mine. You got no idea at all? No, no idea at all. And when you see him again, try to fish it out of him, huh? Fish it out of him yourself. Here he comes. Hi there, Annabelle. The answer's still no, Wally. Forget I even mentioned it, Annabelle. Hi there. How are you? What'd you do? Get it from that red-headed friend of yours? In a way, yeah. Got some telephone change, Annabelle? Yep, sure. He looks familiar, that redhead. I think maybe I know him from someplace. There you are. Maybe you do. He's been around. Excuse me, I gotta make a call. Who's stopping you? See what I mean about the redhead? Yeah, I see. You gonna pick Wally up? A few days in jail might do him some good. Maybe it'd help his color. Maybe it would. How much for the lemon lime, Annabelle? Still a nickel. No inflation around here. There you are. Thank you. Call again. Let me know what you hear, Annabelle. I'm all ears. Okay, I'll see you now. Hurry back, mister. Johnny? Hey, Rick. Wasn't that Wally that went in the store? Yeah. Did he make you? No, I don't think so. He remembers me from someplace. Probably thinks I'm a steady hanger around Annabelle's. He went to use the phone. What are we going to do when he comes out? Call him? No, there's nothing we could hold him on yet. We don't even know if this redhead is one of the outfit. I wouldn't make any bets he wasn't. I want to see that redhead before we make a move. If he's right, I want to grab him good. What hey, Rick, do we... he's coming out. Okay. Here he comes, this way. Let him pass. Okay, Johnny, stay with him. Right. If he makes a meet with a redhead or if you find out where Wally lives, check with me. Okay. All right, on your horse. So long. Back to Gangbusters in a moment. The Sunday daytime listening is truly outstanding at the star's address. Tomorrow, don't miss World Music Festivals, visiting the Edinburgh Festival, where Bruno Walter conducts the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. And remember, too, that Sunday daytime on most of these same CBS radio stations, Leopold Stokowski conducts in the 20th Century Concert Hall, and Michel Piastro directs the Symphonette, all on CBS Radio. And now back to Gangbusters and Circuit Attorney Dowd. Well, while St. Louis detectives were beginning to make headway in their investigation... The hold-up mob had recruited another member. And late that night in another part of the city, Wally was being escorted up the stairs of an apartment house by his connection, Red. 
Like I said, Wally, you might not like the guy, but you gotta grant him a brain. I just don't want anybody telling me my business, that's all. I don't go for that kind of garbage. Okay, don't get excited. You haven't even met him yet. Yeah, that way. Just don't want him telling me how to do my job. Take it easy, will you? Okay, right here. Should I push the bell? Nah, never mind. I got the keys. Mac! Come on in, Wally. Yeah. Hey, Mac! In here, Red. He's in there, Wally. Say, uh, how you like the setup here, Wally, huh? That'll do. Yeah. Mac, meet Wally. How are you? Hi. Uh, just a second. <laughs> He's nuts about solitaire. So I see. I tried a lot of things. I can't find a better way to pass the time. Have you tried knitting? Wally. Yeah, I tried knitting. Nothing there. Well, we'll let this go for a while, huh? That's nice of you. It don't look like I could win it anyway. Not with that deal. Sit down, Wally. Yeah. Thanks. Right here. Yeah. Red says you're okay, Wally. Says you're a good wheel man. The best, Mac. Okay. Now, this is going to be a nice little score. Not the biggest in the world, but uh, tidy. That's the way I like them, tidy. When? Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. Depends on the weather. What's the weather got to do with it? This is a congested district. If it's raining or snowing, traffic will be heavy and slow. Plus, there'll be a lot of extra taxi cabs in the area. It's a good angle. The gate will be rough enough without any handicaps, so uh, let's wait for good weather. It's okay with me. You see, Wally, all the angles. Now, uh, the mark is the Four Brothers Jewelry Company. That's uh, on the third floor of the tower building. It's a rough deal getting out of that neighborhood. Can you do it? I can do it. It's my idea we should have a small, fast car. A big one might be a little trouble to handle in traffic. But uh, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, you leave it to me. A uh, small car would be better, don't you think, Wally? Small car it'll be. Now, uh, here's the layout. Forget about the elevator. We'll go up the stairs. The office is um, around here in back like this. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there's this entrance here. The door's made of glass, so we got to work fast. We got to get in, get it, and get out. We got no time to play. Who wants to play? There's a counter uh, here which uh, stretches from one side practically to the other. It's a display case. None of the good stuff is in there. In back of the counter is a vault. That's what we want to get in. How much do you figure? Maybe five, six thousand in cash, maybe fifty thousand in ice. It's not bad. It's all right for me. Off to the side here, uh, there's a little office. Uh -huh. now, that's where the owner has his desk. And besides the owner, we'll find another guy there, a salesman. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them look like the hero type. We won't have any trouble. You got this mark pretty well cased. I should have. I've been there twice. I've been trying to make up my mind whether to buy a watch they got. It's a great setup, Wally. Huh? They'll recognize me when I come in. I'll tell them I want the watch. They're relaxed. We go to work. How about the bug? All those jewelry houses got alarms. That won't be no problem. The only one I could spot was in the boss's little office. Now, he'll be in front writing up the sale on the watch. And if there are any more, we'll just have to be quick enough to keep them away from them. I'm for being quick. Back to gangbusters in a moment. Now, uh, Red. Yeah. You're going to take the boss. Uh -huh. Your job is to watch him, keep him quiet, keep him away from the bugs. Okay. Now, Wally, you do the same thing with the salesman, and I'll clean the boss. Wait a minute. What's the matter? You're going a little fast for me. You said I was to handle a salesman. That's right. I was under the impression I was a wheelman in this deal. That's a big enough job. I don't belong on the inside at all. It's not necessary to stay with the car. It can sit. Yeah. Well, it can sit without me. I don't do two men's work. Wally. Not without two men's cuts. I don't do two men's work without two men's cuts. Will you listen to me? I knew there was something screwy about this deal. No wonder your other two left you like that. Wally, you got to grant me it takes three on the inside. Okay, I'll grant you, but I'm a wheel man. You've done inside work? Sure, I've done inside work, but not while I was the wheel man. I won't have any part of it. Now, listen to me, will you? You came in, and you're in. Yeah. We'll see if I'm in. Oh, Wally, be reasonable. Who's being unreasonable? Now, look. I don't get tough often, but I'm going to get tough now. You're in, Wally. You made a deal and you're in. 
Well, you're not going to be feeling so good. While they cooperate, huh? It ain't going to be so tough. Well, okay. If I wasn't on such a spot for dough, I'd tell you all what to do. Good, Wally. I knew you'd come to it first. You see, Mac? Is that all? Yeah, that's all. If this is going to be tomorrow, I'd better start scouting around for a car for the get. Yeah, a small car, Wally. A small car. Red will get in touch with you. He'll let you know whether it's tomorrow and what time. Yeah, you'll be at Annabelle's at 11. I'll phone there. Okay, Annabelle's at 11. I'll be there. Now, we got a good deal, boys. An awful good deal. Now, let's see if I can win one of these games for myself. Robbery squad, Sergeant Rickard. Hello, Rick. Johnny. Yeah, Johnny. Wally must have lifted himself a Chevy coach. I saw him on the corner of Grand and Locust. Oh, is that so? Yeah, looks for sure like he's in a deal now. Yeah, where'd he park this car? In a public garage on Market Street. On Market Street near the civil courts. Okay, Johnny, stick around there. I'll be right out. You think I ought to have one of the boys stay behind, Wally? No, that won't be necessary. He's going to use that car if they pull anything. That's all we have to watch the car. I'll be right there. Uh, what? Yeah, that... Hi, Annabelle. Oh, Wally. Hot tricks, Annabelle. I've got no tricks. What do you want? 200 again? The answer's still no. Nah, I don't want you 200. Just fix me a chocolate marlin. Chocolate marlin with vanilla or chocolate marlin with chocolate? With vanilla. Chocolate marlin with vanilla. How come yesterday you wanted 200, today you don't? I'm beginning to get insulted. My connections came through, Annabelle. You would take my advice, which you won't. You wouldn't go looking for trouble. I'm not looking for trouble. Who needs trouble? Oh, every time I got a call. I'll get it, Annabelle. Why should you get it? Is it your store? I'm expecting a call. I'll answer. Uh, go on, then. I answer before they hang up. Yeah. And don't give my phone number to any more Toms and Dicks. What do you think this is? Hello? Wally? Yeah, this is Wally. Red. Max says we do it today, 3 o'clock. Okay, I'm ready. Got the car okay? Yeah, Chevy, just a ticket. I got a park in the garage on Market Street. I can pick you two up about 2.30. Now, Max says no. Max says for you to drive downtown yourself, park the car in Del Mar near the building. We'll see you there. Okay. And yeah, we'll take care of the hardware. Just bring the car in yourself. I got you. So long. Much obliged, Annabelle. Mm, much obliged for what? For you, set of facilities. Anytime. Ask me for anything except money. One chocolate malted with vanilla. Happy days, Annabelle. Happy days yourself. Got over to Washington, Rick. Maybe we can pick him up there. Well, I'm afraid it's no use, Johnny. We lost him. Lousy traffic. Same thing last night. So since Red took him to meet the mob, we got fouled up in traffic. That's okay. We know where to put our hands on them now. Wally, at least. He can lead us to the others. They're liable to start shooting again. That's what I'm worried about. Uh, from the way he was headed, I guess the job is someplace downtown. Maybe he was just headed to pick up the others. Maybe, but these guys are pretty slick, Johnny. Yeah. I don't think they'd all ride together in a hot car. I think the rest will meet him. I'll pull in the phone. We'll get a few more squads on the job and cruise around downtown. Maybe we can spot that Chevy. Step lively, boys. We go in, we get in, we get out. Waste no time. You said red. I'm set. Wally? I'm set. Okay, each of you handle your man. I'll clean the ball. Keep your eyes open. This is the place, boys. Looks nice. Yeah. Hello there. Well, how are you today? Hmm? Fine. I uh, think I'll take that watch I was looking at. Oh, yes, sir. Well, that's a fine watch. I brought my friends over to see it. All right. Here we are. Solid gold case, 21 jewel Swiss movement, and a beauty on a bargain. How do you like it? Yeah, it's well. I kind of like one myself. I can show you something similar. Uh, some other time. i tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to put a deposit on it and pick it up next Monday. I'm uh, kind of short. Uh, how much of a deposit did you have in mind? Oh, say $25? Well, I think that'd be all right. Let me check with the boss. Uh, Mr. Burgess. Uh, Some watch, all right. Yes. Uh, front, please, Mr. Burgess. All right. Watch is guaranteed, isn't it? Absolutely guaranteed. If anything goes wrong with it, just bring it in. 
But you must remember, a fine watch is a delicate piece of machinery. Yeah, I know. Yes. <clears throat> May I help you? Uh, Miss Burgess, this gentleman would like to leave a $25 deposit on the watch and pick it up on Monday. How do you do? Hello. Hi, nice place you got here. Thanks. Well, I think that'll be perfectly all right. All we have to okay. do Okay. Is... Do as you're told and you won't get hurt. Well, please, what's that? Quiet, still. All right. Lock the door. Yeah, I got you. Going around, boys. Keep them covered. Yeah, come on. Now just don't try to be heroes and you won't get hurt. All we want... Hey, you. Me? You, move away from there. Yes, sir. All right. Hey, boss. Come here and have a look. What's the trouble? We got to move. There's a bug right under the counter. This guy was standing not six inches from it. You? Oh, no. no not me. Go on, you. Move over there. All right. All right. I'm moving. You. Did you hit the alarm button? Oh, I know. I didn't touch it. Are you sure? I'm positive. I sure had his chance. Now, tell me the truth. If any cops come storming in here, I'm going to kill you, I swear. Did you hit that bug? No, I didn't. Okay, you're smart. All right, boys, get them tied up. By the time you finish, I'll have the vault clean. We covered a lot of blocks, Rick. Don't look good to me. Well, we take one more turn around it. Wait a minute. What? Right. There's a Chevy parked up there. Where? Next to the alley. That's the baby. Nobody with it, huh? It must be inside someplace. Hold it, Joe. Hold it. Central District. Cars 4, 5, and 6. In the jewelry office, third floor tower building. The old up alarm is ringing. That's it. Let's go. In the jewelry office, third floor tower building. That's in the middle of the block. Let's get them. How you doing, boys? They'll be tied in a minute. I don't know what you fellas expect to Shut get. up. Make it good and tight. Yeah. Hey, look, there's cops coming on the hall. Why, you, you hit that bug, didn't you? Please, get up. Here they come. Get up. Go on, get up. All right. Open up there. Yell to him. You hit the alarm by mistake. We're police officers, open up. Tell him we're customers. Tell him it was a mistake. Take it in. Hey, they're breaking in. Watch it. The lock. Get the lock, Sergeant. Get your hands up, coppers, or I'll kill this guy. No, don't. Stop those guns, police officers. Get them, Sergeant. Let go of me. Give me that gun. Let me go. Oh, Get your hands up. Okay, don't shoot. Get those hands up. All right, don't shoot. Get them up. You, turn that man loose. I'll kill him. No. Let him go. All right, take it easy. You all right, mister? Yes. Yes, I think so. Jack is tied up over there. Go look after him. Yes, I'd better. It's all right, Jack. It's all right. Are any of your bums hurt? They all look okay to me, Rick. Now sit down there, all of you. Listen. He said sit down. What a mess. I don't cry. It won't do you any good, Wally. Sure, plenty of truth in that. Well, now we're going to take a little inventory. Let's see what we got here. They're not such a tough-looking bunch, are they, Rick? No, not now they're not. Take their guns away and they're just a bunch of crumbs. Just plain crumbs. That, gangbusters listeners, was how this gang of hold-up artists and killers was captured in the act of committing a robbery after a terrific struggle and gun battle. All were tried in the circuit court at St. Louis, Missouri, and convicted. They are now in the Missouri State Penitentiary at Jefferson City in execution of their sentences. Thank you, Circuit Attorney Edward L. Dowd of St. Louis, Missouri. Now, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues broadcast every week as a public service to assist American police in their war against the underworld. Attention all citizens. Be on the lookout for Clarence Dye, wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for armed robbery. Listen carefully to his official description. Clarence Dye, alias Jock, age 43. Five feet, ten inches. One hundred and forty pounds. Medium build. Brown hair. Blue eyes. Fair complexion. May seek work as a welder or cook. This man has scars over his left eyebrow. A blue scar over his right eyebrow. And a tattoo of initials C.D. on his right Forearm. Caution, Dye is probably armed and should be considered extremely dangerous. He reportedly has stated that he will not be taken into custody alive and will attempt to kill any officer arresting him. <laughs> Attention all citizens, maintain vigilance for Edwin Sanford Garrison. 
Wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid confinement for the crimes of burglary and robbery. If you have any information concerning these fugitives, notify your local police, the nearest office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Tonight's Gangbusters case was dramatized by Stanley Niss and directed by Leonard L. Bass, with Mason Adams, Amzie Strickland, and Eric Gressler in leading roles. The entire production was supervised for CBS Radio by John Ives, Gaylord Avery speaking. cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, Gangbusters! For chewing enjoyment plus long-lasting refreshment, treat yourself to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The pleasant chewing helps keep your throat moist and adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Enjoy it often, every day, as millions do. Now, Gangbusters. Good evening, Gangbusters listeners. Before the turn of the century, parts of the state of Kansas were practically a shooting gallery. During the days of the James, Younger, and Dalton gangs... Nobody walked the streets of Dodge City or Abilene without two guns. The ghost of those killers seems to have lingered on in the person of Larry Oakes and his gang. To bring you tonight's report, Gangbusters has asked Clyde L. Madden, Chief Criminal Investigator, Sheriff's Office, Wichita, Kansas, to narrate by proxy the case of the Kansas Collectors. Please continue, Chief Madden. Well, the best time to start this report is during the middle of December... And the best place in a car outside a bus station. Roll the wind up, Ruthie. Honey, it's hot in the car. I got cold. Larry, we have to breathe. Yeah, it's the best thing in the world, these inhalers. Clears up the head right away. Gets back into the passages. Clears out the sinus. I tell you I had sinusitis? Several times. What time is Mallory's bus to? Said 7.05. Well, the doc in prison said I had one of the worst cases of sinusitis he ever saw. Hmm. Think this is him? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> ah, it's the best thing in the world. Larry, light me a cigarette. What is this stuff, Ruthie? Lighting cigarettes, opening doors, waiting for me to pull out chairs for you? What's good into you? Look, I waited four years for you to get out of prison. I'd like to know you were around. Yeah. Now we're on. <laughs> oh, here comes Mallory. Uh, brought that beat up short wave portable. Told him to leave that thing behind. Don't start anything, honey. It's cold. Hey, Mallory, over here. Hey, Larry, Ruthie, greetings of the season. Sounds like he's been celebrating early. Oh, uh, what's a good word? Get in, it's cold. <laughs> I got a cold. Uh, what you need is a couple of good hookers. Get in the bed, put on a couple of sweaters, and sweat it out. That's what I do. Yeah, it comes to a cold. Everybody's a doctor. What kind of a job we going on? We brought the big truck, didn't we, Mallory? Well, I can see that. So it's a big job. Sheriff's office, Lieutenant Martin. In about an hour. Same to you, sir. Goodbye. Sheriff called to wish us a Merry Christmas. You know, I'd sure like to wrap this case up as a Christmas present for him. Well, I think you're on the wrong track, Lieutenant. Maybe I am. I don't know. The drugstore was in Oklahoma. Cash and narcotics. Two men, woman, waiting in the car. And the car had Kansas plates. The liquor store was held up in Wichita. Cash and 19 cases of liquor. Two men and a woman, but... This time, it was a black panel truck with Oklahoma plates. The descriptions fit. 
Outside of the jewelry store and the liquor store, none of the robberies were committed in Kansas. Well, they were all close enough. No more than an hour's drive over the state line. I just can't figure the M.O. There's no pattern. I tell you, Sid, this is no new gang. These are pros. Besides cash, they're still in merchandise and wholesale lots, which means they've got to have some place to unload it. Maybe we ought to concentrate on that angle. Well, there aren't many fences can handle the stuff they've gotten away with. Which means they must spread it around. Now, with that many outlets, we ought to be able to get a lead. But the gang could be working out of any one of four states. Doesn't have to be Kansas. I say it's Kansas. Maybe our own backyard. Well, that's pretty. Hmm? Christmas Carol. Hmm. This makes it official. It's really Christmas Eve. Hmm. Let's call it a day, eh? Sure. At least we can relax tonight. I don't think they'll pull anything. Why not? Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. In the movies, maybe. But in real life, there are no sentimental crooks. Christmas Eve, Larry. So many people walking around. Yeah, and so much cash in the till. Well, that much I'll admit, but I still think we're sticking on next now. Oh, Larry, I did himself this time, Mallory. This is going to be a pushover. Well, these coveralls are a nice touch. Middle of the next block, honey. Mm, I see it. Now, you'll come in the store with us and keep a gun on the owner and any customers that might drop in. Yep. You brought that beat-up short wave set, Mallory. Did you bring a gun? Inside the case. Two customers are just leaving, honey. It's starting to snow again. Good luck to catch a cold. Listen to me now. When we get back to the house, a couple of good slugs... Okay, the store is empty. All right, let's go. Well, good evening. Uh, what can I do for you? We've got a big order for you to fill. <laughs> Glad to oblige. Well, that's fine. Now, the first thing you do is take a look at this. Uh, again? This is a holdup. <laughs> Where? I like the steal from intelligent people. It gives a little class to the business. But this is Christmas Eve. All you have to do is get in the Christmas spirit. Suppose we start with the cash register. Keep an eye on the door, doll. Okay. Come on, you. What's your name? S- S- Simmons. What a pretty color, Green. Well, you're a nice big strapping you guy. You got all the money. Please go. Oh. Never interrupt me when I'm talking. You don't have to do that. I enjoyed it. Now, listen, you're going to help us load these radios and phonograph sets in the back of that truck, you understand? Yes, sir. That's better. If anybody stops you, tell them we're making deliveries for you. Understand? D- deliveries? And don't make any mistakes, because I'd just as soon kill you, mister. Honey, sit in this chair by the door. Keep your pocketbook in your lap and your gun behind it. Do we leave the door open? Yeah. Open it, Mr. Simmons. It's still snow. Come along, Mr. Simmons. Uh, I'd better help them with uh, the stuff. Take those combination sets. Yeah. I'm going to have to be careful with the heavy stuff. It's getting slippery. Hey, you. Yes? You drop that stuff and I'll bust your teeth out. You understand? Yes, sir. Honey. Can I have this? What do you need it for? I just want it. Hey, don't bother with that one. It's a cheap set. Take the one next to it. Uh, this thing weighs a ton. Cost a fortune, too. Honey, can I? Okay, if you want it. Listen. Come on, we haven't got all night. Okay, Simmons, get your back into it. <sighs> Pretty, isn't it? Mm. You know, when I was a kid, maybe nine years old, I got one of those for my mother for her birthday. Uh, I bet she was happy. Mm, she was happy, all right. She beat me for a week. Why? Some jerk went and told her I stole her from the five and ten. Friends, next time you chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum, notice how cool and fresh it makes your mouth feel. That's because Wrigley Spearmint Gum has lots of lively, refreshing flavor in every stick. The minute you sink your teeth in, that cooling flavor begins to freshen your taste and relieve that hot, dry feeling in your throat. It sweetens the breath, too. 
Millions of people carry Wrigley's Spearmint Gum with them wherever they go for quick, long-lasting refreshment and for real chewing enjoyment. Next time you're at the store, get some Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now, back to Gangbusters and Chief Clyde L. Madden, Sheriff's Office, Wichita, Kansas. Well, Gangbusters listeners, the Larry Oaks gang kept moving. The day after Christmas, they traveled 70 miles to hold up a laundry in a supermarket and then returned to their home in Byram. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Martin went back to interview the owner of the radio store for the second time. That's a a big seller, Lieutenant. I'm going to need a lot of big sellers to cover my losses. I understand. We don't like to bother you again, uh, Mr. Simmons, but you were kind of upset when we questioned you before. Well, I'll I'll tell you one thing. The man who was the leader, he would have used that gun. We think he did. On a druggist in Missouri. Oh, sorry to hear that. You sure you can't remember anything else they said? Any names, accents, manner of speech? Nothing that I didn't tell you before. I see. Oh, uh, did I tell you that they knew how to load a truck? No wasted space, no lost time. They did everything just... Oh, oh, excuse me for a moment, Uh, customer. Yeah. They got a lot of guts, Lieutenant. They don't care who identifies them, don't care how long they spend in a place. Sid, how good are you at packing a suitcase? (laughs) Somebody has to pack for me. I never seem to get things right. Mm -hmm. How about the trunk of your car? What are you getting at, Lieutenant? To pack a truck and get the most out of the space, you've got to know what you're doing. They knew what they were doing. Good. Hey, Ruthie. Just a minute. Bring in some water. I'm on the phone. <laughs> Couple of aspirin. That's from Mexico City, Larry. Remember that tune? Yeah. You, you and your remedies. Oh, so it didn't work. At least you enjoyed the medicine. Uh, easy water and aspirin. Thanks. How about killing that thing? Well? She said yes. I think I'm making a mistake. A dame who hasn't got a date with New Year's Eve tomorrow night, uh, I don't know. Oh, you like this girl, Mallory. She's a good dancer and a lot of fun. How come she didn't have a date? I told you. She just got in from New York. Oh, ugh. when they melt in your mouth, what a taste. You want a shot, honey? Uh, no. This uh, job you got lined up, Larry, uh, what do you think it'll net? A barrel. Mm, you should see the size of that apartment, Mallory. It's not an apartment, honey. It's a development. There must be thousands of people live there. Now we're going to get to the manager's office at 10 o'clock in the morning. What? 10 in the morning? Why? Honey, it is kind of early. Look, they bank at 11. You see, Sunday is New Year's Day, so Monday is a legal holiday. That means that everybody will come in to pay their rent on Tuesday morning. What an angle. I'll bet this is the first time in the world anybody ever held up an apartment house. People start paying their rent at 8 in the morning. By 10, they'll be standing in line. And we collected. For the management. I wonder what's holding them up. Most of them are in, Lieutenant. Yeah, you'd never think that many cons gotten out of jail since the 1st of October. We still haven't found anyone who comes close to fitting our description. Hey, wait a minute. Uh... Report from Joliet. Nothing. That wanted bulletin from Jersey, Red Dreyfus. He sure looked like our boy. No, he's a loner, Sid. I'm looking for a guy who works with an organization. I... Just a second. Uh, Dan Dyer. Ever heard of him? Ah, the con man. This is out of his line. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this one will help. Larry Oaks. How about him? Let me see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, released on October 3rd. Uh, does he fit the bill? Records? Uh, Lieutenant Martin, get me everything you got on Larry Oaks. O-A-K-S. Yeah, everything, including his old pals. Well, as soon as you can. Didn't he have a wife? Yeah, that's right. Ruth waited four years for him to get a... Hello? Yeah, Sergeant, round up the staff. I want them all in my office in 15 minutes. This report doesn't show what happened to him after he left. Well, we'll send out an APB. Get every available man to help trace him down. He's before my time, Lieutenant. Uh, Is this his M.O.? 
Sid, you know, some guys have a pattern. They'll only steal from jewelry stores. Some stick to supermarkets, some banks. Yeah. Well, now, Larry Oak's got a pattern, too. Doesn't look like it. He'll steal anything that isn't nailed down. See how anybody can live in these apartment places. Like those Indians who used to live up in the side of the hills. No, I ever got married, I'm gonna get one of those ranch type oh. houses. After that exhibition you gave New Year's Eve, a girl would have to be crazy to marry you. Come on, the manager's office is the next building, ground floor. Me, I like the kind of a house we got in fire room. Room to move around in. You don't have to clean it. Two floors, an attic, cellar. That's a house. I wonder how many people live in this development. Plenty. They all pay rent. I hope they pay in cash. And keep your gun in your pocket till we get in the office. Second door down the hall. Come on. The door's open. We're going as fast as we can, madam. Watch the door, Ruthie. You there. You'll have to get in line, sir. Shut up. What did you say? Sir, this is a busy morning and my nerves are in no condition. <laughs> That's the gun in your belly, mister. Is this some kind of a joke? You don't hear anyone laughing, do you? This is a stick-up. Ah! Everybody oh. shut up. Shut the door, honey. The safe is open. Clean it out. Check. Come on, you. Oh. Where's the stuff you got in the last hour? In the top drawer. Anybody comes to the door, let them in. The rest of you, get on the floor. Oh. Business here. Shove in the bag. Shall we clean out these people? Don't forget the jewelry. Okay, lady, you heard the rings. Just dump your cash and jewelry on the desk and lie on the floor. Oh. And no screams. You won't get away with this, I tell you. You gonna try and stop us? No, but... I thought I told you to lie on the floor. There's no room on the floor. Lie on top of him, the fat one. That's ridiculous. I guess you need some help. Oh, oh. oh. sorry. Shut up. Well, how long are we going to stick around, pal? We're in no hurry. Jewelry and cash on the desk. Bodies on the floor. Place is getting kind of crowded, you know. Plenty of chairs. Use one. <laughs> Who sneezed? I did. I, I got a cold. Gesundheit. <laughs> but next time, cover your mouth. The uh, real estate guy who rented the house gave us a perfect description of Oaks. Yeah, has nothing but praise for him. An excellent tenant. I only hope he hasn't pulled up stakes. I will know soon enough. Slow down a little. He said it was a red brick house. Uh, if the Oaks gang pulled that apartment job, I'd say they headed home. I'd say they're there now. How many men have you alerted? Enough. Slow down. It's on this block. Yeah, number 72. 58. 64. 70. Go past the house and park. Hey, that's uh, that's uh, Danny's car across the street. That's right. <clears throat> Danny and Sam will cover the rear of the house. I got men stationed all around the block. We going in the front way? In two minutes. It's a nice neighborhood. Quiet. It'll get noisy soon enough. St. Louis woman with all the diamonds. Oh, I sure wish I could sing. Where's that from, Mallory? Ireland. That new whip antenna and that pair of 807s I put in triple the power. You get Ireland like it's next door. Sounds loud. La, da, 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 Anyhow, we just da, stole a hundred new ones. You can take a picture. Well, Larry, you got a tin here. When's that fence coming to pick up this stuff? There's so much junk around, I can't even move. It'll be here about two in the morning. That's six, seven hours. Want to go to the morning? Why not? How about it, Larry? Okay. You got to shave. I shaved this morning. So you need another shave. It won't take you long, honey. Okay. What do I do with that woman? Just go upstairs and get it over with. And don't cut yourself. Da 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 da. Try the knob. It's locked. Yeah, have to kick it in. 
Want me to do it? No, I'll do it. Bust in, find cover quick. Okay. One. Two. Three. Ah! Stand where you are. Keep your hands high. Where's Oaks? He's in town. Frisk him, Sid. Okay. What's the idea? You... Ah, 38. Okay, Ruthie, where's yours? <laughs> My uh, 38's on the shelf. I see it. Now, where's Larry Oak? <laughs> hey, look out! Came from the top of those steps. It's going to be tough to knock him off here. Oaks! What do you want, copper? You better come down. You haven't got a chance. I like my chances. Sid, keep those two covered. All right, down on the floor. Both of you. I can get a shot at him from behind that post. Watch out when you cross that hall. Yeah. I'll try that again, cop. Don't try it. Want to give up, Larry? Want to come and get me? I'll get you the next time, Oaks. Here's a present for you. Last chance. Sid, keep those two covered. I'm going to duck out for a clear shot. Good, Good luck. I got him. He dead? No, I got him in the hip. Lucky shot, copper. Lucky shot. Yeah, I'm paid to be lucky. Now, come on, you three. Let's go. My leg. You, help him. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Why are you just going to leave with the front door broken? Why not? Are you crazy? You're just asking for someone to walk in the place and pick it clean. Well, gangbusters listeners, the Larry Oaks gang was completely smashed. Oaks got 40 years, Mallory got 15 years, and Ruth is at present serving out a shorter sentence. Through interrogation, Lieutenant Martin found out the names of the two men who sold the stuff for Oaks, and both of them drew long prison terms. Thank you, Clyde L. Madden, Chief Criminal Investigator, Sheriff's Office, Wichita, Kansas. In just a moment, gangbusters, nationwide clues. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy even while you're working, driving your car, or busy doing other things. Just slip a stick into your mouth and chew it as long as you like. The pleasant chewing will make the time pass more pleasantly for you, and you'll enjoy that cooling, refreshing flavor. It'll help to keep your mouth and throat moist. A real help on warm summer days. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy all the time. Chew and enjoy it often, as millions do. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, Gangbusters Nationwide Clues broadcast every week to assist American police in their war against the underworld. Attention all citizens, be vigilant for Otto Austin Lowell, sought by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for the crime of murder. His official description. Age, 43, 5 feet 10, 160 pounds, medium build, brown hair, brown eyes, medium complexion. May seek work as a molder, foundry worker, or mariner. This man has the following identifying marks. One inch scar on right knee, two scars, left forearm, tattoos on both forearms. He has false teeth, which he seldom wears, causing cheeks to appear sunken. He frequently wears western-type clothing, reportedly speaks Chinese, and frequents Chinese restaurants. He has a hobby of gunsmithing. Caution! Otto Lowell should be considered extremely dangerous. He reportedly always carries a gun on his person and is an excellent marksman. If you have any information concerning this clue, notify your local police, the nearest office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Tonight's gangbusters case was dramatized by David P. Harmon and directed by Leonard L. Bass. With Ken Lynch, Tweets Allison, and Bill Smith in leading roles. The entire production was supervised for CBS Radio by John Ives. Gaylord Avery speaking. <laughs> Gang! 
Blockbuster, a production of CBS Radio in cooperation with Phillips H. Lord, is brought to you each week, same time, same station, by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy even while you're busy. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, Gangbusters! the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories, has asked C.W. Bud Young, Sheriff of Washoe County, Nevada, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Sheriff Young. Thank you, and good evening, gangbusters listeners. As all police officers know, an important break in a murder case can sometimes be nothing more than a tip. An anonymous phone call to the police, an unsigned letter, even a rumor, these have often brought a killer to justice. And tonight's unusual case contains just such a break. It began on December 8th when a vacationing carpenter named Roger Kensel ended a brief visit with friends near Los Angeles, California. Early that morning, he set out on the highway to drive home, and about noon, he pulled his car to a stop. Boy, fire? All the way. Well, come on. Thanks, mister. I've been standing there for two hours. I don't pick up the hitchhikers ordinarily. I guess it's pretty cold, all right. It sure is. I say, if I hadn't Reno, the mercury's down to 32. Don't say. Live around here, do you? They just pass it through. My name is Olney, Steve Olney. Well, mine's Roger Kensel. You live on the coast, Mr. Kensel? No, I've been visiting friends in Los Angeles. Hey, you mind more company? What? Up ahead there on the side of the road. That fellow looks like he could use a ride, too. Yeah, he sure does. Think I should stop? Well, it'll be nice of you, Mr. Kensel. It's awful cold out there. Oh, why not? Got plenty of room. Maybe later on we can spell each other at the wheel. I'm a good driver if you want me to take a turn. Just open your door for him, will you? Yeah, sure thing. Want a lift? Yeah, you bet I do. Hop in. <laughs> Three in the front's okay. Yeah, just get in the back, mister. I don't need to crowd you up in front. Oh, suit yourself. This fella here is hitchhiking, too. Oh, yeah? Well, I just got in a mile or so back. <laughs> I guess this is our lucky day, huh? You and me. Looks that way. It does? I think so. It's good enough for me. What's his name? Pencil. You say something to me? No, but I'm going to. Just pull over the side. What? You heard him pull over. Have the wheel, Steve. Make sure. Now, just a minute. Here. All right. Now, relax, Buster. Don't try anything. This ain't a cap pistol I got here. Look, just don't hurt me, you understand? Don't get nervous or anything. I, I swear you can... Shut have... up. And off the motor, Steve. Right. All right, you out. You two. You know each other. Out. I don't understand. You, you were a mile apart. Yeah, we travel better that way. See what he's got, Steve. Oh, Stealth. Suppose I hadn't stopped a second time. You asked too many questions. Find anything? No, not yet. Have a listen to me. You have stopped. <laughs> Steve would have seen to that. Sure. You just made it easy, Mr. Kinsel. All right, only let's take him. I'm ready. You. Turn around. Take me. Take me where? For a walk, sweetheart. Now move. Look, we've been here in these woods all afternoon. Yeah, time sure flies, huh, Mr. Kensel? Well, won't you at least tell me what you're going to do? You'll say. Only Mike. That's right. I told you, take my car. You got my money? Take the car and just leave me. You know something, Mr. Kensel? Just what we're planning on. Then why don't you? I can't stand just waiting like this. We like a better one. It's dark. 
You know something, Steve? Looks just about dark enough now. I swear, I won't do anything. I'll wait here as long as you say. I won't even try to telephone. Yeah, we know that, Mr. Kensel. Then you going now? Pretty soon. Think it's dark enough, Steve? Yeah, it looks that way to me. All right, up on your feet, Mr. Kensel. You take me back to my car? Not exactly. Come on now, stand up. I didn't know what Mike says, Mr. Kent. He's got a terrible temper. Look, Bill, don't hurt me. Don't you see? You got what you want. Please don't hurt me. Oh, you must think that we're awful dumb, Mr. Kensel. Dumb? No, I don't. I think you're smart, both of you. Thanks. You know our names, Mr. Kensel. You know our faces. Sure, we're smart enough to think about that. I won't tell. I swear I won't tell anybody. We know you won't. Please, if you don't tell me what you're going to do, I... All right, turn around. Start walking. Walking? Uh, move. Oh, all right. Whatever you say. Uh-uh. Slow, slow, Mr. Kensel. Just keep walking. That's right, toward the woods. Whatever you say. I promise to do whatever you say. <laughs> Scared, lady. Yeah. Just keep walking? Yeah, you're doing fine, Mr. Kensel. Now, Steve? I think so, Mike. Now. Want me to go look and make sure, Mike? No need to. Give me a cigarette. Yeah. Here. Here. We, uh... Are we ready to go? Sure. Money. Yeah, what is? I'm promising not to tell. I guess we'll never know if he'd have kept that promise or not. mind talking, Steve. Will you just keep looking out for cops? But it's time of night way out here on the highway. I told you, I don't like driving a hot car. I'm sure won't be looking for it yet, Mike. Yeah, but just the same. As soon as we get someplace, we got to get rid of it. Hey, maybe up ahead. See those lights? It must be Reno. Reno and van? Oh, there ain't two of them. Why? Got a girlfriend in Reno, Nevada. Near there, anyway. Name Marie. Yeah? She's some kid, Mike. <laughs> Man. Hey, you never used to talk about her back in stir. Ah, Marie ain't the kind you talk about. Her. No? Uh, a girl like Marie just thinks to yourself, you know? But she's okay, huh? Oh, she is. Got a nice little place of her own, too. She liked visitors? Always did. Why? You just gave me an idea, Steve. Why are we stopping here? Ain't any lights or anything. But this spot's perfect. Nobody can see us from either direction. Now go on, hop out, huh? It's cold out here. Hey, where's that extra can of gasoline we bought? In the back. Boy, what's the idea, Mike? Right here. You take the can and start slopping the gas into the car. Well, we weren't going to burn it till we got someplace. Look, Steve, you said you'd trust me, didn't you? Well, sure. Well, then go on, will you? Pour that gas around. Yeah, yeah, inside, too, up on the seat. Yeah, I know. That do it? All camp. All right, stand back. Now, way back, will you? That pile's really going to burn. Make an awful big flame, won't it, before somebody stops? Let him. Dark night like this, we can be a mile up the road. Now, set. I'll toss a match. It's a shame, pretty car like that. All right, watch it now. Here she goes. Man, let's get out of here. I'm with you, Steve. Get moving. Wait, wait. Reno, didn't I tell you we're going to see your girl? Man, 
Hi, Marie. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Another drink. Sure. <laughs> you guessed it, honey. Steve, we'd better get back here with another bottle pretty soon. We're running out. What's the matter? Won't I do? Well, you do all right with a sauce, I'll say that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no. Don't go away. Come on, come on. Sit here. Well, what about Steve? Well, what about him? <laughs> That's right. What about him? Move over. <laughs> Glad to see you, Sonny. Well, I'm always polite to old friends. Sure. How about new ones? That depends on whether they're trouble. You know, I think you're trouble, Mike. Who, me? Why? Well, the heater, for one thing. I don't like guns. Oh, it's just in case we meet up with bad men on the road, honey. Steve says you already have. Steve talks to him. He'll be back any minute. So what? But I'm his friend. Great. You're mine. Steve! Well, nothing, Steve. I was just fixing your friend a drink. Some drink? You told me to trust you, Mike. I'm sorry, kid. Me and Marie were just getting acquainted. Yeah, that's all, Stevie. You want a drink, too? Honest, pal. Look, I, I'm sorry. Sure, Stevie. Now, don't get mad. Marie. Yeah? Come here, Marie. Well, like you said, Stevie, we were just trying... The minute I turned my back... Get out of that, will you? Yeah, Steve, there's no sense in beating her up. I think there's a lot of sense now, in Steve, it. Steve, wait. We'll hit the road, kid. Okay? Okay, Steve? After I take care of her. Are you crazy? You don't beat him up, why don't you? He's the one starting to get fresh. I can't. Mike is my friend. Come on, let's check out it, Steve. Huh? Okay? In a minute. Come here, Marie. No, look, Steve, No. No. Like a mess, Marie. Honest, what happened? You really want to know, Rudy? Sure. Yeah, on the house. Gee, thanks. You really want to know? Not unless you want to talk about it. I ran into an old friend. Uh huh? That's what I said, an old friend. Looks more like you ran into a brick wall. Look. Crummy jerks. If I wanted to, I could fix their wagons, but good. I knew when you came in, you were mad. Give me another slug, will you, Rudy? Yeah. I can fix them real good. I wouldn't blame you. Here I was, entertaining two callers, see? An old gentleman friend of mine. Yeah? Him and his buddy. Here I was offering them... Hospitality, you understand? Like anybody would, you know. That's right, like anybody would. Then you know what happened? I could see. Oh, I mean before that, this friend. This friend of my friend. You understand? I mean. He tries to get fresh. Yeah? Listen, I tell the priest. Listen, I say, I am a lady. You understand? Him and his heater, I could fix them both good. Heater? Gun. Not so loud. As a matter of fact. What are you talking about? As a matter of actual fact. You got a phone? Right behind you. Would you give me a dime, Rudy? Give Anything dime, you Rudy? say, Marie. Thanks. Hey, Marie. Yeah. Don't do anything dumb now. Yeah, what's dumb about fixing a couple of heels? Well, nothing, I guess. Anyway, they sure fix you. Oh, where's Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. There it is. Can you beat it? Hot 
hospitality I offer him. And look at me. Just, hello, operator. Give me the cops. Cops. Police. What? Short's emergency, a big one. That's right. Hey, don't mention this joint, Marie. Promise. Well, certainly not. You want him to think I'm a bum? Oh, please? Well, never mind that. I want to tell you something. What? All right, but hurry up. I may change my mind. Maybe you better hang up, Murray. Well, what for? Hello? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I got a little news for you boys. It's about a gun. Gun. No, I ain't got a gun. These crates have. Yeah, well, take it easy, will you? I'm coming to that. One of them is Olney. Yeah, that's right. Steve Olney, and his pal is Mike Galena. Well, how should I know how to spell it? Just a second. Hey, Rudy. This ain't good, Ray. Would never, hey, just light me a cigarette, Rudy. You still there? All right, now listen. I'm going to tell you a lot. Monday night, the star's address is the exciting address for Mr. and Mrs. Detective in person, also known as Mr. and Mrs. North. Criminals and killers always lose when that whole family of slick sleuths get on their trail. Don't miss your appointment with action, adventure, and intuition as Mr. and Mrs. North go into action Monday night on most of these same stations. Back to Gangbusters and Sheriff Bud Young of Washoe County, Nevada. An anonymous telephone call, Gangbusters listeners, sometimes sets off fireworks. Or, in the case of Marie's call to the police, it opens a trail leading to murder. Marie's call was transferred to my office, and while I talked, Under Sheriff Gerald Logan had little difficulty in tracing the call to a local tavern. When Logan and I arrived at the tavern, Marie was still there. <laughs> I never told you where I was. Uh, never mind that, miss. Let's hear some more about your friend. Oh, them. The ones with the gun. Uh, excuse me, would you officers care for a drink on the house? No, thanks. You understand? I got a respectable place here. Oh, sure. Uh, these guys Marie's talking about, they weren't in here. Yeah, we understand. No, sir, I don't allow hoods hanging around in here. Relax. So you got a nice, respectable tavern. You sure you won't have a drink on the house? We'd like to talk to Marie. Oh, Oh, sure. Yeah, well, right. Yeah, thanks. Now, Marie, you said these men are Steve Olney and Mike Galena, is that right? Correct. Right on the nose. Known them long, Marie? One of them I just met tonight. Yeah, we can see that you did. You know they both have records, of course. They have? Well, that's a big surprise, huh? Well, it certainly is. Any idea which way they were headed when they left you? Well, to tell you the truth, I wasn't looking. All right, then try this. Did either of them smell like fire? Uh, I beg your pardon? As if they'd been near a fire. You know, could you smell smoke on them? Or gasoline, maybe? Well, I didn't notice. But you're sure Galena had a gun? Oh, I'm positive. Creeps, I'm positive. But they may be our boys, Jerry. You want to have Marie take a look at the body? She just might know him. Maybe. Body? What body? A man was shot, Marie. Shot, and so far as we can figure, his car was burnt up, too. Well, you think my friends, you mean Steve and Mike, could do a thing like that? I don't know. Looking at you, though, I'd say they might. <laughs> a roar, will you? Yeah, you. Hi, Marie. You got a nerve. Shut the door, will you, Marie? Steve, I don't know if I should let you in or not. Being on account of last night? 
I'm sorry about that, Marie. Sorry? Look at me. My eyes are mad. Yeah, well, I, that's, that's one reason I came back. Apologize. Who's your friend? Mike? Oh, me, me and him split up. Well, it's a good thing. Yeah, there's a little heat on around here. We decided it'd be easier to travel alone. You know, I still ain't said you can come in. I am in, baby. I apologize, didn't I? Well, you know, you know what I said to myself, you know? No, what? Marie is a lady, I said. Now, if I apologize like a gentleman, Marie will forget it like a lady. That's just what I said, Marie. <laughs> well, did you put it like that? Yeah. Who's that? Well, if it's your crummy friend, the two of you can just it can't get... can't be Mike. Don't open it, honey. It's probably Essie. I just... Who is it? Stand back, Marie. Marie, it's cops. Oh. Uh, don't move. Marie, you dirty, stinking stool. Tell me what she's done. All right. You had enough? Put your hands in the air. Drop the gun. All right. I'll shoot anymore. Take him, Jerry. Right. Just keep your hands where they are. Marie? Marie! What? You can come out from under that table now. I could get my hands on her for just one minute. You won't, so forget it. Now, you're going to tell us where Galena is? Who's he? Come on, Steve. I make it tougher. Never heard of him. You will, Steve. I promise you, you will. True to his own twisted code, gangbusters listeners, Steve Olney refused to give any information leading to Mike Galena. A week went by and then two while the manhunt spread to 15 states. Finally, in my office in Reno, the break came. Come in. Uh, the man at the desk said just to walk in. That's right. What can we do for you? Well, my name's Inny. Pete Inning. Uh, I'm an orderly in the city hospital. I think I've seen you around. Uh, this is Mr. Logan. How are you? Oh, what's the trouble, Inning? Uh, I got no trouble, Sheriff. It's about that picture in the paper a week or so ago. A man named Galena. And what about it? Well, it's a funny thing. I make a hobby of looking at pictures of guys, you, you know, uh, in the post office and the papers, like this one you're looking for. Go on, Inny. Well, this is going to sound crazy, but I swear I just took him out of our ambulance. What? The driver said he picked him up at that rooming house out on Woodlaw. Uh, someone called and said their janitor was sick, so he went out to get him. And you think the janitor is Galena? Yeah, I think so. i tell you something else kind of funny, too. Go right ahead. The docs at the hospital said that he made himself sick. He what? He swallowed a lot of stuff to get sick. You know, on purpose. What do you think, Jerry? Well, we've followed up a lot of cockeyed leads, bud. No reason to let this one go by. I told you, didn't I, Sheriff? You heard the doc say he's faking. They're just keeping him here for you. Is this his room, isn't it? Yeah, this is it, uh, 301. The nurse is down at the end of the hall if you want her. No, we'll see him alone. You all set, bud? We'll check. You stay out here, honey. Yes, sir. Mm. Looks like our patient is asleep. Yeah, he looks real sick, too, doesn't he? Yeah. Galena! Ah. I, I, what do you know? He can move. Uh, you got company, Galena. Police. Will you go away. I'm sick. I'm sick. We got news for you, Galena. You want to hear it? No, I'm sick. Will you go away? I think he wants to hear it, bud, right now. Hey, what? Let go. My Turn your feet, Galena, now. Fast. What's the big idea? I'm a sick man. I'll give you the idea, Galena, and fast. We've had Steve on ice for two weeks. Huh? He sang his head off. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm going to ring for the dog. You stand still and listen. Oh. 
Roger Kensel. You took him in the woods, took his dough, and then shot him in the back. That sound like the story. We got it all, Galena. The gun, where you stopped to buy the can of gas, the works. Even Marie. Will you have a heart? Look, I'm sick, I tell you. I got news for you, Galena. Yeah? You're a lot sicker than you think. I am? You are. And you know something else? You aren't ever going to get well. On March 20th, gangbusters listeners, both Steve Olney and Mike Galena were found guilty of the murder of Roger Kensel. Sentenced by the Washoe County Court, both men were removed to the Nevada State Prison and were executed. Thank you, Sheriff C.W. Bud Young of Washoe County, Nevada. And now, gangbusters nationwide clues broadcast every week to assist American police in their war against the underworld. Attention all citizens. Maintain vigilance for Clarence Dye, one of the ten most wanted men in the country. Being sought by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for armed robbery. His official description. Clarence Dye, alias Jock, age 43, 5 feet 10, 140 pounds, medium build, brown hair, blue eyes, fair complexion. May seek work as welder or cook. This man has scars over his left eyebrow, a blue scar over right eyebrow, and a tattoo of initial CD on right forearm. Caution, Dye is probably armed and should be considered extremely dangerous. He reportedly has stated that he will not be taken into custody alive and will attempt to kill any officer arresting him. Attention all citizens. Watch for Everett Bruce Carroll, wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for the crime of burglary. Listen carefully to his official description. Age 52, 6 feet 3 inches, 175 to 210 pounds, slender build, brown hair graying, blue eyes, medium complexion, both hands and arms badly scarred as a result of burns. Repeating, hands and arms badly scarred from burns. May seek work as a bulldozer operator. Caution. Carol may be armed and should be considered dangerous. <laughs> Attention all citizens. Be alert for this man. McKinley Norfleet. Wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for the crime of murder. His official description. McKinley Norfleet, alias Mac, age 55, Negro, 5 feet 11, 165 pounds, slender build, black hair, brown eyes, dark complexion, may seek work as a laborer. This fugitive has a scar on the back of his head and gold front teeth. He reportedly appears to be grinning at all times. Caution. Norfleet may be armed. Watch for him. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the nearest office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation... Or gangbusters at once. Tonight's Gangbusters case was written by Robert J. Shaw and directed by Leonard L. Bass, with Tom Holland and Eileen Palmer in leading roles. This production was supervised for CBS Radio by Jerry Danzig. Gaylord Avery speaking. Cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. <whistles> Gangbusters! Emergency flash. A crime wave of the most serious proportions is spreading throughout.
throughout the United States. Tonight, Saturday, December 8th, 1945, a serious crime is being committed every 40 seconds. Chicago, December 8th. One man killed, another wounded in gun battle with police. Chelsea, Massachusetts, December 8th. Police searching desperately for person who telephoned father of six-month-old baby that kidnapped child would be returned, quote, in a box, unquote. Redwood City, California, December 8th. 16-year-old high school girl kidnapped by man and woman in green sedan. These are authentic facts. Since this new crime wave has started, a murder has been committed in the United States every three hours. In its relentless war upon this crime wave, that this country may be a safe country in which to live, Gangbusters presents Louis J. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police force in the world who will interview by proxy W.M. Adams, Sheriff, Potter County, Texas. Commissioner Valentine. Now, Sheriff Adams, suppose you start our gangbusters case for tonight. Well, Commissioner Valentine, I'd like to go back a few years to Dallas, Texas. Sheriff Hart was telephoning to the Texas State Police. This escaped convict is deadly. I consider him one of the most dangerous criminals at large. Now, here's the description. Blanky Thompson, 26, 5 feet 8 inches... Weight, 150, coal black hair, dark brown eyes, suave, handsome, dresses like a fashion plate. Blackie Thompson will kill on the slightest provocation. Uh, don't play anymore, Leela. All right, Denny. That's our song. I can't stand it tonight, Leela. Do you realize ever since we were... Ten years old, we plan to get married? I'm sorry, Denny. Leela, you're just infatuated. You don't know anything about him. He only came to town a month ago. But I can't help my feelings, Denny. Sure, he's handsome, he's been places, he's flashy. He's exciting, Denny. He's romance, he's everything I ever dreamed of. And I'm just the guy who's always lived across the street. You'll get over it. Never. Well, you don't even know, Leela, what he does for a living. Oh, I suppose that's him now. Is my hair all right? Do I look all right, Denny? You look awful good to me. I'll be back in a minute. Blackie! Hi, Ken. Uh, Denny's in the living room. I've just told him. Oh, yeah? I hate it terribly to hurt him. You told your old folks you're leaving town with me? No, but I've got my bags all packed. After they're asleep, I'll leave them a note and meet you. Uh, I want to get out of this break. I never was so excited in my life. I... Oh, Blackie, you do love me, don't you? Oh, sure. Oh, Blackie, there won't be one bored minute being with you. <laughs> you don't know the half of it, kid. Leaving this way, I'll probably never be able to come home again. You'll... You'll always love me, won't you? You're okay, beautiful Will you get a look at the outside world with me? Emergency all state police. First National Bank at Rush Springs, Oklahoma, held up by three gunmen. Leader, coal black hair, brown eyes. Attention to state police. Gun shop at Riatuck, Oklahoma, held up by three gunmen. Leader, black hair, immaculately dressed, brown eyes. Machine guns, shotguns, and ammunition stolen. Leader answers description of dangerous escaped convict, Blackie Thompson. Ah, pretty swanky nightclub, huh, Leela? Mm. Hey, you never saw nothing like this in the hick town you come from. Huh? What's the matter? Oh, I was just listening to that song. It just happens to mean a lot to me. Oh, thinking of that hick Romeo I took you away from. Well, snap out of it. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm sorry, Blackie. You wanted excitement. You're getting it, aren't you? Sure. <laughs> Remember the first night you threw a fit when you found out who I really was? <laughs> it was all so new to me, Blackie. And now I'm going to give you some real excitement. What? I'm pulling another heist tomorrow. A bank? Yeah, and the heat's on me. You're going to drive our getaway car. I'm going to... to... 
drive our getaway car. All right. All right, if you say so, Blackie. Well, that's what I do say. You still love me, Blackie? Oh, lay off that goo. I'm getting fed up with it. Now, you'll park the car in front of the bank, and I'll take Whitney and go in. Yes, sir? You the cashier? Yes, sir. This is stick up. Reach for the ceiling. Don't, don't shoot. Reach for the ceiling. Oh, my arm. You didn't reach quick enough. Grab the door. Okay, pal. Uh, Shut up. Uh, <laughs> you broke the cashier? Yeah, never mind him. Get the door. I got it. Okay, then come on. And if anyone tries to stop us when we get outside, kill him. Are you all right, Blackie? I heard shots. Shut your mouth and step on the gas. Step on it, I said. That's a pass now, Leela. All right, Blackie. Those cops have sent out alarms. They spot a car hitting 60, they'll figure it's us. Uh, keep your guns ready in the back seat there, Whitney. Don't worry, I'm ready. Oh, Blackie, I didn't realize it would be like this. You start whining now. I'll put a plug you just as quick as I would anybody else. All right, Blackie, I'm sticking with you. I always will. Hey, Blackie, you think you killed that cashier back in the bank? Oh, what's the difference? We got the dough. Blackie, look. Coming down that other road. A yeah, car. Whole posse in it. Yeah. What'll we do? We can't turn back. Yeah, but Blackie... Oh, shut up. We've only got one chance. Now, listen, Leela. You do what I tell you. All right, Blackie. Anything you say. Keep driving straight ahead as though nothing's wrong. Yes. If those cops yell to pull up, stop the car. But when you do, pull up just a few feet ahead of them. You understand? What for? Never mind. Get the guns back there, ready. Now crawl in the back seat with you, Whitney. Cops see us all right. They're waving. Whitney, hide down on the floor of the car. Now, you do what I told you, Leela. You'll get a slug in the back of the head. Pull over, you people. Pull over. Okay, officer. Stop just ahead of him, Leela. That's right. Now, when I say so, we'll jam our guns out the back window and let them have Like you know. Keep your mouth shut. Uh, I can see through the back window. Cops are getting out now. Yeah. They're walking this way. Okay, you people. Get out of the car. Let him have it. More, more. Kill him. Kill them all. We got most of them, Blackie. It's horrible. Shut up. Get this car going. Blackie, you killed them. You killed them. I'll kill you if you don't give this car all it's got. No cops taking Blackie Thompson. One member of that patrol posse was killed, Commissioner Valentine. Two of the others were badly wounded, and another received slight wounds. But Blackie Thompson and his gang escaped. Now, back to Gangbusters and Commissioner Valentine. What happened, Sheriff Adams, after Blackie Thompson's spectacular escape from that posse? Well, Commissioner Valentine, Blackie Thompson, reckless as he was, thought it best to hide out for a while. He and Leela had a hideout just outside of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Why, Blackie. Come in, Leela. New suit? New shoes? But <laughs> what's the idea of the suitcase? Are we going somewhere? Hand me those gloves on the bureau. These? Uh-huh. Pigskin. Pretty hard and rough. Blackie. You were planning on working out on me. No. One little talk with you first. You've been getting on my nerves. I'm fed up. Black. And I want no scene. When I'm fed up with the dame, I'm through, and that ends it. But I can't go home. I, I haven't got any place to go. I haven't got anybody but you. You can't leave and me. The reason I wanted to talk to you is... If you think you're going to get back on me and tipping off the cops, you got another thing coming. No, Blackie, you can't leave One me. One word to the cops, and I'll find you and fill you full of lead. After I've given up my home and family and everything for These you. These pigskin gloves are just like steel. And you have a beautiful face. I should bump you off now to make sure you don't talk. But just as a little sample. 
be a long time before that puss of yours looks human again. And if you're even tempted to say a word to the cops, just remember that little sample. Blackie! Mike, come in the office a minute. All right, Sheriff. Did you check with the police of nearby cities on Blackie Thompson? Yes, yeah, Sheriff. No soap. How about wanted circulars? Well, they're just coming in from the printer. I'm sending one to every police chief in the country. Good. Sheriff Hart's office. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who is this? There's a man you want, Pat, and I know where he is. Who? Blackie Thompson. Blackie Thompson? He said he'd kill me if I ever told. Who are you? I was his girlfriend. Where is he? Tim's bar. I hope you lock him up till he dies. Is his gang with him? I don't know about his gang. But his new beautiful girlfriend might be. Hello. Hello. A tip on Blackie Thompson? Yeah, Mike. A woman. Blackie's supposed to be over at Tim's bar. I'm driving over right now. But you can't go alone, Sheriff. His whole gang may be with him. I'll take my chances, Mike. This time it's going to be Blackie Thompson or me. Hello, Sheriff. Kind of raw tonight. Hello, Tim. What brings you to my place, Sheriff? Something up? Maybe. Well, no one's been here except that fella sitting back there in the corner. He's the man I'm watching in the bar mirror. Yeah? Who is he? Five feet, eight inches, 150 pounds, black hair, dark brown eyes. That's right, Blackie Thompson. I saw his picture in the papers and it's... What are you going to do, Sheriff? I'm going to take him. Hey, that guy's a killer. Move down the bar out of range. All right, stay where you are, both of you. And if we don't... I knew you was a cop the minute you came in. I was waiting for your first move to kill you. Well, Blackie, it looks like you've got the drop on me. I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to kill that dame that tipped you off. You wouldn't just kill me here in cold blood? Oh, no, wouldn't I? You said your last speech, Sheriff. Mark, and I'm going to... Oh, 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 oh. Sheriff, you threw him right over your shoulder. All right, Blackie, get up on your feet. Okay, okay, I'm getting up, cop, and I'm getting up. There are a lot of jobs marked up against you, Blackie. And one of them is cop killing. Irvin Blackie Thompson, rise and face the court. It is the sentence of this court that you, Irvin Blackie Thompson, for the crimes of kidnapping, murder, and robbery, be taken to the Texas State Prison at Huntsville, and that within the walls of the said prison, on the 24th day of October next, between the hours of 6 and 10 in the morning, a sufficient current of electricity be passed through your body to cause your death. And may God have mercy on your soul. Just a minute, Whitney. You know the rules. Convicts aren't allowed near the death house here. Well, I, uh... I thought maybe I, uh... I thought I could see my old pal Blackie Thompson. They're, uh, electrocuting him in a week, you know. Yeah, get permission from the warden. Oh. Well, then, uh... Would you? Quiet, God, or I'll kill you. Where'd you get that gun? Open the door of the death house, quick. Surprising what a little gun smuggled in can do. Now walk inside, screw. Nobody ever escaped from this death house yet, Whitney. Give me those keys. Blackie. Blackie, what's that in? Over here, Whitney. Hurry, hurry. Yeah. Come on, God, run with me. Get me out of this cell. Open the door now. Come on. Okay. You know what it's like to be in the death house. Come on, open it up, Whitney. Hurry. I'm working as fast as I can, Blackie. I'll never forget this flavor, Whitney. Okay, Whitney. Now I'll take that gun. Yeah, but Blackie... Give me your gun. I'll shove the guard in the cell. <clears throat> that screws out for good. Hey, open myself, Blackie. Now let's get out of here. Ain't you going to spring those other guys in the death house? Uh, I'm not letting them burn. I'm saving myself. Come on. Got the ladder hit on the other side of this door, Blackie. Good. No guy ever broke out of this death house before. I get that ladder. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Over to the wall now. Yeah. Okay. Stand the ladder up against the wall. Yeah. It's okay. I'll start up. No, you don't. I'm first. Oh! 
Hey, that's no way to treat me after I got you out of the death house, Blackie. Uh, Blackie Thompson, Blackie comes first. <laughs> hey, look out, the guard up on the wall sees us. Oh, good. Oh, Blackie. Come back, help me, will you? Help yourself, punk. Who do you think I am? Emergency. Emergency. Blackie Thompson has just escaped from the death house, while Whitney, who aided him to escape, was shot by the tower guard and killed. Emergency. Blackie Thompson has just escaped. I'm right here in the shadow. Oh, darling. I couldn't see you. You really like these country club dances? No, they're boring. I wish you'd come in. I've been watching you through the window. I knew you were here. I was trying to sneak out. I never knew a girl could be so in love in just one week. Well, you're running away with me or not? But do you realize I hardly even know your name? <laughs> you're in love with me, though. More than anything in the world. Well, then after you get home tonight, pack. Sneak out and I'll have a car on the street in back of your house. You honestly love me, don't you? Would I be asking you to run away with me if I didn't? All right, I will go with you. I'll go with you to the end of the world if you want to. <laughs> we won't go that far at first. I'll take you for a few weeks to Amarillo, Texas. Amarillo? Now, don't worry, kid. You won't be bored. I promise you that. Attention, First National Bank just robbed by gunman, about 28, black hair, handsome, immaculately dressed. This gunman cruelly beat cashier, believed to be killer Blackie Thompson. Approach with caution. Sheriff's office. Hello. Hello, what's the matter? This is the sheriff's office. What's the matter? Are you, you... Who is this? Blackie Thompson. Blackie Thompson? Every office in the South is looking for Blackie Thompson. He's here, in Amarillo. Where? I don't know. Who are you? I'm his girlfriend. He told me he was going to marry me. He said he loved me. He's found another girl. And I hope you catch him and shoot him and put him in the electric chair and kill him and put him in jail for life. I never, 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 never want to see him again. Hello? 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 Attention, Texas police. Blackie Thompson reported to be here in Amarillo. All patrol cars cover main highways. Killer Blackie Thompson reported here in Amarillo. You don't suppose, Sheriff, that girl who phoned in gave us the wrong steer on Blackie Thompson? If she did, Inspector, she was the cleverest actor I ever heard. I'll wager every police car in Texas is patrolling tonight. Look. Hmm. Way down there on the low road, see? Yeah. It's a sedan. Must be doing 70. But look, way behind it. Three squad cars. Well, they're after him, Sheriff. Must be Blackie Thompson in the first car. He's outrunning the squad cars. Oh, what a rut break. This road runs parallel to that road for miles before there's a cut across. Uh, we'll never be able to get down to the highway in time to cut him off. We've got to. Those squad cars will never catch him. There's only one way to head the car off. Go down the embankment. Oh, but it's a 60-foot bank and a rough field beyond. We've got to take a chance. Hang on. We'll either make it or be killed. Look out! That rock! Steady! Steady! Sheriff, you made it. He's about 300 yards ahead of us. Step on it. I can't go any faster. He's pulling away. I'll see if I can plug his tires. Good, he's stopping. Look out! Sheriff, you hurt? Get some of the glass in the windshield. Uh, we'll get him. Oh, here comes the other squad cars. Come on, men. There he is, right by his car. Right out in the sides of the road. Lie low, men. Open fire. All right, men. Hold it. Careful. Thompson may be playing possum. I don't think so. Keep your guns on him, though. If he starts to get up out of that road, let him have it. I, I, I got... Oh. 
must be at least 30 bullets in him. Well, men, that's the end of Blackie Thompson. It's a shame that some of these men don't realize before it's too late that they just can't get away with it. Well, Commissioner Valentine, that's the case of Blackie Thompson. And I hope if there's anyone listening tonight who contemplates committing a crime, they'll just remember this case. We appreciate, Sheriff Adams, your telling us these inside facts tonight. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production.